All right, welcome everybody to uh, Tolkien Reading Day 2022. Uh, it's awesome to have you here. Uh, this is an annual event that the Tolkien Society has been doing for, uh, I want to say, almost 20 years, uh, where we celebrate the destruction of the ring and uh, Frodo's uh, success at the final moments of his mission. And uh, we're gathering here today uh, with uh, the Tolkien Guide crew and some very special guests. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, this year's theme, which is love and friendship in uh, the world of Tolkien's books, uh, coming particularly from from various viewpoints. Uh, this first panel that we have here are some some artists who who work in in Middle Earth, and we have with us uh, Yeni, Emily, Anke, Donato, and Ted. Uh, they are um, all people that uh, were willing to jump on here with me, uh, with our with our group. Uh, I love them all. I've loved their art for years. Uh, and I'm going to give each of them a chance to uh, introduce themselves and, and say a little bit about their work. So let's start with you, Yenny. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Emily, why don't you go? Okay, I will poke at that momentarily, uh, but uh, we'll keep going here. Uh, Anke, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourselves? but I like to pick out moments to illustrate that haven't been done before. I think I'm one of the few persons who's um, created a watercolor of the, the fox scene from uh, the Fellowship of, of the Ring. So I, I like to, yeah, do moments that are often overlooked. And I think it's no secret that my favorite character is Faramir and that I have certain issues with certain films because of that. Um, yeah, so... Awesome, thank you. Uh, Donato, on to you. Yeah. Hello, uh, I'm Donato Gincola. I've been illustrating for about 30 years now, uh, mostly in book cover illustration and some game art with, uh, or a lot of game art with Magic the Gathering. And uh, I came to Tolkien, uh, I can still remember the day my, my brother Michael handed me the book when I was about 13 and said, here, you might like to read this. And, uh, and The Hobbit, and that was it, I was hooked. Uh, and you know, it sent me forward and starting to create artwork. And uh, I've been nonstop making fan art, basically, uh, up until I became a professional. And even as a professional, fan art still dominates the way I make a lot of my work for uh, Tolkien's Middle Earth. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much. And Ted? Um, yeah, and uh, I, I certainly would echo what uh, Don Otto has just said. Uh, 
You know, I imagine when we were together in Philadelphia some years ago, we probably compared notes on this business of being handed the book at about the age of 13 or 14, which was the same thing for me, my sister. So uh, that got me onto Tolkien in a big way, uh, changed my direction of my uh, artistic kind of ambitions um, and became a sort of a theme underneath of my regular professional work as an architectural renderer. For many years and then it started to emerge in the, in the 80s uh, that I got my artwork published finally and uh, things uh, continued to uh, do well for me after that. Um, when I first read The Silmarillion uh, after it was published, I went, you know, it left me fairly cold, you know, it was a bit of a disappointment compared to Lord of the Rings, but um, I went back to it in I guess the early 90s and started to identify scenes that would be interesting to try to interpret. Um, and then sent a bunch of that stuff to um, Harper Collins, and was surprised that um, it was taken as seriously as it was, and that it was shown to Christopher, and that it led to the illustrating of the Silmarillion. I seem to be the in the situation where I put stuff, you know, out there. Um, I do sketches on speculation, and uh, and then it seems to sort of lead to something afterwards. Um, but uh, that's been a kind of a pattern, you know, taking the art for the uh, calendars and just running with what I wanted to, you know, put in them. They, they gave me free kind of uh, carte blanche. So that's been a wonderful sort of uh, thing to be able to do and to share with uh, the world. And, and, you know, it's 40 years on or more, and I'm still going strong with it. I still love just doing pictures with gouache. I'm not interested in the film world so much, but uh, definitely love conceptual art and, and the art of composition and, and uh, rendering things. And yeah, um, <laughs> still cooking here. <laughs> Awesome. Thanks, Ted. So uh, due to the audio problem we had at the start, uh, they didn't hear you, Yenny. Rather than make you repeat it, I'll just ask a leading question uh, about uh, why the focus on Midros and the Silmarillion. Like that, I think that's awesome. And I, I'd just like to hear a little bit more about that. Uh, that pretty much ties in with, um, with this year's uh, topic for Talking Reading Day, because it's um, mainly the friendship with Fingon that always really fascinated me. And it's it's this uh, this fact that the character doesn't exist in a vacuum. He's done these terrible things, but uh, there's this other side to him. Uh, this strong friendship with with Fingon. There's uh, the bonds he has to his brothers, some more than others, and that's just something I always found very fascinating to explore, especially since there is so little in the Silmarillion of actual dialogue or anything that really um, describes these characters' actions. And I'm always absolutely amazed that um, people who are as much into these characters as I am seem to uh, draw the same tiny little tidbits from the text that I did. And I always felt that I was over-interpreting things, but then somebody across the world reading these same few lines from Tolkien comes up with exactly the same uh, thoughts and ideas about the character. And I just love that, how Tolkien can conjure up this entire persona with just a couple of sentences. Yeah, definitely. And uh, Emily, I'm going to pass the mic back to you. You were also, unfortunately, in my uh, fat-fingered uh, biff on the audio. Uh, just if you could repeat a little bit of your background, I'm, I don't know if as many people are, uh, know you as, as some of the other artists here. So I'd like to give you a chance to, to reintroduce yourself and, and talk a little bit about uh, how you found Tolkien. Sure, uh, I'm Emily. Uh, I grew up in Hawaii um, and I, that's really influenced uh, the way I have interacted with art. I think um, I, I found Tolkien, I, I'm one of those that found Tolkien through the movies uh, because they hit at basically the exact right time to uh, capture my imagination as a probably 12 year old, um, saw the first film and then just went and had to find all the books and, and read through The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. And it sort of stayed with me. I started to become interested in studying literature. And so when I was in college, I, I minored in English with my art major and just kept kind of looking for ways to combine those two passions. And when I decided to jump out on my own uh, as an artist with a small business, uh, it seemed natural to start 
illustrating more of Tolkien's works and trying to to bring a you know a different set of eyes. And so that's awesome. what I did. Yeah. Uh, Anke, um, I'll try not to just continue going around in a circle here, but I want to touch on everybody with a couple different questions. Uh, you're, uh, from my understanding, your art in Tolkien is fan art. Uh, I've loved having you appear in the Beyond Brie calendars. I, I love your art. Uh, what do you do outside of, of art? What, what are your other hobbies? What kind of feeds into this passion of yours? What's, I'm, I'm curious to learn a little bit more about your background. Well, my professional background, what I studied was um, visual communication and graphic design. And I actually did my, I studied for a while in the UK and most of my studies were in Germany. And for my final project, um, I did an illustrated edition of Beowulf or a part of Beowulf. So that tied into Tolkien very much. I studied in Colchester, which was round, is round the corner from Sutton Hoo. So a lot of um, historical research um, was done there and of course I chose Beowulf because I was already a massive Tolkien fan and um, illustrating a part of any of Tolkien's books would have been too much for that project so I I do um, freelance work as an illustrator and um, graphic designer um, but my main profession is uh, teaching art at secondary school so that and, and that too feeds into my own art because um, the way we teach art in, in Germany, it's, it's a very broad field. So it's not just the, the practical aspects, it's art history too, it's um, analyzing art, it's design, it's architecture. Um, and also um, working with young people who also, I, I, I think I've had students in every single year that were fans of Tolkien. So you always get this, this feedback and you get the, also the, the fascination. You do art too, you, you, you like Tolkien and it's, it's brilliant to have that and yes. other interests of mine are and this too um yeah flows into my art um nature and um also because it's getting more and more important conservation of nature so these are topics that were dear to talking too, even you know 50 years ago so um, many of my artworks um depict details of trees, of plants, of um, certain um, landscapes that um, for me, um, yeah, are Middle Earth or parts of, of Tolkien's world or our world. <laughs> awesome. Um, well, open question for any of you. What, uh, any favorite scenes uh, that you, you're kind of looking forward to doing you haven't done yet? What, what's kind of your vision going forward of, of doing some more art in, in Middle Earth? That's a big question. <laughs> it is. There's a lot of sketches for me. I've been doing fairly productive since COVID started. It's actually been quite a beneficial thing for me. Um, and uh, yeah, it has led to explorations of, of, of sketches and thumbnails of all sorts. Um, sometimes just spontaneously, I'll see an older one and think, you know, I'm give it a shot and try to update it or improve it and so on. So I'm always ready to go with um, new possibilities and um, but commissions have been a very strong thing for me in the last couple of years as well and it's amazing how when something is requested and I kind of go into the research with um, my colleague Alex and Ruth uh, his wife and we discuss these things fairly thoroughly and get into the substance of you know what was Tolkien's intent and so on and it can really lead to some interesting conundrums as well for instance, if I could and just talk to about one of the recent pieces I did, it was uh, seen with Tour and Gwyndor at the Pool of Ivrin. Um, and the fellow commissioning it wanted the handover of Tour and Sword to be the featured kind of moment. But back behind all of the two figures was this the landscape backdrop, strongly influenced for me by August uh, Kaplan. Norwegian landscape painter who's absolutely beautiful um, artwork really captures to me the sense of northernness that uh, Tolkien and Lewis um, and the Inklings seem to prize you know value very much um, so we have the pool of Ivrin and then the question was well if there are falls from above the pool, the pool where do they come from and is that water also blessed by Olmo but uh, it, it was a thing to capture both 
the healing waters, the crystalline waters of the pool at this moment when Turin was kind of at a pivotal point. Um, the, and then the brooding northern landscape, this, you know, kind of overclouded, dark forest behind kind of the, you know, metaphor for Turin and his whole kind of dark life. But it, it came together really nicely. So light and dark, and, you know, various themes, of course, that are sort of woven into Tolkien um, came uh, together in this thing. And I was very happy with it. And it was a theme that I didn't even know I would potentially find interesting at all. So it's, it's it, you know, it's great to be, you know, commissioned to do something and then discover how uh, interesting that project can be. Awesome. Didata, how about you? Yeah, I think I'll, I'll mirror what, what Ted, and I think Jenny, you'd mentioned about like painting the fox or the fellowship uh, or, or, or illustrating that. And I, I love, you know, you got to hear some sirens. I'm in, I'm in Brooklyn here. Uh, <laughs> uh, there, uh, I love those, in be I call them in-between moments, like reading between the lines of, of being able to project uh, our world into the middle world of Middle Earth. And I think that's what also what uh, Tolkien was do doing was he's taking mythologies from, uh, you know, right, historical mythologies uh, from, uh, from our world and building his own. And so I think it's appropriate that we continue that, I guess, uh, crossover, like building, throwing in our experiences, throwing in our cultures to further overlap and build and, and utilize the, uh, the integration and integrity that Tolkien had and then what we have with our own experiences. Like, like you know, I imagine, uh, Ted, your, you know, your enthusiasm over landscape is from, you know, related to, um, you know, Hudson River School uh, type things, right? And I'm sure many of us are tapped into other kinds of like, I love Caravaggio. So I'm looking, whenever yeah. a hobbit can get tortured, like, okay, the tortured saint, uh, Giuseppe <laughs> Ferreira. Like, oh, where, where can I pull? You know, like, oh yeah, oh yeah, when they get captured by the orcs or in the tower yeah. or, yeah. So that that's where I'll, I'll, so I'll, I'll emulate that or say that those moments that might not seem climactic for me actually are the better parts to illustrate and to paint because they allow you as a, us as artists to project our real personal interests and meld it with what Tolkien helped in, uh, inspire in us as well. well what, what Jenny was saying or earlier about um, those particular moments in the Silmarillion that aren't very you know, much described. You know, there's not a lot of dialogue, but uh, Justin Gerard and I were having a, a conversation some years ago about how the Silmarillion and The Hobbit both, because they don't have as much description in them, they leave more room for the artist to come in and kind of flesh things out or, you know, find a kind of an image that uh, is powerful uh, with a few words and the artist can have a, a more kind of meaningful role there for it as well, I feel. So that's one thing. Emily, I'm curious on your thoughts on this topic, just the... Uh... Uh, one one thing that I would eventually like to do would be to revisit the Two Trees of Valinor, uh, which I did kind of just for fun in college. Um, and a lot of people really like that piece. So I would eventually love to do a more considered and uh, you know developed project for that. And something else that I started working on and then sort of dropped as I was working on my master's thesis was a, a series um, showing the women of the Valar. And so I would love to go back to that, especially Nienna. I've been really thinking about doing an illustration of her. Nice. Very cool. Um, uh, Yenny, uh, kind of the same question, but I'll add in a little detail that we got in uh, from our Discord questions, which is um, not just art you're looking at, but what do you find difficult in, in trying to reproduce a piece? If you start a piece and it's not looking like the way you imagine, like what, what's your process around uh, dealing with uh, kind of getting stuck in the middle? Interestingly, I usually don't start out with a clear idea of what the final piece is going to look like. And um, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure if that's really the case, but uh, I don't see faces very clearly when I, uh, when, when I read a book. 
So um, I see very, very blurry images. I see types of people rather than faces. So um, whenever I sit down to draw a scene, it's as much to explore what it looks like as it is to, to put it on paper. So it's always an extra exploration. And um, the final result is usually completely different from, from what I thought it would be. But um, it has been like that for 40 years, so I'm fine with it. And it doesn't scare me. It, it, did, it used to scare me when I was younger. And I thought, I have this idea in my head. I didn't. And uh, I should be able to get it on paper. I couldn't. So uh, that was really frustrating for a while until I realized I, I don't know where this is going to lead. So I will just see where it leads. And maybe I'm happy with it. I'm always happy with it for the ones that you share. <laughs> publicly you know i'm sure every artist has pieces that uh I that, that almost everything <laughs> stay in the folio or something Anke, how about you uh, do you get stuck do you uh what inspirations or getting you know in the middle of a piece or not liking something that you're working on um rarely but it happens um for my um 30th anniversary i dug through all my folders and um took out the, the, the very first artworks I still have because I think the very first I gave away a birthday present and photographed them. And amongst them were a painting I, I must have started, I think, in 2003. And for some, for some reason, I don't know why, abandoned. It was two thirds finished. And I thought, eh, this is actually quite good. So I finished it this year, almost 20 years later. Um, and there are a few unfinished pieces, but normally I, well, I do a lot of sketches before and just like you need to explore something and it, it crystallizes um, more and more. And I usually I just finish the piece and then think, well, maybe immediately afterwards, maybe a year or so later, you could do better now, you could do it different now. So there are, um, I think, three or four versions of uh, Faramir and Eowyn um, on the battlements um, in various um, compositions. Um, uh, same of the, I call it the trial when, um, well, as, or as Faramir, of course, um, when Frodo is interrogated by him in Athelion. Um, because for some reason, there, there were parts of the, the paintings I was happy with, but others um, I wasn't. And um, so I, I tend to revisit scenes over and over again. Yes, how did you decide which, sorry, how do you decide which one you, you prefer then if you've done four or four or five of them? Um, I think because it, they happen over time. Um, when, it, when it's finished, I think, okay, that's done for now. And then uh, a year or so later or a few late years later, I think I can do better. And then that's the the actual thing and it has happened that I tried something new and it just didn't work and the the older piece was actually better so it's I think it's very subjective it, maybe it has it's down to to the you know the mood of the moment I don't know um and I mean tastes change and um abilities the skills change and sometimes it's just a, a slight tweak of a perspective or maybe zooming in on a certain character or um telling showing the scene from their point of view yeah it's, it's difficult to say mm -hmm. i really relate to that too um and i think it's one of the interesting things about tolkien and the art is that uh, when you've done it long enough you do really want to go back and reinterpret previous scenes because there's always something more interesting or some way of re kind of reconsidering when i did um but the fourth version of Rivendell um, and took it as a, at a point of view down in the valley rather than above kind of the original couple were based on Tolkien's own drawing, which all his art inspires me too. But um, the newer one was influenced by Andreas Achenbach, um, German 19th century artist who I discovered. And, um, you know, so there's always some fresh impetus whether it's an artistic influence or just that you see the thing in a different way, you kind of catch a certain insight and are curious to follow that. And I think it's wonderful that we just have the freedom to explore those creative like corners in this, in this sort of realm where it's, it's not about um, 
whether it's commercial work or it's going to be successful necessarily, but it's for our own personal artistic kind of continuum. Yeah, I'll second that that idea that you're all mentioning that uh, I, I don't have an like a vision of what the characters look like, like like Yanni's mentioned, they're kind of fuzzy. And of course, as a hyper realist, I end up making them concrete in each new painting, but I don't care. I, I, I'll change, they'll change. Like I'll, I'll change the look of Frodo, I'll change the look of Gandalf. Because I think this is, was wonderful for me is that back my kind of first introduction to a lot of Tolkien art was the Tolkien Bastiri uh, Bast by David Day. And it was just yeah. bountiful of style. Like there was no right or wrong way to see the world. It was all possible. And I feel like that, sh you know, like, uh, like Emily, like, uh, unfortunately you've got your know, introduction to the, the, the movies solidified a visual presentation of what these, I don't know, that'd be interesting to hear you talk about that is, is uh, are your ideas forever cemented of the characters as the actors, whereas the like I know myself and uh, probably the old the older people here are like it's all fluid it's just dynamic so yeah Emily do you have a, like a comment on that since you're probably the, the youngest one here yeah influenced by that sure um well I would say it is it's more work for me probably to get away from from the filmic impression when I when I do art I've mostly stayed away from a lot of figurative interpretations until more recently um, but I do consciously try to stop and think like okay what makes sense for this person to look like in my interpretation and not even think about the film and if I do go back for inspiration kind of like Ted was talking about I, I tend to look at Tolkien's illustrations and try and start there as a foundation but it is yeah that it's always going to be there in your head and I think it's just a matter for me now of, of looking at as many different interpretations as possible to open back up that limitless possibility. Yeah, so how would you guys, I'll throw this out to the entire panel, we'll just chat about it for a little bit. Uh, how would you approach trying to paint this year's theme of Tolkien Reading Day, which is love and friendship? You know, it's not a concrete, oh, you know, we're doing, you know, buildings or we're doing, you know, uh, uh, the the fellowship you know there, there's a lot of themes they picked in prior years and i i love the theme this year of, of love and friendship and there's so many ways to interpret it so i'm just kind of curious throw it out there and see see what you guys first take or if you have a favorite piece you think fits the theme i don't have an actual idea yet except that love and friendship makes me think of jane austen so i'd probably try and do some sort of not crossover but some sort of something well, both of those that works we're talking <laughs> yeah like i don't you know i is it aren't is it the entire book of lord of the rings friendship kind of is yeah like, like no no <laughs> no one no one gets left alone anywhere right and like they're all traveling in pairs or the groups and so it's really it's like the entire story is is friendship and i think that's what i love about it is that it doesn't weigh itself on the battles like like the so many of the battles are actually pretty short they're, they're not that heavily described and yeah. you go into more about like stewed rabbit than i think than you do the battle uh, at helm's deep uh you know, and I'll, you know in terms of like the 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 details uh, the sensitivity that tolkien would bring so i think it's finally kind of easy to, mm -hmm. to tap into that because it's so bountiful for possibilities. I think that scene with the rabbits, the cooked rabbits and Sam and Frodo is yeah. you know, asleep under a tree. That's a be beautiful little scene, a, a moment, you know, a respite, a pastoral moment in, uh, yeah. you know, in the story. And I love yeah, that. It's one, yeah, it's one I really want to do. It's like, it's, it's way it's on, it's on my mind. It's like, yeah, that's, yeah. that's one of the great, great pieces, uh, great yeah. moments. Yeah. I got to do, more or less that scene, it was a commission. And oh, you did, just, yeah. Yeah, the pool itself, that beautiful description of the pool with all those different kinds of trees and herbs and things and climbing roses and all that stuff. 
Um, the fern break, it's so richly described, and that's one of the most descriptive parts of the book, but I did my level best to not over detail the thing, but kind of bring out that morning light that it was describing, just this dawn light, and there's little fire going, and there's, you know, you can't even see Sam and Frodo at first, it's just like all this beautiful kind of floral stuff, so that was a, a really great one to do. I'd love to see your, your uh, take on that, actually, wow. Donato. Well, I was wondering about like uh, Yeni and Anki, or like what do you guys, if you're if you're really into the Silmarillion, those don't get into this, like the detailed of minutia, like the stories that the, the, you know, like the Lord of the Rings are in The Hobbit. So what, like, what do you tap into for those moments? Um, I actually have, of course, and yeah. uh, I, I mentioned that I'm very much in love with my boss and what I love most is his friendship with Fingon. So the first thing that comes to my mind is a piece that I did actually two years ago of um, Fingon and my boss in Valinor, this, this golden light everywhere and the two of them just sitting by a stream in a sort of quiet moment that's never uh, right. described anywhere. Just um, oh, so you get it invented. Have, yeah, so yeah. They, they have a friendship. They were friends in Valinor, and that's all that you that you need to know. So, my mind went wandering, and uh, I drew them sitting by a stream, their horses in the in the background grazing, the golden light filtering through the trees, some fish splashing in the water. So that's one of the things that um, I like exploring when I'm just letting my my thoughts and my art wander. Yeah, I think for me it's the the quiet moments as well um that painting i um dug out of my folders and finished 20 years later is a scene like that it's um in the shire when um the three hobbits um or it's morning after they've met the elves and they basically sit i think uh, pipping and P pipping that's running around on the grass and uh frodo and sam are just sitting there and having breakfast with the leftovers of the um the elven meal um, i'd love to see that yeah, I, I posted it a while ago. Um, it's um, online. And right. it's, um, I've wanted to do that scene for, for ages and started, but somehow abandoned it. But now it's, it's complete. And um, what Donato and Ted said about uh, the, the scenes in Ethelion, it's one of my favorite passages, um, especially in spring, because Tolkien is so, as you said, detailed on on the, the flora and it's um, anybody who's been to the, to the Mediterranean knows that he really got the, um, the vegetation spot on. Um, every herb, every um, flower blossoming, it's just what you find there. And um, even in the more Northern parts of Europe, you find that. So if I, um, I do a lot of cycling and uh, just today I'm, I cycled past half the flowers he describes in that chapter. So. Um, it's, it's very um, evocative and I've done a, a few scenes over the years, not just the trial, but also um, Sam and Frodo um, or Frodo sleeping in the fern and, and Sam watching over the, him and um, a few scenes with Gollum in Ethelion. So at that, yeah, I love book four in, as a complete book, but the, the, the Ethelian passages, because they, they're a bit of a respite before they, before the, the, the heart and dark, before the darkness comes basically. Yeah. And that for me is like the, 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 yeah, the last place where the hobbits can rest and, and take a deep breath and, um, and then, you know, push on into Mordor. So that is, and also, of course, the friendship shown to them um, by Faramir, who has all reason to distrust them uh, and yet lets them go. And yeah. And also at, at the end of that book, I think that's one of the, the scenes that really, when I read Lord of the Rings for the first time, that was one of the scenes I remember most clearly and pertinently is the scene where the hobbits are asleep and, and Gollum watches them and has this discussion with himself and you can see how he almost repents and and unfortunately Sam wakes and is a bit rude to him and then it it goes back and, and and I don't think he ever recovers but that moment is so tender and so it's it's brilliant mm -hmm. I agree I have a question for for all of y'all um well I have two questions actually uh 
what is first one's a hard one what is your favorite Tolkien piece that you've done I know that's like picking picking your uh, favorite child um but if you had to pick what would be you think the like the one that you're the most proud of or your favorite um and then what are you reading today for Tolkien reading day are y'all reading anything great <laughs> I'll take up first I guess um uh, favorite Mm. Could I have a favorite from both, all three books? <laughs> Just, sure. Yes, you can. There are many of them. Uh, yeah. So, uh, I mean, Kinslaying for me is one of the most favorite ones because I, Christopher Tolkien approved of it. Um, he encouraged me to do it. And it was a very technically challenging piece. Um, so, um, yeah, that's, I guess, one I would, I would suggest. Um, but I would hate to not acknowledge all the other favorites. And <laughs> well, Ted, the, the kinslang is the is the image for this month on the calendar, too. Oh, that's right. Yes, yes, that's right. Um, and as far as what I'm reading, I've got three or four books going right now. And uh, they're none of them fantasy. Um, one is by Sam Harris called Waking Up. But my son is m very much into Sam Harris these days. Um, he's kind of his guru. And um, I picked up on that as well and, and, and agree. He's a very wise man. And and uh, let's see, one, This Life by Martin Haglund, which is a sort of a discussion of secular faith um, and kind of general values of life without religion necessarily. And that's echoed in Sam Harris's book. So they kind of go together nicely. And the third one I'm reading is The Turning Point by Fridjof uh, Capra, which was written, I guess, in the 70s or something. But um, it's basically describing the paradigm shift we're in today very much and uh, extraordinarily uh, insightful book um, on sort of mega trends. So that's my light reading at this point. <laughs> and there's a few others that are sort of half, half read. Emily, how about favorite piece and what you're reading? Well, at least what came to mind today, uh, one of my favorite pieces that I've done is an illustration of Karen Amroth. Uh, I thought I was able to bring a unique perspective to that uh, place and kind of highlight some of the things that the that were emphasized in Tolkien's text uh, and so um, I really I'm proud of that piece and uh, I've got this here with Ted's lovely cover mm -hmm. on it for for reading today if I, I uh, must get oh. what I'd love to get a copy I haven't ordered it yet but I, i've heard great <laughs> but yeah yeah, it's like, yeah i haven't really jumped in yet so i'm yeah, excited exactly. uh, we have a car ride so i i'll have some time <laughs> oh, that's awesome yenny uh, oh yeah micro um my favorite piece would be um and his heart was filled with longing that's uh, one where tua is standing on a cliff above the sea with his arms stretched out and um coming to, to the sea for the first time after much hardship. And uh, I really like that one because it's a very personal piece. I drew it after a lot of hardship in my life. And it was a bit of a, of a feeling that I've, I've come through this now and um, I'm just standing there on the cliff. Here I am, just like Tua. And that's a very, very personal and favorite piece of mine. And well, reading for the same heart related reasons is something that I can't really do anymore. I haven't been able to for four oh, years. Right. So it's basically just audiobooks. And I don't listen into an audiobook the way I would pick up a book for Talking Reading Day and just revisit a favorite piece of mine. It's just um, either I'm listening to a whole audiobook for a week or I'm not. So right now I'm not. Makes sense. Uh, Donato, I don't think you've gone yet. Oh, well, let's see. Yeah, favorite piece. I've got too many children, so I can't pick a favorite. Uh, mostly it's kind of like what I've recently finished. Because uh, <laughs> right, I, I, I think I, I, I vest emotional choices in pieces. So each one's a different feeling. So I don't like, can't prioritize one feeling over another. But certainly I, uh, I did finally tackle the uh, fellowship at the uh, walls of Moria. Uh, and that just finished that earlier last year. 
And it took me not exaggerating about 10 years to build up to that, uh, you know, into my mind, getting the reference, getting the feeling just right. So when I did finally start it, I knew where I was going to go with it. And uh, again, the, the execution turned out better than I expected. And so that made me very happy uh, had, had to know after I've waited so long and yet it still uh, achieved what I had hoped. Uh, so there. Yes. Um, do we all relate to this idea of gestating for sometimes years before yeah. we do a piece? Yeah. I mean, I think that's very much a part of my work too. Well, it doesn't work well for commercial work if you're trying to make a living. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, you tell your clients, yeah, I'll, I'll get to you in like six years. <laughs> I'll yeah, get I, remember, <laughs> I remember uh, talking with the Hildebrandts a little about this years uh, years ago, and they, they're very much commercial artists, and, and they just, oh, yeah. you know, line them up and knock them down in, in moments, <laughs> yeah. it seemed. You know, that was their style. But I don't want to, uh, okay, we haven't gotten to you yet. Um, yeah, as everybody said, favorite pieces are difficult to pick, but um, one piece I remember fondly, it's, it's over 20 years old now, um, was one of, I did a series of watercolors for the Lay of Lathian, and there are actually two favorite pieces. One of is um, Luthien um, escaping from um, the treehouse, Hirilon, and it's basically just um, her hidden in beech leaves. And that and a, a painting of um, Beren stealing the Silmaril from Morgoth's crown. Um, both paintings were done without sketches. They were, I think I finished each in, in about two days, which is record time for me, because they were just so clear and so, um, yeah. I didn't have to experiment in any way, but the composition was clear, everything was clear, and I just painted them. and. They, even after 20 years, they still hold up. And I, I don't think I could do them any better today. So that's that's a good sign. And for, for Tolkien Reading Day, um, I have to do some research. I'm currently doing a series of paintings about the second age. Um, I was given, um, it's, it's a commission for a book. And I was given a list of topics and many of those I haven't done before. And I don't think anybody else has done before. So um, I have to read up, um, the next scene will be um, Isildur stealing the fruit of Nimloth. So I have to, I have the, the Lord of the Rings here, the appendices, I have the Silmarillion here, unfinished tales and the peoples of Middle-earth to, to get the details right, because you have to read it, you have to check every single one of them because every single one of them contains details about elements of this um, bit and, and the following paintings. So peoples of Middle-earth is to check hair colors. Yenny will know about these things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, I know. And I've had to add uh, nature Middle-earth now to when I want to check things because it's oh, so fresh and yeah. new that I can't remember what it's talked about. And I have to go back and, and re-verify if he did, you know, if, if some of his late papers in there uh, made some brief mention of beards or yes <laughs> speaking you know, of ways of that we have to redo the art because we now have more information from tolkien that's been held back all these years and stuff so it's, it's kind of fun yeah yeah and it's conflicting too in so many cases where I, he, he said different things at different points and artistic inspiration doesn't necessarily have to you know go detail by detail. I mean, that's there. there's different approaches I've seen artists do over the years on, you know, intentionally adding other elements or, or moving away from the text to, to tell their own story. I think that that happens um, uh, validly uh, quite often uh, with with this. That kind of leads to another question that came from uh, uh, Peter uh, in the chat, which is uh, the difference between um, uh, artist and illustrator and you know when are we making art i say we i don't <laughs> when are when are artists or illustrators doing one or the other and what what's your feeling on on your own approach to tolkien like do you feel like you're illustrating or do you feel like you're making art or both uh so i'll throw that open out to, to everyone definitely a hybrid <clears throat> i'd say and it depends on what other people think of it too. There's all kinds of factors in, that go into that one. We could have a whole big long discussion, uh, even an entire convention on this, this matter. 
it'll never be really solved, so settled, <coughs> I think. And I think the, um, the distinction between fine art and illustration and illustration being more like a, an applied art is a very American and very British thing. Um, I, I encountered that um, during my studies at university and um, it wasn't as clear cut in Germany, but in, in the UK, it was very much back then, and that's 20 years ago as well. Um, and I don't really see much of a difference. I mean, many, many things that are considered fine art are inspired by literature or film, even though they, you know, probably won't be called fan art, but in a way they are. So how about biblical art? Is it illustration or yeah. art, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It depends on the, the context altogether. Bible fan art. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, think, some... I think fine art was it's just a marketing thing like came <laughs> up from the fine artist to try to create a barrier and a wall between what their good art is and what bad illustration is and it's like did you use your mind did you use your hands then it's uh, art or and was it like, original <laughs> was it was it yeah i mean what's original right? yeah. and all, all of fine art is mimicking other people and i always love like poking at Picasso who like stole from Klimt and stole from uh, Cezanne and like, like, yeah, he, like all of that. Like, and he's one of the greatest fine artists and like, no, he just followed in a progression and a development of visual development. And then he did his thing and he was a great marketer. He's a great promoter. Um, yeah. yeah. So it's just like, yeah, I don't, I just throw it out. Like, I, I usually don't discuss this stuff because it's, it's so you know, you're, when you're dead, your art is art. It's whether it was illustration, whether it was fine art, you're dead and other people get to call it art. <laughs> That's it. Yep. Any thoughts, Emily, before we move on? I, I totally agree. Nothing much <laughs> yeah. else to add. It's it's complicated and messy, but ultimately it's subjective. Yeah. yeah. It's subjective. <laughs> Next. <laughs> no. Next. Yeah. Oh, I agree. Um, uh, here's one from uh, Wise Gondolin. Um, who asks, um, when working on a piece, uh, do you use real life references uh, or is it just pulling from your imagination or uh, I, I think many times a blend, but I'm curious to get each of your, your takes on, on, on that question. I do both. Um, so some pieces of mine are 100% without reference. Sometimes I reference things more heavily uh, one of my best models is my daughter. And usually whenever I have any pose that I need photo reference for, I can just snap my fingers and have my very willing and absolutely wonderful model at, at my hands. I can just say, can you just sit on your pony and look into the distance like some doomed elf lord? And she goes, and, yeah. uh, and there we are. So she, she's, she's marvelous. She's absolutely wonderful. She, she, she has been Gilgalad. She has been Arian, the Sun Maiden. She has been Hannibal. She has been Mybros multiple times. She has been Finrod. She has been everybody. She's just wonderful. <laughs> That's great. Excellent. Any other <laughs> thoughts? How about uh, you, Anki? Well, I, I use quite a lot of uh, photographic reference, especially for landscapes, sometimes for um, lighting, um, um, for, for clothing and armor. I have a few pieces um, I can use. Um, for faces, um, I didn't in the past or didn't so much um, since I've kind of branched out into BBC Sherlock fan art. Um, I'm using them more now just to get, not to, to create um, hyper-realistic pieces, but just to get the, the proportions maybe right and maybe also to make faces a bit more um, distinctive. And also, and that's something I, I really want to include more in my art, to, to also make the, the peoples of Middle Earth more diverse, because I think they've been, um, in my art, they've been too white and too uniform, so I want I try to branch out a bit. 
Yeah, I find that, um, I, I love that that's kind of happening in the last, I'm going to say almost five to 10 years in a lot of artists that I'm seeing, uh, really trying to expand, um, I'll call it references. That's kind of what we're talking here, but pulling from different cultures and kind of showing those in, in middle earth art. That's really, uh, in the, the the fan community uh, and even in in published uh, illustrations and, and artwork that's coming out uh, from professionals, uh, if you will, and I'm I'm not trying to put labels on fans and professionals other than you know is it available in a, a general bookstore versus elsewhere? You know, I'm not not making a distinction there. But um, uh, Donato, we haven't heard from you on like sort of your process in in references uh, when you're working on a painting. Oh, I, I think every artist uses references, whether mm -hmm. it's stuff that you've acquired from knowledge of seeing, of drawing over your entire lifespan, or like me, like, or many of us just use finding very specific direct photographic references that help you finish off a piece. Uh, but I'll also state that every one of my pieces starts from the imagination, starts from abstract thumbnails and sketches, which I... I let that flow through me. I don't try to be impeded by reference structures uh, when I am sketching and drawing. So the compositional choices, some of the ideas I uh, let come out of me based on, again, other experiences and things, but not be impeded by specific references. And then once that foundation is laid with the sketching, then I'll look to set up lighting. I'll look to acquire costumings and specific models and then that fleshes out the the specifics of the detail like landscapes you know mountainscapes uh, like like how does snow look like in the rising morning like yeah like i'd like i'd challenge anybody to make it up and then compare it to like really good photographic reference and like yeah it's uh, it's got to be hard to beat unless you the, the person who made it up probably has painted it before <laughs> probably has done it before so they can certainly do it on the fly but they mm -hmm. also did it based on reference before yeah yeah i think all five of you are um leaning more towards the realistic uh, i'm comparing in my mind right now to like core block who was a dutch artist uh very abstract uh, a, a very particular style. Um, his art was done in the calendar, the official calendar, right after the movies came out. And, and my understanding is that was intentional on Harper Collins' part to kind of have a, a, a counterbalance to the obviously hyper realistic photo quality movie stills that were were out there. And they wanted something that that, that was different. Um, uh, and 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 Tolkien himself even bought a couple of of Core Block's paintings. So so. He, he was a fan of that style, not specifically. He, he loved other artists as well. But um, yeah, so I, I, I have no idea if, if Mr. Block used references for what he was doing. But, um, you know, there, there's there's a wide range of, of art that's out there that I, I think is just fantastic. Um, yeah, so uh, any, we're down to the last couple of minutes. Any final thoughts anybody wants to share? Um, uh, Chad or... or Andrew, you guys have any questions you want to pop out real quick? I know y'all said that uh, <clears throat> it can take you a while to get into the headspace to 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 do a piece. Um, how does that work when you're like when somebody's commissioning a piece? How do you is there a way that you can speed it up so you can fulfill a timeline, or is there some sort of you know different thing that you do when you have to meet some sort of deadline? I would That's say that um, for me, it's if it's a Tolkien commission, then they're, they're understanding that it's going to take me as long as it takes me to, to uh, you know, do it properly. And they're involved in the process um, all the way along. And one of the reasons I use my friend Alex is that he's the guy that does the back and forth discussion on points of interpretation and, and all of that. And then possibly we'll have a Zoom call, the three of us, uh, or something like that. But uh, most of the time, um, yeah, it's, it's a steady process. In a more commercial vein, yeah, that would be uh, something where you'd have to deal with the deadline issues. And I'm not going to try to do something super brilliant then. It's just going to be um, what they need from me. And I always try to do better than what they would expect, say. But uh, if it's within a budget, too, then you have to respect that as well. So these are various things that come into it. Um, 
Another quick question. Do you prefer to illustrate a scene where Tolkien's provided a lot of detail or where there's hardly any? Both. <laughs> Uh, I'd say, yeah. actually, Tolkien never provided a lot of detail, like almost, he suggests things, but he doesn't provide, I think, specific visual acuity to things. They have, their the descriptions are vague, like shiny, or, you know, had, he uses feelings, and, mm -hmm. I, and that, that is like, like, those are very subjective. And so he doesn't like he doesn't describe. I mean, again, I think very few like what's an oliphant, right? Like it's <laughs> yeah, all right? Of, yeah, it's all about that yeah. language. Yeah, he chooses certain words. Like Tom Shippey tells us this. You know, he chooses certain words that are very evocative, and that goes to our imaginations. I think so. It's uh, you know an interesting situation there. Language to to art. Absolutely. Uh, and I love seeing different interpretations of the same scene, even, uh, you know, a very specific scene uh, can be done so differently by different artists. And um, I'll throw this out there. Someone mentioned it in the chat, uh, not a challenge right today, but uh, the request is that we get all five of you to draw the exact same scene and we just see what all the results look like. Um, I think it would be fun. I know you guys are busy. We might try and pursue that in the future, but um uh, I think we're going to wrap things up. We're right at the uh, top of the hour for the next panel. I want to say, say thank you so much to all five of you to appearing here. Uh, for people who are listening, uh, I have links to all five of your websites uh, in the show program, and I'll add those to the YouTube show notes after uh, the event completes. So uh, please follow up. Uh, check out their arts, follow them on social media. Uh, all five of you have been awesome, and I really appreciate you being here today. Thank you all. That was really good. Thank you. Thanks, Jeremy, for your hosting, and for Trotter and, and Chad, both of you guys. Um, thanks so much. Great. Thanks, guys. Great to see everybody. Yeah. Awesome. See you here. Bye. <laughs> Bye now. Bye. Bye.
All right, welcome back, everyone. We are um, here with our next panel, which is uh, Sarah, Sara, and Luke uh, from the Token Experience podcast. Uh, uh, we're really glad to have you guys here today on Tolkien Reading Day for 2022. Uh, the theme has kind of been love and friendship uh, for, for the day. Uh, uh, what I'd like to focus on with talking with you guys is, is your interactions with the, the fan community, what you guys are doing, and uh, just have some fun. So I'm going to hand off the, uh, the floor to you, Luke, first to kind of introduce yourself and, and what Tolkien Experience is. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so my name is Luke Shelton. I'll move that out of the way some. Uh, my name is Luke Shelton, and um, Tolkien Experience is really... Um, kind of a platform that has a lot of different things going on. Um, and it kind of grew out of my desire to um, kind of explore and understand, but also celebrate the different ways that people interact with Tolkien's work and adaptations of it. Um, so that first started for me when I went into uh, my PhD to do research. Um, and my PhD focused on the way that young readers, specifically readers under the age of 18, uh, responded to the Lord of the Rings. Um, and as part of that research, um, I often had to talk to parents to, to get permission to, to talk to their children. Um, and so oftentimes I would have people over the age of 18 asking me, like, how can I participate? How can I be involved? Um, and I started to dislike telling them that they couldn't be involved. Um, and so I started this thing called the Tolkien Experience Project um, so that I would have a place for uh, people not in my PhD to still be able to interact and share their experience. Um, and that's just a text-based project that posts online. Um, but then after doing that for a couple of years, um, several people had suggested maybe making it into a podcast. Um, and so I looked into that and um, talked with some friends of mine who I, I think are going to be on a panel just after this one, um, Sean and Alan from the Prancing Pony podcast. Um, and they really were helpful in um, helping me figure out the technical side of things. Um, and so with that idea in mind to, to make a podcast that really is talking about um, the ways that different people have come to experience Tolkien, um, I couldn't think of anyone better than my friend Sarah Brown to, to co-host that with me um, because uh, she is a very uh, fun individual and um, she and I always have a good time, and I thought, you know, she'd be a fantastic host. Um, and then uh, after, uh, I think, a season and a half, we brought on Sarah because they just have a remarkable vision for, um, a remarkable heart for finding people whose voices aren't heard yet mm -hmm. um, and, and finding those people and, and helping us see those people and, and lift those people up and celebrate their experiences as well. Um, and so really what what has ended up happening is that this this thing called Tolkien Experience has has grown and grown and grown, and now we have a podcast and a project where um, we get to hear from all walks of life the way that they interact with Tolkien and the things that they love about Tolkien, um, and that does mean that we do get to talk about the things that are uncomfortable sometimes because that's part of our experience too, um, and so you know we we in our spaces we seek to provide. A, a common ground to have the discussion, um, but we don't valorize or sanctify Tolkien by any means. We have real conversations with real experiences. Um, and so that's kind of the thing that we're really passionate about, I think. Um, Sara, Sarah, did I miss anything? I think that was a really good summary. <laughs> I think so too. Uh, why don't you guys introduce yourselves? We'll start with you, Sara. Well, hi, I'm Sarah Brown, and um, I was approached by Luke a few years ago. Well, it, it feels like longer ago than it is, but that's, <laughs> I think, thanks to COVID time. It was uh, Tolkien 2019 in Birmingham, wasn't it, Luke? It um, was. And, uh, he had this fantastic idea for a podcast and asked if I would be interested. And I was just really flattered that um, he would ask me to join with him. And it's been so good uh, having the opportunity to talk to different people. Um, I think that because I did my PhD as an older student um, and because I live 
Um, far away from most people that would like Tolkien alongside me. It, it can feel like it's a really isolating sort of thing. Like it's just me that is this obsessed. Um, talking to other people who are equally obsessed is just a joy because it makes me feel better about myself, but also it, um, it connects me with people that I might not otherwise connect with and that's wonderful so uh, it's been a joy and a privilege to be doing this for the last uh, couple of years and uh, a long may it continue i hope anyway absolutely how about you sarah yeah so um yeah uh, luke approached me to join the podcast at um i think it was a few months into 2021 and um, I was I was I was thrilled to be on board because I've been I've been you know following the Tolkien Experience project and the podcast as well since it first came out and um, like I really liked it as an initiative because um, it's just it's it's just always like fun to hear you know directly from fans um, you know about their experiences with Tolkien how they got into it how they have engaged in Tolkien with Tolkien their whole life. Um, and I really liked how, you know, the podcast would try and like reach out to people from like, I guess not, not, not just like the same kind of like group of people that you might always see online, but, you know, also trying to reach out to perhaps lesser known fans as well. And that was something I really liked because I'm quite, I'm quite passionate about, um, I guess, like connecting fans of the Tolkien community from all walks of life and from all different communities, because like, I mean, you know, we speak about this broad Tolkien community, but of course, you know, we have smaller communities offline and online and each of them have their own cultures and you know some of us just like never see others from those communities whether it be because of language barrier specific interest area whatever and like one of the beautiful things about the podcast was like kind of being able to bridge those gaps and so like i was i was super honored as well when luke asked me to come on board and um and i really enjoyed being part of it uh one thing that i have um i have enjoyed in my time has been trying to reach fans who are not um, originally from like Europe or the United States because there's so many fans who are from like, for example, Asia. Um, sometimes they might not uh, have spoken very much because of like language barrier. For example, they mostly publish blog posts in languages other than English. Um, and I like, I like reaching out to that and like hearing from those fans because I, I'm not originally from Europe or the US either. So it's nice to kind of like sometimes, you know, see people from my own cultural media from other parts of the world and be like, so hey, how were you introduced to Tolkien? How has your, you know, background and growing up influenced the kind of community you had access to or your approach to the works. Um, and that has been something, that's something I'm just passionate about in general in Tolkien fandom. And like the podcast has been a really, um, a really wonderful opportunity for like me to speak with um, fans and also a wonderful vehicle to get those perspectives out to like the broader um, fandom through our awesome uh, listening base as well. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I it's, Personally, it's been very exciting to follow along. I suffer from exactly what you just described, Sarah, which is um, being in my own bubble. I, I live in the United States. I've only been to uh, a Tolkien Society event in the UK once. Um, so I, I have a very limited fandom cluster that, that that I'm kind of involved in personally. And then online, it's been incredible to... Um, to start meeting fans from all over the world and and Tolkien experience the the podcast uh, and the project uh, have been really helpful to me personally. Uh, so I really appreciate it. Uh, uh, I, I'd like to chat just a little bit with you guys about, um, uh, you know, I could see joy in all of your faces as you're <laughs> describing this. And, um, you know, the theme for Tolkien Reading Day is sort of love and friendship. So I just want to throw the table uh, over to you guys for a little bit just to talk about, um, how this is, has helped with your friendships. We, you've all touched on it a tiny bit uh, in, in your introductions, um, but uh, I think it's important. And I think uh, expanding our horizons and, and the work you're doing uh, is, is really important. I can lead off if that's okay. Sure. <laughs> um, so one of the things that we have the remarkable ability to do with the internet is to connect. Um, and, you know, we're really good at doing that at, on social media, but oftentimes on social media, we can kind of curate away certain things and, and we can customize it to ourselves. Um, but then on podcasting, what, what ends up happening oftentimes is, is we're spoken at 
by a voice who, and, uh, you know, uh, I'm not demeaning any podcasts here. I, I love all of the Tolkien podcasts. I do like, I'm subscribed to like 15 right now. Um, but I, I thought when I was looking around in the podcast field of, I want a podcast that really celebrates that kind of connection where, where we're learning about other people. We're not just learning about the books. Um, and so I think the theme for today is, is one that really resonates really strongly with me because um, what I tell all of our guests is once we interview you, you're part of the family now. Um, you know, we're, we're, we are very much in the business, in the business of making connection, of making friends, of um, like, like Sarah was saying, we're, we're trying to bridge communities that often um, kind of operate independently. Um, and that was kind of the goal from the very beginning. So um, if you look at our, our very first interviews, we went from uh, Dimitri Fimi, who's a well-known scholar, um, who's in, in kind of a scholarly box. And then we went to um, someone from the Tolkien Society. And then we went to someone from the OneRing.net. And then we went with Corey Olson from Signum University. So we were very intentional to try and dip into as many different communities as quickly as possible to start saying, we're going to start building something um, that bridges these communities. And that's not to say that there aren't people who live and, and flow through these communities independently, and they do, and we celebrate that. But um, we kind of wanted to make a, a, a larger bridge that more people could appreciate, um, as well as um, bringing up some, some voices who perhaps haven't found a community yet. Mm -hmm. um, so if, um, you know, we, we like um, Putri Prihatini, she has a small following of people who love her blog a lot, but we thought it would be great to get her on the podcast so maybe more people would become aware of her blog. Um, and it's, it's been wonderful to see her flourish the way that she has lately, uh, especially with her, um, her nod by the Tolkien Society uh, getting nominated for an award that was awesome. Um, so yeah, I think that's, that's what this podcast is about. It's about making those connections and, and celebrating both our connections to the text and how deep and wonderful and unique that can be, but also our connections to each other as, as fans and, and people who enjoy the work. Yeah, I agree I really, with everything you've said. Mm -hmm. Wait, Sarah, yeah. do you want to go first? Yes, <laughs> sure. And no, I just wanted to make like a small comment, I guess, sort of like along those lines, um, uh, because like, you know, it's like for me, one thing that I've really always enjoyed with doing these interviews, because, you know, as Luke was saying, it's very much about that like human connection, you know, not just seeing people as like names on a screen in our online communities, but actually like getting to know them and their stories. Like one of the things that I have always really loved, which I think is quite fitting for the theme of love and friendship is just hearing whenever, because we, we like one of the questions we asked is like, you know, how did you get introduced to Tolkien? And it's always so beautiful how many people's stories are tied to like, you know, oh, my dad read it to me when I was younger, or, you know, I got this copy from like a really supportive teacher or something, or, you know, I kind of started to read it. And then I met this online fandom, and then they encouraged me to read the other books. And like, for me, that has always been such a beautiful thing, how like, like, just genuine, real, like, love and human connection has brought so many people to the books and has brought them to, to like, you know, expand their reading of the books. And, even to meet new people, um, to meet new friends, new partners as well. Um, just hearing that through the podcast is absolutely beautiful for me. I love how much I love how much love ends up flowing through the podcast because we're talking about people and their real, like you know, visceral experiences and their engagement with the text. Not just like how they interpret it, but really how they, as people, interact with it and how that is refract refracted back into their real world and their relationships. So that's something I've, I've really enjoyed about the podcast too. Everything that both Sarah and Luca said, <laughs> because <laughs> all of that is absolutely true. Um, being a lover of Tolkien's works has brought me some of the best friends anybody could ask for. So I have my own um, increasing, which is wonderful, circle of friends and we're all connected by our love for Tolkien. And as Sarah said, we've all come to Tolkien in different ways and we all have our own story to tell. And what I love about the podcast is that 
rather than, as I often do in, in my other circles of life, um, approaching Tolkien in quite a academic way, an analytical way, um, that sort of thing is all great, but it belongs in a different place. In the space where we're doing Tolkien Experience podcast, it's more about the personal journey that somebody has had with Tolkien, what that has brought to them, um, how they first came across it and the effect that it's had on their life ever since. Those personal stories are just wonderful to hear. Um, and I have that really close interest with that because I have my own personal story and my group of friends, they all have their personal story. And just getting to share all of that is such an important aspect of what we do with the Tolkien Experience podcast, because it's all about that personal connection. I don't think there are many authors that have had such a huge effect on so many people that they return to these books over and over and over again throughout their lives. Uh, whether they came to them as a young child, as a teenager, as an older adult, they just keep returning to them and it keeps being a part of their life. And that I think is extraordinary in and of itself. So finding out about that um, and kind of digging to the heart of why it is that Tolkien has this incredible effect on people. I mean, that's just, it's wonderful to get to know all of that. And it feeds the nosy Parker in me as well. So I get to dig into other people's lives and go, okay, come on, tell me something about yourself. Um, and that's fun too. Yeah, it's fascinating um, as a fan to have my own horizons expanded um, every time I interact with someone else um, and, and hearing how they interpreted differently or what they got from the text or uh, what they don't like from the text. Uh, you know, there, there's so many different ways to view this. Um, the, the, the books themselves having been translated and published um, for decades worldwide um, means that, uh, you know, the, the, the fandoms really are kind of in their own little ecosystems, uh, even the translations themselves can affect people's approaches to it. And then meeting fans who have um, uh, gone bilingual and read them in the original English and hearing, you know, the, the, the exposures they get in there. There's just so much, I think, that that interests me and is positive for the community, the, the wide umbrella community of, of all Tolkien fandom worldwide. Uh, is to cross pollinate like this to to really hear about uh, other people's experiences and and uh, it's uh, it's it's fantastic uh, and I love that you know sort of the online world has allowed us to connect like this and not you know be doing lots of uh, traveling to have to meet different communities mm -hmm. um, but coming back to getting you guys to talk because it's not about me today. <laughs> um, you know what? So uh, tell us uh, a little, you know, a story or two of, of some great experiences you've had a particular you've mentioned um, a, a fan or two. But I, I'm curious to hear, like, what surprised you, uh, you know, an example or two of, of something you've really enjoyed uh, from the work you've been doing so far. No, I can give an example that won't surprise either Sarah or Luke. Um, my interview with Verlin Flieger. Um, I mean, Verlin is Verlin. Verlin is wonderful. And, you know, we all quite rightfully bow before Verlin because she's just the most awesome person. But my goodness, did she turn that interview around on me? It was supposed to be me interviewing her. That, mm, that worked for about a quarter of the interview. And, and then I, I felt it kind of slipping away from me. She was stunned to ask me more questions. And then it, I felt like a butterfly pinned to a board by the end of it. Um, she's just wonderful. And it was, it, it was a really fun experience, but it was completely different to every other interview that I've had with other people um, in that she took charge of it. <laughs> <laughs> just decided what she was going to do with this interview. And it was, yeah, I mean, it ended up being um, a really fun interview, but that's one that sticks in my mind. And I, I don't think anything uh, has been anything like that. I mean, 
every single person I've interviewed has been wonderful in their own way. Uh, and I've had great fun with some of these interviews. I loved interviewing Andy Higgins because he and I are great friends and we had a real giggle doing that. I loved interviewing Chris Vaccaro because um, we we worked together a fair bit. And again, we had a real laugh over it. I mean, everybody, everybody that I interviewed, Anna Small, all these people are fantastic people. But oh boy, Verlin's interview. Yeah, that was that was different. So I'm going to throw that one out there as being the one that really sticks in my brain. Anything from you, Luke? Um, gosh, it's it's always so hard. It's um, so before I dive in, I'll have to give a couple honorable mentions. Um, New better, do better is a, a TikTok creator who makes Silmarillion videos. His energy is just infectious so when I started talking to him it just the the interview took care of itself and it was just like talking to someone that I'd known for years his energy is just so up there and he's so full of passion for for the Silmarillion um that was just a, a wonderful interview um and having the opportunity to talk to Ralph Bakshi just I I couldn't believe he said yes to us to be honest um we're just a, a small little podcast I I didn't expect that um, but I think, to me, the most amazing story I've heard, um, I'm going to have to go back to Margaret Killjoy. Um, and, and she is um, in, she's a, a musician into metal music, and she started the band Feminazgul, <laughs> is the name of the band. Uh, but when I talked to her about her first reading experience, she told me that she was part of a, uh, a movement that was trying to save this group of trees from being cut down, um, you know, like tying themselves to trees, living in the trees, those kinds of things. And that's the environment in which she first read The Lord of the Rings. And it's just like, I mean, how can, like, how can you not get the eco message in Lord of the Rings when that's the environment that you're reading it in? Um, but it, it was just a bit earth shattering for me that, that like, you know, I went into this saying, we're going to celebrate everyone's different unique experiences. And, you know, for me, it that's a pretty sheltered statement in a lot of ways. Like I'm imagining, okay, where are the different places in a library or a home that we sat down and read Lord of the Rings? You know, like that's, that's kind of what you envision. But no, she, she was reading it in a tree by a, by a, like a headlamp on her that she had strapped to her head and, and being interrupted by people trying to cut down the tree she's living in. You know, like uh, that just was a really quick eye opener for me of this is gonna be a different kind of project that we're doing. <laughs> so that, that one definitely sticks out to me the most. <laughs> Sarah? I, um, I'm gonna cheat and say two, <laughs> two of the very memorable. Cause I mean, everybody I've interviewed so far has been it's just been wonderful to talk to them and see their unique perspectives on the text. But the two that jump out to me are one of them with Elizabeth King, because actually I had known Elizabeth from one of my very first online talking communities, but I didn't, I didn't know her as her professional name at that time. And kind of getting to kind of cross those two streams in the podcast was a really like wonderful thing. And just hearing her very unique perspective on Tolkien because like she works and studies um, like uh, trauma studies. And like, that's such a profound theme in Tolkien, but like hearing it from somebody with a professional background in this um, and their approach to it and how she kind of melds the approach of being a fan with also being a writer of fan fiction. So criticism through creativity was, it's like, it's something I'm passionate about. And it was so beautiful just to listen to her and her passion for that and her ability to elucidate that connection between the two and how the online community has had also shaped that for her. Um, and I, I, so I loved, I loved that interview. And I also loved interview, interviewing um, Putri, who Luke has already mentioned, um, just because she has so much passion for Tolkien and Tolkien's works. And I just love listening to people who can talk for hours about hours about something that they love. And she has, she has such a unique perspective. So she's um, Putri is from Indonesia, and she shares that she shares her connection with, um, with you know, the myths of her of her home country and her culture with her interpretation of Tolkien's work and I, there has been there's been like feedback through that so that she ends up delving more into her her own um, mythology and her cultural experiences as she explores Tolkien and I also really resonated it with because resonated with it because both Putri and me are from Southeast Asia and she was the first like 
Southeast Asian fan I talked to who was the same level of Tolkien obsessed as me. So it was really cool because it was the first time I had like a common cultural touchstone with somebody to talk about this with. Um, and it was just, it was such a, it was such a gem of an interview. I really, I really enjoyed that one. It remains a, a big highlight from me, for me. Um, and I do recommend everybody to go and read Putri's blog because I love, I love her work a lot. Just want to say that, that, yeah. I, that I love the variety in your podcast. I never really know what's going to be the next one. And there aren't many podcasts that I listen to that are like that. Mm. It's great. It, it, it's not the, each episode is, is, is no, I'd say it's different from the last one. It's very good. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks. I'm interested to, to, to ask y'all what are there? I know you interview a lot of different people from a lot of different backgrounds uh, and the, the connection is Tolkien, but are there any um, correlations or trends that you see, uh, the maybe commonalities that you see across the, the different uh, people that you have on? Um, so I, I guess I would ask, are, are you, do you mean, do we see commonalities in their answers or commonalities in who's on the show? I would say their answers. Okay. Um, I mean, I think for the most part, I mean, like you said, the commonality really is Tolkien. And I, I, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I, I enjoy the fact that there's not always commonality mm -hmm. and the experiences can sometimes be so vastly different. Uh, that's, that's part of the joy, I think, of what you guys are doing. Uh, we're down to a, a minute or two left. Uh, last question for you guys. What's next? Like what, not particular people, but where are you going with the podcast? What are you interested in doing? Um, I'll drop a link. Uh, it's in the program. I'll put it in the, the show notes on YouTube afterwards as well. Uh, I know, Luke, you're gathering additional uh, volunteers for the Experience Project. Mm -hmm. Anyway, yeah. So so what are you guys looking to do? Um, you know, for further up and further in it's um you know I, I think the one thing that we kind of can continually challenge ourselves to do is to to pause and say where haven't we looked yet that's mm -hmm. that's where yeah. that that's what motivates us what what group or what individuals have we not talked to that that we need to talk to uh, for different reasons um and, and so we're always trying to challenge ourselves to look in new places but the, the other thing that comes with having two seasons under our belt now is we kind of are more established now. And, and luckily, we, we, were, we were very humbled to receive a, a, an award from the Tolkien Society. Um, so that kind of helps, helps us seem a bit more professional. <laughs> and so the, the good thing about that is now we can, we have a little bit more um, ability to reach out to perhaps some bigger names and say, hey, look, we've talked to some, some other people that you might recognize. Would you consider being on the show? So, you know, we are constantly looking for uh, people that we haven't heard from. And I think we've only heard from like one actor. So, you know, we might try and reach out to some more actors. Um, we're certainly reaching out geographically to different uh, places that we haven't talked to before. Um, today, in fact, we just dropped uh, our first episode of this season and it's with Ted Naismith who you had on your previous panel um in fact I was looking through the the schedule for today and I noticed we had a lot of people <laughs> from from the schedule on the podcast already which is awesome um and so it's it's really just uh constantly trying to challenge ourselves to find new voices um and include people who we haven't heard from yet um so Sarah what do you think yeah everything you just said <laughs> basically <laughs> Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, I want to thank you three for coming on board. Uh, it's been great talking with you today. Um, uh, it's It's been an absolute pleasure, and, and I hope to see you guys again soon. I'm looking forward to, to more podcast episodes. Yes, thank, thank you, you much. It's very good. Thank you for having us. Thank you.
All right, welcome back, everyone. Uh, we are here for uh, the podcast panel, uh, or kind of the second podcast panel, because we we split it into two because of so many people. Uh, this is a fantastic lineup we have here for Tolkien Reading Day. I'm really glad you guys were able to join us. Um, uh, I'm going to pass the ball around the table for each of you to introduce yourselves, and we'll go from there. Why don't we start with uh, you, Sean? All right. Uh, I'm Sean Marchese, also known as the Lord of the Mark from the Prancing Pony podcast. We've been running through Tolkien's works weekly for about six years now, and we have just launched our uh, our new podcast, actually, which I'll let Alan talk about. Um, but uh, yeah, super happy to be here. Thanks, Jeremy. Absolutely. How about you, Alan? Well, I'm Alan Sisto, also known as the Man of the West, the other host of the Prancing Pony podcast. Uh, like Sean said, it's been six years. We're now running also the Rings of Power wrap-up, which uh, we've only got the three episodes out so far, but we're looking forward to putting more out when the Amazon adaptation releases in September, and also a few even before then to try to get folks up to speed. So, Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Marcel, to you. Hi, my name is Marcelo Bromboulos. I'm uh, known as the Tolkienist, or to some of fans in the community as Olve of Alqualonde, Lord of the Teleri, on to all the Pratchett fans out there. I'm also Moist von Lippig. And yes, uh, I'm doing the Tolkienist.com uh, blog and Patreon as well as a podcast, apparently. Good to have you here all. Who knew? <laughs> Who knew? Uh, all right, we'll go with Chad. Hello. I'm joking. Chad Bornholt. Yes. Right, right. Right. I understood. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I knew exactly. Hello, what you were well, let me about let me mute myself. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm Chad Bornholt. I'm that Chad who just joined and wasn't in on the last one. But uh, thanks to the Man of the West and the Lord of the Mark, a lot of people out there who don't know my last name know me as Chad in Texas. But I answer to anything, including uh, a number of curse words. <laughs> This is not a surprise. <laughs> Fantastic. And then we'll go to Chad. All right, everybody. I'm I'm Chad High. I'm the other Chad in Texas. Chad number two in some circles. Um, I'm Mr. Underhill in other circles. Uh, together with uh, myself and my my brother Chad Bornholt, we run a podcast called the Texas Tolkien Talk Podcast, where fans from all over the world can pick a topic reach out to us, come on and join uh, a panel of other fans and we have a conversation and it's a lot of fun and I encourage everybody to to reach out to us and, and come on, it's a lot of fun. I mean, how likely is it that there are two Chads and both are in Texas? Well done, boys. And believe it or not, we live in the same city. We live, Houston's so big, we live an hour and apart from one another, but technically we live in the same city. You know, this <laughs> may come as a surprise to listeners, but there are actually more than two in Texas. <laughs> Amazing. There might Surprise. be five. There might be five Chads across the entire state of Texas. You guys just make enough noise that, you know, it drowns all the other Chads out. People hear us coming. Yeah. 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 True. So, so uh, Alan and Sean, why podcasting? I know you guys started in, uh, oh, I think, wow. a Facebook group, but uh, yeah, what, yeah. what triggered the move over to podcasting? Well, <laughs> the move over to podcasting was uh, related to my career, a uh, career, let me, let me put air quotes in that, my career in voiceover. Uh, I've been doing VO for a little longer than I've been doing podcasting. And I had a VO coach who recommended that I do a podcast in order to get a little more comfortable behind the microphone so that I didn't have such a, uh, such a newscaster delivery. And so I thought, well, okay, what can I talk about for 45 minutes? And uh, obviously Tolkien came to the top of that list. And Sean and I had been going back and forth uh, in that Facebook group uh, discussing, oh, various book week posts. And we'd keep trying to one up each other with longer and longer essays that became monographs that became published works. Uh, and, and so uh, I reached out to him after he mentioned something about how it might be fun to do a podcast someday. I, I knew I had my victim. And I reached out to him and said, all right, let's uh, do, do you still want to do you want to do a podcast? And he said, yeah, I think we could do that. So that's how it started. It was originally going to be, oh, once a month for an hour or so. And, was, and now it's essentially, plan, yeah. yeah. And now it's like our second job. So, yeah. Yeah. It, it does sound like a second job. And Sean, you want to add anything to that before I? Uh, no, just, I mean, the yeah, I'd, I'd been a fan of podcasts for a long time, mostly history podcasts. So the kind of yeah. the long form going through, you know, one long story of a place or, 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 or time or event 
was something that was just really natural to me. And when Alan first proposed this to me, I was like, yeah, this is how we should do it. And we, we just, we just clicked on everything instantly. Uh, amazingly. Yeah. It's funny cause we don't agree about anything except for Tolkien stuff. And we agree about everything when it comes to Tolkien stuff. Uh, that's about right. That That's, that's not really true actually, no. but no, it, it, yeah, we just clicked so much on everything Tolkien and it was just like, this is how we're going to do it. Yep. Yep. And the rest is history. Absolutely. So, Chad, uh, let's pass the ball to you guys. What uh, triggered uh, podcasting specifically that you guys wanted to bring up the the Texas Tolkien talk? You want me to tell the first thing that I yeah. so, oh, oh dear. So basically, so everyone who knows me, I'm always talking about Tolkien constantly, right? So, so uh, I was on the internet at one point in time, and I was kind of uh, I was kind of making some comments to this this girl that we all know named Debbie Brazell that, that uh, I was saying that it's a shame that there's not deeper stuff. And she asked me if I knew Alan and Sean and I did not. And, uh, and she said, yeah, they're about to start. And she, then she said, they're in that group where they're always doing the book week stuff. I was like, Oh yeah, yeah. I know those. I know who that is. And so, so uh, some of my friends have been telling me, you need to start a podcast for this stuff. Well, then she told me to listen to theirs. I was like, okay, perfect. I don't have to do a podcast. <laughs> I wouldn't have gone this far anyway, right? So, so I'd have just been on there saying, this is cool. This is, this is cool. Isn't that cool? No, I wouldn't have been like going as deep as what they are and stuff like that. We'll pass it over to Chad because Chad had another idea and then we kind of like joined them. Uh, well, you know, like a lot of, uh, like a lot of Tolkien podcasters, I was, uh, I was really inspired by, by Alan and Sean, um, because they, y'all's podcast is the gold standard. Obviously they, they put out a a fantastic product. Um, and I knew that I wanted to do a podcast, but I didn't, I knew, I know the, the commitment that Alan and Sean make every week. And I I don't have, I, I'm not prepared to make that commitment. (laughs) Neither were we. Neither were we all the time. Um, and so I, but you know, Chad and I, uh, we, uh, had become very good friends and I was sitting, I was just sitting around thinking about, well, what could we do to kind of contribute to the podcasting community? So I messaged him and I I just said, Hey, you know, do you want to start a podcast? And Chad said, like everything else, he said, absolutely. I do. Like he says, he says that to everything. So we, we, you know, over uh, the course of a couple of days, we just kind of, we thought about, well, what would people enjoy listening to? What, what, and what would we enjoy doing? Yeah. And one of the things that we, we do every month that we really enjoy is we have, uh, I run the, uh, the Houston Tolkien Society and we meet once a month and we have smile, mo- we have moots once a month. Sometimes they're online and sometimes they're in person. Um, and we really, really enjoy that. We look forward to that every single month. We have themes that we, and we, you know, we have all kinds of things that we talk about. And so we wanted to bring that to more people. We wanted people to be able to participate and we wanted to, for people to be able to listen because we feel like people um, would really enjoy listening to these conversations. So, you know, obviously the recording is a bit more structured than uh, than a regular smile mood, but we try to create re- recreate that experience as best we can. And uh, Marcel, uh, you you you're doing a podcast. It's in German. Uh, I follow along on Twitter with the information that you share there, but I, I yeah. know not enough to do it. Uh, so I kind of used that as a hook to to get you into this panel because I really wanted to have you on here today. So talk a bit about yeah. your podcast, but I'd love to talk about well, other stuff you're doing as well. The first the first thing I have to say is a huge shout out to my co-hosts, uh, Marcus and Sebastian, Mountain King and Fingolfin, uh, who are two of my best and oldest friends. And, and the theme of this year's Tolkien Reading Day, which is love and friendship, is actually the background to why we made the Small Talk podcast. I mean, we're all still in the pandemic. Uh, You know, some people say it's not going to last much longer. I disagree, but it's it's a huge problem because usually fans can get together. You go to a smile mood, you go to literary society convention, you go to all sorts of places where you can meet up with people who just love talking. And I noticed in recent years, there are quite a few of us. So, uh, you know, that get together thing is so huge and so wonderful. And having that taken away for more than two years now, um, that it's just it's just horrible for all sorts yeah. of reasons. And we decided at the time, because what we usually do is over Sylvester, over New Year's Day, we have a three to five day 
mini convention with 100, 150 people on a medieval castle somewhere in Germany. It snowed under. We got a whole board of game, board games, card games, role playing games, 200 of those. We have Nerf, Nerf gun tournaments. We have lectures and workshops on Tolkien, Pratchett, Ursula K. Le Guin. It's like, it's like mayhem. But it's all fun. It's all getting together and having friends. And we had to cancel this event for several mm. times now. We can't go to the book fairs. We can't go to any. So what we wanted was an online home. We, we wanted to, to provide people opportunities saying, OK, shit, I can't go anywhere. It's Saturday evening. What am I going to do? And that's what we basically did. We started this podcast totally ad lib, no scripts, no whatever. We, I mean, I love you guys because we do so much work beforehand and so structured. And I, there's a German Tolkien podcast that does a single minute of the film trilogies each episode. You know how many minutes minute. the extended edition of the first film trilogy has, <laughs> people? It's insane. So, yeah. but that's, that's very structured because you know those are going to the scenes, the images, the pictures we're going to talk about. And that lets you slide in. We just talk, we just invite people. We have a basic idea. Maybe we talk about SheLab today because we love characters in the background that are not the fellowship. Or we do, we invite guests to come over. Jenny, Jenny Dolphin is going to be one of our guests soon. Anka Eisman yeah. was a guest. So what we basically do is come together. We do an hour of talk with a certain topic. It's nothing strict, it's nothing you know too complicated. And then you just stay, you just stay in the channel and we talk and we have a chat and that's what we do because friendship certainly is one of the most essential themes in Tolkien and why so, pe yeah. so many people can really love those stories and appreciate them so much because it's a fellowship that basically brings all of us together. And that's why we started. It's our first year anniversary in April, so yay. Congrats. If, if I may, so this is a very good reason for me to go ahead and start doing Duolingo German so that I can listen to the podcast. And then by the time you guys have your next meeting, I'll uh, hopefully be fluent. I was about to suggest, Sean, that we plan our next live mood event to be at something like that because we need to be there. Yeah, that sounds fun. Well, you do have a talent for languages, Sean, so that could be, it could be true. I'm going to try. I'm going to do my best. It is a very easy language to learn. There's no problem at all. It's just Germans. <laughs> by their next episode so does that mean a later episode of ppp will be in german soon <laughs> yeah maybe we'll have marcel on and, and interview him in german yeah yeah yes yeah, please <laughs> you know one, of, one yeah. of the things that we do on the texas Tolkien talk podcast is anytime we have a guest on who speaks a language other than english we have them read the first few paragraphs of the hobbit in the in their native yes. language it's really really great. cool oh, that's great that's great Marcel, how do you say Prancing Pony podcast in German? Oh, it, it, the thing is, you can't really say that in German, can you? No. Cheat, 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 cheat. <laughs> <laughs> Some Tensel and Pony podcast. That would be the German edition of that particular podcast, you know. It sounds so exotic. I like it. See, see Tensel and Pony. See mm -hmm. how close it is in English? It's like the same thing. Yeah, it basically is. Yeah, true, yeah. true. German, it's just German. English with attitude. <laughs> I would subscribe to that. Thank you very much. <laughs> that's they. That's their yet unveiled third podcast that they're. That they're oh no! <laughs> <laughs> Don't put more on my plate, man. Please. Yeah. Uh, well, you had, did. We mentioned we're more. also writing a book because we're also writing a book. <laughs> I, I was just going to say that you yeah. know on the, uh, the the community building friendship the themes we've kind of got for this Tolkien reading day it's not just about the podcast because that no. has led to community yeah. or led from community for all of you guys so absolutely yeah, just Huge. Alan you started talking so I'll hand the ball to you and Sean okay. uh, talk about the other stuff you're doing that's kind of grown out of the podcast yeah absolutely I mean when Marcel was talking about friendship and and that was sort of the uh, instigator for for the for the beginning of his podcast. That's actually what's kept ours going, and not just our yeah. friendship is in me and Sean, but the friendship of our entire community. I've been blown away by how many really deep connected friendships there have uh, that that have developed in our community. A lot of people come in and they've just built this community around the show that I I just can't speak highly enough for the people that listen to us. Uh, they're far better than we are. Well, and, we're and it's got a life him. of its own, right? I it mean, really it, does. It has taken off as a community in and of itself, it, and, and yeah, people are gathering absolutely. within that community. There are sub communities, mm -hmm. and you know, the, you know, yeah. there, we've got our Discord server, but there's so much stuff going on there. There's events that people are doing that has nothing to do with us. It's just no, 
when we say it's a community that's built up around the podcast, that's really what we mean. I, I don't really know how much credit we can take. But, very little. Yeah, yeah, I agree. But <laughs> really? but I think it's that really is what has kept us going. And so as we it is, you know, Alan and I first met on Facebook. We first met in person at a moot. That was the first time we actually met each other was at Myth Moot in 2018. Myth Moot 5. Yeah. So yeah. that would be four years ago. So, yeah, 2018. Yeah. And I think it's just basically and we've never lived in the same place. So I think all of our no. interactions have always been either online or at Moots. And so online and Moots is, is a pretty good way to interact as far as we're concerned. And so it is. Uh, that's it is. what we've been doing a lot of online. We've done we've done our own Moots. And uh, yeah, we did yeah, the digital moot last and year. There. That's right. I and mean, we're even doing an, an in-person moot this year uh, as well as a digital moot. And then, uh, you know, we, we casually dropped the fact that we're writing the book as well. But that's that's community based, too. I mean, the fact is, yeah. if we didn't have uh, the people that we have around the show. There wouldn't be the interest from a publisher in putting yeah. it together. But they reached out to us and we're excited to say yes. So, yeah, yeah. that's awesome. Chad's, how about you guys? The community and friendships and stuff wrapped around, you know, where your your smile and the podcast and everything. Before, before we say that, I want to say that like the Prancing Pony one, the Prancing Pony podcast community has kind of become just part of the Tolkien community in general. It's almost like it's the same thing now. It's almost it's it's really surprising now. Four or five years ago, it was unheard of, but now I'm really surprised when I suggest it to someone else, and they don't all they're not already extremely familiar with it. It's it's really neat. Same with, same with Corey. You know, it's like you can tell yeah. the, people who don't, the people who don't know it are the movie only people. That's pretty much it. I think over time, what's happened is that all these communities have overlapped more and more. Exactly. So there's, you know, there's Facebook groups that I was in with Marcel five years ago, and we mm -hmm. didn't really know each other at the time. And yet, you know, over time, those community groups have just kind of like coalesce. Yeah, they've kind of coalesced. And, you know, the, the Venn diagram has gotten closer to a circle. It's still not a yeah. circle. But it's no, gotten closer no. to a circle, and that's actually really cool. And that's actually one of the things about COVID that has, you know, in a way that's been one of those silver linings, you know. I mean, I think so many people have come online for so many portions of their lives that, uh, you know, our community has benefited from that. When I say our community, I don't mean Sean and me. I mean all of us, your podcast and your show and, and, and your – uh, Patreon and all the things that you do, Marcel, all of these things have benefited from people who are are really looking for the connections that they've had to step step away from. You know, you talked about those yeah. events and they're coming online and they're finding that community here. And it's great. I love it. It's so much in the spirit of Tolkien. I mean, I, yeah. I just it, it, there's not another fandom community like it. There really isn't. Yeah, and in, in terms of the Texas Tolkien Talk podcast, I'll, I'm sorry, Marcel, I'll, I, I will let you talk, I promise. Um, the, uh, the uh, <laughs> well, I just wanted to say that the, the, with the TTT, I mean, like we really have benefited from being a part and being integrated with uh, what Marcel does and what, with both what Alan and Sean does and with what we do on the, on the Tolkien Collector's Guide. I mean, I've gotten, yeah, yeah. we've gotten guests, yeah. we've gotten lots of lots of guests from the PPP community. We've gotten guests from the, the Collector's Guide community. We've gotten guests through the Tolkienists. Um, and that's really allowed us to have a, a, a few more prominent fans, I guess, or even, you know, our, our latest episode, which Jeremy was on with us. We interviewed Dr. John Rosegrant, who just put out a book yeah. and we are, we're interviewing, uh, we're bringing on Nancy Bunting, who wrote a book about Edith, Edith Bratt um, in a couple of months. So it's just, it's allowed us, the, the integration of the community has allowed us to grow along along with you guys. Marcel. The thing, the thing about is about this community and the, the history of the community really is, I mean, there have been Tolkien fans before today, obviously, you know, not only for 10 years or 20 years, even well before that. And I mean, I, I founded the, the German Tolkien Society in 1997. So, so basically what this is, is just a new shape, a new form, a new yeah. medium of volunteer work. And, and the mm. fun part always is, is when people volunteer doing, running a smile, running a podcast, running YouTube channels, whatever you do is to bring people together and give them the opportunity. And, and as Ellen said, one of the few silver linings of this pandemic is, at least that's what I'm hoping, is when the societies and the smiles, they will going to continue to do hybrid conventions yes. and meetups. Because a lot of people cannot come to, let's say, Oxford yeah. or Oxford or to any of the moots in the United States 
to you know the mythopoeic society but if they have the opportunity to watch online to participate online that mm -hmm. is just a huge huge boost uh, to all of the community i can only highly suggest to anyone who's it's it's to tons of learning you know the learning curve was horrible <laughs> to yes. anyone involved you know yeah. let's do a hybrid convention thank you uh, but if you've made the, the this progress, if you've met, learned how to do this, please continue to do so because there are so many people who would love to join in wherever they are, whatever language they speak, uh, because so much fun is out there. So, um, yeah. and that's that's yeah. the thing about I love about podcasts that you obviously can listen to them later on. You can go through all of the episodes of every single podcast. But joining live or joining a convention, that is the fun thing, and and that's yeah. really I'm I'm looking forward to finally seeing some of your people again you know that's that's yeah. the thing and yeah. um you know let's hope for the best as always absolutely yeah. and i think that's something for listeners today uh coming out of this is you know there's no wrong way to do this like podcasts is is one method of sharing your love uh, we've talked with a couple of other groups already the artists and the tolkien experience and we've got other people coming on later <laughs> Uh, but just in general, share your love and yeah. and join other people's sharings, whether they're conventions or podcasts or yeah. websites or Facebook groups, et cetera. It's it's the, the the community in general is improving by the more people that we're getting joining it, and uh, it's it's been great to get to know you guys in particular. I mean, um, uh, personally myself, uh, throw that out there, uh, and I love meeting additional fans all the time and, and trying to stick my fingers into each of your communities and, <laughs> and, and grow from there. Cause I am, I'm not a podcaster. Uh, I don't think I have the, uh, the face for radio. <laughs> uh, we all, no, have, it's we all have it's, that Jeremy. That's exactly. I, I, yeah. <laughs> we all suffer from the face for radio. Uh, I, I, I love, um, I love seeing other people's, joy in in producing the content that you guys do you know it, it really shows through uh it's fantastic yeah. um and uh, uh we've got like five minutes left i don't have any particular questions but uh you know it's uh uh open floor like what let's let's throw it around you've mentioned a book uh um mm -hmm. the chads i don't think you guys got around to to what you want to work on next and marcel i want to swing back to you just you know uh, and and of course um Sean and Alan, I just let's, let's close out with like what you guys are working on, what you want to talk about. Chad's first. What I was so, going to say, say I, whenever you said that, I, I really appreciate the content that you guys are coming up with. Our guests come up with our content. I don't come up with it at all. Man, there's there's the easy job yeah. for you right there, Sean. That yeah. was our mistake. Yeah, 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 that, yeah. That's. <laughs> that's <laughs> that was something we should have got on on day one. That was that yeah. Was really good yeah. So, yeah, so, yeah, 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 go ahead, Well, so we, we, you know, our podcast doesn't really change a whole lot. We are just, uh, as long, we just are going to continue to advertise. We're going to continue to have anybody and everybody who wants to come on. So, uh, we are just wrapping up season one now, you know, we're, we're, we're going to start season two, uh, after, uh, after May, we're gonna start season two in June. And as long as people, are still reaching out to us and still want to come on, we're going to continue making the episodes. Uh, we started with some bi-monthly episodes, but now we're, we're, we've had, you know, such a good uh, turnout that we are, we have enough to do one a month. So, you wow. know, I would encourage people to, to continue to go to our website, texastalking.com, click on the getting on the podcast link and fill out the form and we'll get you in. And, and if I may just say a word about that, Chad's, uh, thank you guys for doing the, the podcast yeah. the way you do it, because, you know, to Jeremy's point earlier, there's so many people out there who want to contribute to this community. And you guys are giving people a platform to do that, helping people find their voice, whether it is actually going to be their voice or maybe they they come up with something that they realize, no, this is something else I can create, whether it's art or whatever. And I just love that you guys are just giving a platform to everybody. That's great. We try. And uh, Marcel, I have one question from the Discord channel. Um, uh, oh yeah, you beat me to it, Jeremy. I was gonna. Yeah, ask. yeah. <laughs> I'm not gonna say things in German. No, no, thank you. <laughs> uh, no, they specifically want to know uh, the sexy Sauron. Oh come on, that is not you're not it's, serious. There is there the is name, a, there is a demand the name, in the no, chat. No, 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 no. Oh, the name is demand. not sexy Sauron. It is Anna Yummy 
tar. It's very oh. simple. <laughs> Anna Yummy Tar. That is the correct name. I rest my case. Yeah. Thank you. Jeff Bezos. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Exit stage it's right. too bad his microphone that's is mounted because he really wanted to drop it. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's what I was going to say. If Jeff Bezos Next says, time. If Jeff Bezos says anything, he better bring a sexy sour on. That's all I got to say more so. Well, his name, is, that's his, season name two. Is, his name is Bezok, so we all know what's going to happen, right? <laughs> awesome. Uh, we're at the top of the hour. You guys have been awesome. I really appreciate it. Uh, thanks for coming on board here. I look forward to hearing uh, more creative output from all of you guys. So, yes, thank, so you. thank you so much for coming. Thanks and for all our guests, and all the people our listening, all, all subscribe to the podcast, listen to it. Yeah, absolutely. I've got links to all of your uh, sites and podcasts in the show notes uh, on the mm -hmm. website. They'll go up on YouTube uh, at the end of the show um, as right. well. So thanks again, guys. Thanks for putting thank up you. with you. Thank, thank you, guys. Thank you. And welcome back, everyone. We are here at the top of the hour. We have uh, James and Elise who are joining us for Tolkien Reading Day 2022. It's great to have you guys. Um, we're here to talk. Uh, you guys are working together on some interesting projects. Uh, I'm going to hand the, the floor over to you first, James, to introduce yourself and then Elise. Um, and we'll go from there. Thanks, guys. Welcome. Great. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, I'm James Tauber. Um, and uh, head up the uh, the digital talking project. Um, I'm in, also involved uh, with Signum University, and I'm sure we'll uh, get to to talking about a bunch of that soon. And my name is Elise Daniel. I am primarily a literacy teacher, and I do a lot of work with uh, literacy and book clubs online in several platforms, including uh, Signum University. Um, and you may hear my infant son in the background, um, who is a newly minted Tolkien fan. Very well, think, newly minted. Awesome. Okay. Well, I think to begin with, we'll have a couple of questions. Um, how did you first meet, really? And, and also, for people who don't know, what is digital humanities? <laughs> well, the, 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 the two are sort of connected because... Uh, so, um, Elise and I first met uh, just over three years ago, uh, March 2019. Uh, there was a Signum uh, meetup or moot up in New York City uh, that coincided actually with the uh, the Morgan exhibit, the Tolkien exhibit at, at the Morgan. Um, and I flew down from Boston uh, for the meetup. And uh, at least you one of the organizers of the, the meetup. Yeah, I, I kind of offered myself to uh, Corey Olson and said, you know, I live in the area, you know, let me at least reserve a restaurant so that we could have a kind of meetup afterwards. And um, People like, you know, Corey Olson was there, John Garth was there, uh, a couple of other uh, Tolkien people who were in the area for the New York conference and for 
uh, seminar that was happening at the Morgan Library for this for the Tolkien exhibit that was based on the one that had released at the Bodleian in Oxford a, f- a few yeah. months previously. Yeah. And, so I. Oh. Um, I, you know, I was sitting across the table from James and I knew he worked in digital humanities, but I had no idea what that actually entailed. So I just, I turned to him and said, so James, what is digital humanities? What is that? (laughs) What what does one do with it? The first thing I remember you, yeah, when we first met, the first thing out of your mouth was, what is digital humanities? Um, So yeah, I mean, digital humanities, very, very broadly speaking, is the application of technology to the study of the humanities. But I mean, it really has to do with sort of the quantitative analysis of all of the output of, of human culture and, and, and creativity. Um, so that, that includes uh, music and the visual arts and history. Uh, but in my case, uh, my particular focus is on uh, the application to languages and texts. And uh, most of the work that I have done for a long time has been focused on things like ancient Greek, to a lesser extent, Old English and, and Old Norse. And um, but more recently, in the last uh, four years or so, I've I've also been applying it to uh, to the texts of, of of Tolkien. Yeah, which I assume must be a bit of a challenge because uh, obviously some of the text is copyright, so. Yes, I mean, how, digital. How would you get around that? Yeah, I mean, a lot of that stuff gets done. Any does get done with with copyrighted works. Um, there, there are things like the Hathi Trust in um, that that you know scanned a lot of still in copyright books. And in in those cases, what what they're trying to do is a lot of distant reading, where they're trying to find patterns across very large amounts of text, and so they're not really interested in revealing individual text. In in the case of what I do with with Tolkien. Um, a lot of it has to do with separating the annotations and analysis from the text itself. So, you know, typically what I can do if I'm analyzing ancient Greek or something is I can include the, the annotations with the text. Uh, with, with Tolkien, you can't do that. I, I, I can't say, here's the text of Lord of the Rings with the characters, uh, you know, the mentions of Frodo indicated in line. Instead, I have to, uh, you know, make those annotations outside of the text and reference into the text and say, in this book, in this chapter, in this paragraph, in this word, uh, this is going on. Um, and, and keep the copyrighted text from the separate from the analysis in that way. Yeah, I, I see that you're, uh, sorry about the digital Tolkien project. Can you give us some more information about that? Yeah, so, I mean, it, the digital Tolkien project came out of a realization that uh, a lot of us, approach the works of Tolkien to a level of detail and analysis that's really only found in in things like study of of ancient texts, ancient and medieval texts. I mean, the extent to which people go to produce uh, things like the Complete Guide to Middle Earth, which I'm sure we hear about um, with with Bob Foster and so on, you know, is is rare in uh, in other works. Um, Certainly, you know, over over the last um, last few you know, going back a long way in time. And so the, the question in my mind was, well, if, if Tolkien's works are worthy of that level of study, um, why not do it with the same sort of modern uh, digital techniques that are applied to things like uh, Homer and, and, um, and the Old Testament and, and, and things like that. So the digital project, the digital Tolkien project is really just trying to do that. Take, take the sort of uh, work that I do with, ancient texts and um, and apply it to, to Tolkien as well. Um, quick question for Elise. I'm, I'm interested, how how do you see we, we get uh, kids and children more interested in Tolkien these days? A lot of the students that I've worked with come from Tolkien in various ways, whether it's because they've seen the Peter Jackson films um, or their parents um, have read Tolkien to them or introduce Tolkien to them. I, with, with what I do, I set up book clubs with um, the homeschooling platform that I work with called outschool.com. And I do the same thing with Signum Academy, um, which, is, which is part of Signum University. And, you know, some, there are some students, you know, say I'm interested in reading Tolkien, but I don't know, like, is this, is this going to be too hard for me? Or, uh, you know, I've watched the films and I'm really interested in the books, but who is this Tom Bombadil guy? Where did he come from? (laughs) Um, So I, 
when I teach book clubs, I have, I am very cognizant of what the students know and what the students want to know, because it's very discussion based. It's very, um, I, I have my own questions about the text that I have the students answer either before the, the class starts or during the, during the lesson. But I always ask the students to bring in their own discussion questions. Um, whether um, I've had some students come in into my Hobbit book club um, because their teacher assigned it at school, but for summer reading, but they're like, I don't know, I don't know what, you know, who is this Tolkien guy? Like, where did this come from? Why do I have to read this? Um, and it's not so much getting kids interested as much as it's getting kids asking questions and engaging with the text with their own sense of curiosity. Um, when I taught The Lord of the Rings last year, almost all the discussion questions were lore questions. They wanted to know more about the background. They wanted to know some of the things that were mentioned in the text, but weren't present in the film. So they're asking me, you know, who, um, what was going on? How come Sauron, um, how come Sauron was doing this? Or where did Sauron come from? Um, how come, how come Helm, what was going on with Helm's Deep? Where did, um, where did Helm's Deep start? Um, what's going, what's the history of Rohan? Um, so a lot of the questions that the students ask are out of their own innate curiosity for what they see mentioned in the text, but Tolkien doesn't provide a lot of detail or a lot of background in right away, at least not until perhaps later in the history of Middle Earth or in, um, in later passages. So it's all about just fostering that curiosity. And um, what I do with James is if there's, if there's a question that I'm not able to answer right away, or it requires a little bit more research, I'll say to James, you know, my student had this really interesting question. Can you help me find some passages where I can help, I can point to uh, for my students and answer it. And so he'll do that. He'll do that search um, through digital Tolkien and he'll glean out the various passages where say, um, if I have, uh, if we were talking about Bomber, like, or um, I think we had the example, James, uh, during when we presented at the PVP moot of all the times that Bomber is referred to as fat in The Hobbit. And he's always, <laughs> he's almost always has this qualifier, Bomber, who was fat. So if we wanted to have a discussion about fat shaming in, in The Hobbit, we could pick out all of those various passages. Um, and every, every student notices different things. I've noticed some students notice language patterns within Tolkien. I had one student who noticed in The Hobbit um, the, like, these like, two adjectives per noun pattern. Um, like Bobo was described as having um, long clever fingers and she thought that that illiter that ri almost rhythmic description was really interesting and so you know James typed that in and we found all of those different all of those references so fostering curiosity and you know having letting the students approach the text from where they are whether it's from the Peter Jackson lens or from my dad read me this book and I'm interested in diving it diving into it some more um, it all they all they all work in tandem and the the students all support one another in answering each other's questions yeah i mean one of the, one of the things that that i've found working with elise you know as a as somebody doing uh the sort of work that i do with with computers and text um you can very easily become sort of enamored with the the cleverness of it all or the you know you've got all these amazing tools what you really need is, is to do interesting scholarship is the right questions and you know really interesting questions to throw at the tools and no one asks more interesting questions than kids and so that's true. been a you know a huge basis of of our collaboration is you know Elise coming to me with the really fascinating questions that the kids have and thinking about the ways in which the digital tools can help uh, you know extract maybe a little more information from the text about those sorts that answers those questions or sparks new questions as well. I mean, that's another sort of aspect of this is sometimes we've found interesting patterns in the text and then, you know, that's been the basis for, for new stuff that we've done done with kids or Elise has done with the kids. Um, you mentioned uh, Signum. Uh, for people who don't know, it'd be quite useful if you can uh, explain what Signum is and also what your involvement is with uh, Signum. 
So Singham University is an online university that has a uh, has a master's program for fantasy literature. I just finished uh, my my master's degree with Signum in um, the imaginative literature branch, but we also have a Tolkien studies branch. So if you want to get a master's degree in Tolkien studies, you can go to Signum University. Um, but if you're not interested in pursuing an actual master's, uh, Signum also has a has two new two relatively new programs. Um, there's Signum Academy, which is specifically for kids. So I teach um, I teach a, a book club uh, through Signum Academy with uh, with young students. Um, you can all there's book clubs. There's also writing clubs language clubs. So these could be um, modern languages like Spanish or French, or um, they could also be languages like ancient Greek or ancient Hebrew. Um, and so those are, those are specifically for kids, but we also have the space program. And space is for, is, is our continuing education classes for specifically for adults. So these are non-credit courses. They're just for fun. Um, they're one. They they run for a, each each class runs for a month. And um, James and I are pre. I, I I started precepting some of my book clubs on space because um, I um, when I when James and I presented at the uh, Prancing Pony podcast moot last May um, and talked about what what we do with the book clubs, some adults, you know, some, some members of the PPP community came up to me and said, Hey, do you teach book clubs for adults? Cause this sounds like a lot of fun. So we started doing that through space. Um, I hosted a letters from father Christmas book club in December. And that was a lot of fun. And James and I are going to be teaching, um, in April, we have a bridge to the Silmarillion course, because that was another uh, course that my that my students my my children students my children students said to me can you teach us the Silmarillion and I said yes but I'm gonna have to think about how so <laughs> yeah, yeah at least how do I had you a great introduce the yeah. Silmarillion to children what do you do with that so James, why don't you talk a little bit about the process yeah. of how we started thinking about our bridge yeah, to the Silmarillion so, course? So we came up with this idea originally originally for the kids of and, and, and of basically making sure that we adequately set the scene in the context of Lord of the Rings. Um, Christopher Tolkien actually makes reference to this in History of Middle Earth. He he says he regrets not giving the Silmarillion a framing story set in the Third Age because he felt that you know the sort of inquisitiveness that Sam had about you know when when Sam says I'd like to hear more about that that sort of question about things in the First Age and Second Age really helps set up, I think, the right attitude to go into to the Silmarillion. And so Elise and I started talking about what if we ran a course that was mostly Lord of the Rings readings, um, even some of The Hobbit, but setting up those sort of interesting questions, um, not only about events um, and people, but also some of the themes. When are other times that, that there's been a, a human and an elf uh, union? You know, why is Elrond called half-elven? Um, what is it about the elves? Why are they referred to as being in exile? Um, why are they traveling west? What is the test that Galadriel passed, right? All these sorts of questions um, really set up nicely a lot of the stuff that goes on the, in the Silmarillion. But of course, the question is, how do we find all those things? And this is where uh, the sort of digital humanity side of things came in. Um, we started looking into all of the passage, the way I did it, just to to, to to quickly give some technical detail, I looked in particular at all of the uh, proper nouns in the Lord of the Rings that also appear in the Silmarillion or in the Quintus Silmarillion in particular, and then looked at the Lord of the Rings passages to double check that Tolkien wasn't just doubling up on a name, because obviously Tolkien does that with things like Mablung and things like that. Um, but for the most part, that gave us a lot of insight into when uh, people, places, uh, and events from the First Age uh, mentioned in Lord of the Rings. Um, and yeah, so we started planning out a potential way of doing this uh, with kids and then uh, space gave us an opportunity to uh, do that for adults too. So we're actually going to end up doing it for adults before we do it, before at least does it for kids. And that's, uh, that's a course we'll be, we'll be teaching in, in April. Um, so it'll be sort of half readings from Lord of the Rings and then, you know, then dipping, dipping our toes into, into the Silmarillion, particularly for people that are fans of Lord of the Rings, but have always been a bit 
hesitant about the Silmarillion or they've, they've tried the Silmarillion and, and being confused or not being quite ready for it. Um, that's what, yeah, that's this what is, we're trying this to help is with. Not, this is not for the um, Allens and Shawns of the world or the, 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 right. Chad, the Chads of the world who can recite the Silmarillion backwards and forwards. This is for people who, like for my kids, for example, they were really interested in what was going on with the Palantiri in um, when we were looking through the Two Towers and the Return of the King. They were when they saw references to um, to the trees when Aragorn came into his kingship. My one of my students said, "What's going on with these trees? Where did they come from?" And even just doing just a quick search on Google had a whole list of the different references of the how, of two the two trees that are mentioned in. Um, not only in the Silmarillion, but also um, but throughout the the Legendarium, and how you know how great was it that James was able to do the same thing with his um, with his search, so we could find those specific passages throughout the Lord of the Rings and throughout the Silmarillion to make those connections. And so, whether it's for space or whether it's for Sigmund Academy or whether it's for uh, my out school classes, all of these. Uh, all of these questions and all of these topics sort of cycle and feed each other and help us prep for what kids might be interested in or what other other readers might be interested in in engaging with Tolkien and with the Tolkien community and and with the text. So it, that's that's the great thing about Tolkien is wherever you're coming from in your Tolkien journey, you can enter it in in any in any capacity you know it's there there's so many different gateways into Tolkien that it's it's all just it's it's all just it's all fascinating and it's it's all collaborative and um it's fun how do you um at least this is for you in particular um mm -hmm. when you're teaching kids and you're coming on to, you know, the chapter about Turin, for example. <laughs> like, We're skipping what's Turin. What's your approach? Ah, that's We're skipping an Turin. approach. Um, sure. <laughs> well, so one of, one of the things that, I, that I'm definitely going to be doing, whether it's um, for the kids or so that it's, it, and when, when James did was look at the different references that, that specifically occurred in the Lord of the Rings. And so when I was teaching the Lord of the Rings last summer, you know, I saw we had uh, passages about Aragorn talking about Baron and Luthien and the kids were like, hey, who were Baron and Luthien? Where'd they come from? What are the, um, what's the introduction that the Lord of the Rings provides? Um, so when it, if, you know, if students ask me about Turin and Turin Bar, I'll say, I, you know, talk to your parents about that one because that one's a little, um, you know, I'm, I'm not about to, I'm not about to get in trouble with your parents about that one. Definitely talk to them, but you know, they, a lot of them just had a lot of questions about Sauron and his origins or about, oh my gosh, the number of questions I got about Gandalf and how magic actually works in the Lord of the Rings. That was a, that was a big, like there were, there were shouting matches in one of my classes about like how Gandalf operates because kids get really into like, what's Gandalf even doing? How come he's not rushing in to save the day? You know, where's, where's the mad, where's the magic sparky things to knock everything down. And I wrote, I, I wrote, um, I wrote a post in my, in my blog about how Gandalf acts as a teacher. And, um, I couldn't have done that. Um, I couldn't have come to that approach without my students' questions of how magic and Gandalf operate within the confines of Middle Earth and within the confines of the Valar's instructions. Um, so really, the the kids come to me with their questions, and I can I can say, okay, so here's a place for you to look on on this topic, and here's a place where we can look together. Um, I would, I would find, I found a bunch of resources too. And I also, you know, I would point them to James's website or I would point them to um, the Prancing Pony podcast or Tolkien Gateway. So um, even like when there were kids who um, couldn't find an answer right away, they knew where to look and they knew, um, and I would tell them different books to look at too. So like one kid comes into the club one day and he shows me this whole stack of reference materials like the Atlas to Middle Earth and other books that I had recommended and just plonks them in front of his camera and goes, I got all the books you recommended, Miss Elise. 
And Good. the fact that the, the Rings of Power is coming out soon too. Some of my students had heard about Rings of Power. And so they wanted to know all about what might be in the Rings of Power. And of course, this is before Vanity Fair and the other, um, the other promotional material for Rings of Power even came out. So we were, at times we were just speculating what could possibly in there, what could possibly be in there. Um, so the students, they're, you know, kids are kids. And of course they're gonna ask, you know, all kinds of questions about different subjects. And there's some things that I'll say, I'm not sure I'll come back to you later. And that's when I'll check in with James and, I'll, and then I'll, um, I'll post something on the discussion board for the students later or I'll just completely ignore it in the case of turn to a bar. But, you know, dragons, they want to know about dragons. They want to know about Sauron. They want to know what a Maiar is or what, what that even means. And so guiding them to where they can find the answers if at all possible is the other, is the other part that is really fun about being a teacher. Uh, awesome. Quick question for James. Can you briefly touch upon search Tolkien? Ah, yes, my, my big reveal. Um, big so, uh, yes. Uh, this I, I'm launching this today, a, a new part of the Digital Tolkien Project that actually partly addresses the question you asked about how we need to treat Tolkien differently um, because it's in copyright. Uh, you know, one of the things that frequently comes up, you know, so I, men I mentioned before the need to uh, reference into Tolkien. You want to be able to say I'm talking about this paragraph in this chapter in this book of Lord of the Rings and so on. I mean, if, I, if you're reading a physical book, it's not immediately obvious what the paragraph number is and, and, and stuff like that. Um, but also one of the things that people often want to do is search across the books. One of the things you can't do in a Kindle is say, I want to search one word across all of Tolkien's works. And so I built a search engine for, uh, for the works of Tolkien that doesn't uh, reveal any of the text. So it gets around the copyright issue by, you know, I'm not presenting the results in any context at all. In fact, I never show any text that the user hasn't typed in. And um, let me just share my screen actually, because I would love to, to quickly show you. Um, so this is it, search.digitaltolkien.com launching today. And at the moment it has the Hobbit, Lord of the Rings, the Silmarillion and the letters. It will soon have unfinished tales and eventually uh, all, of, all of the works. But if you're studying something, I, you know, I don't know, love, friendship, um, something like that, you know, you could start typing a word and, um, and get a breakdown of the number of occurrences in each of the, the works that I've indexed so far. You can drill down into individual sections. If you just sort of want a, a book overview, you can see how many occurrences of the word love occur in different books in the appendices and, and, and so on. But that's done across all the works. Um, if you're wondering, you know, what letter was it that, um, that Dick Plotz is mentioned in, you can very easily look that up. Um, you can not only do individual words, but if you're if you've got a particular passage, you know, trying to think where did that occur? When was it that Sam said, you know, I love him, whether or no, or no? Um, you can see that that appears in in Book Four, Chapter Four, and you get the exact paragraph reference as well, uh, paragraph twenty four. You may be intrigued by this expression, whether or no, somewhat of an archaic expression. So you can actually just look up to see there's actually three places where Tolkien uses this expression, whether or no. Um, so this is this is search Tolkien. And um, yeah, it's uh, I'm releasing it today uh, for people to use. And, and as I said, um, I'll be adding more books over time uh, as as I work through the referencing schemes for those books, which is an important part of this. It looks to be a fantastic resource. Um, and I can see lots of people using it. Thanks for doing this. I think uh, I think the community's Very really like this. Yeah, I've, I've been loving playing with it for the last couple of days with you in beta yes, form. Yes, I got, got a sneak. Yeah, Jeremy got a sneak peek, and he's been give, giving me wonderful feedback. So, I yeah, see. and thank you, Jeremy. There's there's other digital humanities work out there. I don't know if you guys want to mention some of it at all uh, outside of just the two the projects that you guys are doing. Uh, I know Eric Mueller Harder has. Uh, uh, Tolkienist, uh, and I'm sure I'm going to forget dozens of others, but it, it, there's a pretty wide community and it's uh, very collaborative and uh, there's a lot of really useful things going on uh, in this space, I think. Um, yeah, I mean, Sparrow Alden's done wonderful work with The Hobbit. 
Um, Michael Drought does a bunch of stuff uh, in this in this area as well. Uh, you mentioned, um, you know, Eric's amazing work. Um, I mean, he he's sort of the the original instigator of this particular referencing scheme um, for for Lord of the Rings. Um, and one of my goals with the Digital Tolkien Project is how can we work better together? Um, how can we share, despite the fact that we can't actually share the texts? Um, you know, we can at least share our annotations and analyses. Um, yeah, yeah, I think it's fantastic to to have a, a system where you can communicate with each other and not uh, bring down the ire of the copyright holders. You know, this applies to any copyright work. It's there's nothing special about the estate and the copyrights they have. Um, in fact, I think they're a pretty friendly organization uh, overall to the to the fan community. But they 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 have things they need to protect, and it you know we we all work with them uh, as well as we can uh, to keep them happy. And obviously, they they want a a, a large active fan community around the books uh you know they they want to share tolkien's work so um the work that you've done here at least the work that you've been doing uh it's all fantastic we're coming up on the last minute here so i'm just going to do a little wrap up and say thank you both so much for coming on uh, it's always fascinating to talk with both of you uh, i love the work that you're doing uh, i will have uh links uh, for the stuff that you're doing, uh, it's on the uh, the program webpage, and I'll get it into the show notes on YouTube uh, at the end of the day when we close out the stream as well. So, thank you again both for coming on board. It's been awesome chat chatting with both of you. Thank Thanks you for having us. That was great.
Hey everybody, welcome back. We are here on Tolkien Reading Day 2022. Uh, we're gonna do uh, a quick chat uh, on the media uh, area that I wanted to focus on. Uh, I am still waiting on Clifford. He'll be here uh, as soon as he is able, but we've got Matt and we wanted to get started. So Matt, welcome. Why don't you uh, introduce yourself a little bit? Yeah, well, thanks for having me, guys. Uh, my name's uh, Matt. Like he said, uh, I run the YouTube channel Nerd of the Rings. And, uh, you know, I kind of try to um, walk that line between um, super nerd and semi casual uh, Tolkien as far as the audience I aim for. Um, and I, I try to convert people, I guess, is what I try to do. I try to get it, get them from casual Tolkien fan to uber nerd. And uh, every every day, that's my mission, I guess. <laughs> yeah, and you've had a, your, your channel's grown fantastically over the last couple of years. I've been following along avidly. Um, uh, what got you started? Like, why why'd you pick yeah. a YouTube channel in particular? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's been absolutely insane. I never anticipated the kind of growth that, that I've enjoyed for sure. Um, yeah, it's some, it's, I think, I think I just crossed 570,000 subscribers right now and, um, started just about two and a half years ago. And, uh, really it was born out of, um, I'm a videographer by trade and I had a lot of, uh, knowledge about how YouTube works and best practices um from my day job from running that youtube channel and i i just kind of had this itch to to try it for myself um and the only thing that i could feasibly see myself uh talking about that much and um you know what i i always tell people who ask me about advice for doing youtube is it has to be something that you're willing to give up your free time for and that you're excited to give up your free time for and so lots and lots of late nights editing and, uh, you know, uh, anybody who's seen my channel knows I do a lot of uh, animating maps and stuff. I'm, I'm very big on the maps and tracking where people are and uh, how things are playing out. Um, so, yeah, a, a lot of late nights later and uh, and here we are today. That's fantastic. And how about um, you, you've got a pretty active community. You mentioned the size of it, but yeah. I think they're they're. Uh, like the theme of this reading day uh, yeah. today is love and friendship. So I kind of wanted to tie into that a little bit about your, your community and your fans and how you interact with them. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I um, make an effort to, to be in the comment section quite a bit and we've got uh, a very active uh, discord community. Um, you know, a lot of people uh, in that community um, seem to really, really enjoy uh, the, uh, camaraderie that we have there. Um, and it, it's just been amazing, um, over the last couple of years, the, the friendships that I've been able to make through this channel, um, you know, Cl Cliff and I are kind of a good example of this. Like I, I was in college when the films came out and that's how I was introduced to, uh, the world of Tolkien. And so one of my first exposures going deeper into this world was reading articles that Cliff, among others, wrote on the One Ring. And now here we are all these years later, and uh, Cliff and I are on live streams together all the time. And I can't think of any circumstance where, you know, normally Cliff and I, you know, I'm from the Midwest, he's from California and uh, very different backgrounds, but, you know, we've become good friends from this. And I, I never would have... Uh, talk to him, you know, or, you know, met him probably <laughs> otherwise. Um, and that's a story that I've seen and experienced replicated throughout this fandom and, um, people from, from even more different backgrounds than Cliff and I, uh, you know, find friendships with people that they wouldn't otherwise likely be friends with. Um, and it's all from this mutual love of the most incredible fantasy world ever created. I can't argue with that. That's uh, I feel the same way. Um, uh, you know, different approach. Um, I'm not a, a YouTuber. I'm, this is my first real foray into, you know, trying to do a live stream. I've really enjoyed trying to get it set up. Uh, it is really hard work. Uh, it, it takes a lot of effort, and and your channel in particular is very professional. And you know, and I Thank think you. that's why it's it's so successful. Um, yeah. So so how do you pick topics? Like mm. I, I don't I, like 
the podcasters we were talking to have their own themes and, and direction and, and a, a schedule sometimes for some of them. Uh, yours seems to jump around more. Is it just kind oh, yeah. of like what catches your interest? <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. Um, you know, I started getting a little heavier into second age stuff when uh, the Amazon show was announced and we kind of got some details when that was going to take place. Um, but really, it's it's kind of what I feel like learning about. That's one of the cool things about doing this is I get to learn a lot. Um, people assume that I know every single detail off the top of my head and I don't. <laughs> I, I do a lot of research in these videos. Um, and, you know, there's there's so many times where, you know, I'll uh, find like small little contradictions in my script or, you know, some something that I'll assume and then I'll dive deeper because I'm not 100% sure on it and then find out like, oh, I phrased this like it could be interpreted and be OK, but technically I'm wrong. And so uh, there's there's a lot of research that goes into these to to try to iron out all the kinks um, with these scripts. But um, yeah, it's really um, a mix between what my viewers you know, say they really want to see and what I think would be interesting. And, um, you know, uh, one, I think it's actually my, my most viewed video is what if Gandalf took the ring? And, um, it was just one day I thought like, uh, while watching fellowship, you know, when Gandalf turns down, uh, Frodo's offer, I'm like, well, what, how would that have played out if, if this happened? And so I started going full nerd mode, like, it, it's it's like a whole nother level of nerd when you go hypothetical with it and uh, and try to actually make it all make sense. So I went through and saw like, OK, what's the travel time from here to here and how long did they rest in Rivendell? So, you know, Gandalf probably rested in Rivendell for a similar amount of time. And uh, <laughs> and it's, it's kind of odd researching in that way because you start going down a path and then you find something that contradicts that. And you're like, oh, now I have to back up three quarters of a page, delete all that because I found out this fact. Um, so yeah, that, that was a fun video in particular because I, I discovered that likely Gandalf would arrive at Isengard around the time that the ring rates do. Um, so there was a confrontation there in my hypothetical scenario um, that I, I feel like was pretty feasible based on travel times. Sure. Yeah. And what you're describing sounds remarkably like what Tolkien would go through with his notes and moon phases the moon, and travel yes. times. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's yeah, and that's the level of detail he was interested in. Some of the Absolutely. things they would never yeah. settle on. Yeah. So yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure, Matt, you had trouble settling on some things like that. Oh, for sure. Yeah. There's sometimes where, you know, I especially you get toward the end of the script when you've gone so far down this rabbit hole, <laughs> you're like, you're like, OK, we've we've left. Uh, we're, we're in pure speculation mode here. And so, you know, sometimes I'm like, OK, what what would be the most amusing at this point for <laughs> for the uh, audience to hear? And that's usually what I put on is like a, a post credits uh, little stinger like um um, I'm trying to think, oh, like uh, a recent one that I did was what if uh, Sauron reclaimed the one ring and I had Sam survive the whole thing and he gets back to the Shire and like is filled with rage or something. <laughs> um, I think I know the answer to this, but do you think you're ever going to run out of ideas for topics? I'm sure. Uh, yeah. Like you said, you probably already have the answer to this. I get this question a lot and I highly, highly doubt it. I I've told so many family members i have no concerns whatsoever of running out of topic ideas anytime soon um i've got a huge list on my phone of uh future topics and like i said i i kind of go by what my audience is interested in what i've gotten a lot of requests for and what i look at in a particular week and say hey I'd, i kind of want to dive deeper into that and learn a bit more about that yeah, I was. I'm, I'm interested to know as the as the these adaptations start to come out over the next couple of years. Do you see your do you see your um, what you're doing sort of like following that? Is it going to be predominantly about that, or are you going to mix in some other things with that too? Um, so my plan is to do both. Like I'll, I'll never stop doing this. You know, all the all my videos, well, except for the theories, those are pretty out there, but. Um, with the uh my regular uh you know my regular i release every saturday at noon eastern and so you know that 
those on a weekly basis are always going to be all about the lore of Tolkien and, um, you know, the the things about the show and, you know, theories about what the show is or recaps or breakdowns of trailers and stuff like that. That'll all be um, kind of just extra fun stuff uh, for the channel. We'll definitely I'll definitely be talking about it because um, you know, it's a Tolkien adaptation. Like I'm going to be watching it for sure, <laughs> you know? Um, so, uh, I think, it, I think that's part of the fun is, uh, you know, the debates we can have within the fandom, um, anytime a movie or TV show comes out and, um, talking through every little Easter egg and everything. Um, but you know, at the, at the foundation of it all is Tolkien and his writings. And so I'll, I'll never, uh, you know, I'll, I'm never going to stop making those for sure. Um, we had a question in the chat about uh, what's the Lego behind you? Is that Hogwarts? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've got a couple here. So, so yeah, that is, that is Hogwarts. Um, this is Lego Bag End right here. Mm -hmm. And then okay. up here is a Corsair ship that my son and I just built on, uh, we actually have a small uh, Lego channel that we do together uh, called Nerd of the Bricks. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> we built a Corsair ship and uh, released that uh, at, for Tolkien Reading Day. So that was kind of a fun recent one. So if, uh, for those who are watching or listening and, and are not familiar with your YouTube channel, what do you recommend? Like if I go to your YouTube, mm -hmm. I've never watched any of your videos. What are the mm -hmm. ones that I should start with or um, the wow. absolute musts? Uh, let's see here. I, it's, it's kind of an older one, but the one that really helped my channel, like take hold, like for whatever reason, the, the YouTube algorithm really took hold of was the complete travels of Gandalf which is like a 25 minute video that maps his entire life and everywhere he ever went. Um, yeah, like I said, it's, it's a bit of an older video. More recently, I've done ones on uh, the complete history of Numenor, um, which I feel is a, a really good one and a really appropriate one given the show coming out. Um, and then uh, the uh, gosh, I've, I've, <laughs> just watch them all that would be great no I'm just kidding. Um, they're, they're all equally important just yeah <laughs> you, <laughs> um yeah I'd, and uh the ones on um morgoth are are pretty mm -hmm. I, I i enjoy those because they're like the story of morgoth is kind of the story of you know pre-second age in a lot of ways you know he he kind of drives the story as the villain you know um so yeah, those, those would be the main ones. I love, um, you know, the, the most gratifying thing for me of this experience of doing, uh, this YouTube channel is the number of people that have said, I'm finally diving into the books because I've been watching your videos or I, you know, read Hobbit as a kid. And now I'm diving into the Silmarillion for the first time and, or, you know, your videos helped me get through the Silmarillion for the first time. Um, that's, that's the stuff that I absolutely love, uh, every time I see that comment, um, because at the end of the day, you know, I, I do 10 to 20 minute ish videos, um, but it's no substitute for reading, uh, reading about the world from the author himself. Yeah. What, what are your sort of hopes for the Amazon TV series? Uh, I hope it's good. I would say that <laughs> that's, big one. Wait, that's, I think that's the big one. That's the big one. Um, so the, the thing that makes me the most nervous is the condensed timeline. Like, um, you know, I, I've stressed many times on my channel, like I'm, I'm keeping a very open mind until I actually see the show. Um, the, but as I'm, you know, I'm a, a thinker when I I'm driving in my car and when I'm driving in my car, I'm sitting there thinking, okay, this condensed timeline thing. Like, I, I just don't know. I don't know about this. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, I, I'm really pumped for Numenor, I'd say uh, is probably toward the top of my list. Um, you know, I, I'm anticipating that being um, 
you know, if they if they pull that off well, it'd be every bit as uh, majestic as Gondor from the Peter Jackson films, but you know, dialed up to eleven. Um, and then uh, I'm a huge dwarf fan, so Kaza Doom oh, is yeah. like I I am just going to be waiting for Kaza Doom to be shown in its full glory. Um, so I really hope they do that well um, because yeah. I'm a huge dwarf fan. I'm hoping that they keep the sort of Sauron's identity a secret for as long mm. as possible. So you have to guess who Sauron actually is. Yeah. In the, uh, I don't, I wouldn't really like to see that come up on uh, this person has Sauron. <laughs> <Right>. so. <laughs> I think, yeah, on yeah. the opening credits show, like yeah, so and so as Sauron. Yeah. yeah. I think one of the, one of the storylines of season one, I think personally, is probably going to be who you know who sauron is there's going to be some sort of reveal probably mm-hmm. which they're going to keep you waiting on i think well it'd be like yeah. an agatha christie thing trying to work out who instead of who did it mm. who's sauron i mean i hope uh, that would be really fun so i hope yeah. they do something like that i would really enjoy that yeah i think uh you know i i really appreciate films that don't overdo it with their villains um and uh you know, it's it's kind of like the old Jaws thing where you don't actually see the shark until some ridiculously late point in the movie. Um, but that that threat is always there. So that's kind of how I, I think, you know, a really good Sauron would come off where, um, you know, to a certain extent, you know, eventually we've got to see him as Anatar helping with the, the rings. But um, we don't see him in full evil, uh, you know, power. <laughs> until uh, a little bit later in the show, I think would be cool. Yeah. So I don't, I, do you think that Sauron thinks he is evil, right? I, I, mm. I, I always imagine him viewing himself as doing what should be done. Yeah. Right. He, he's, and so I'm wondering, we're chatting about the Amazon show now, you know, can they make him a sympathetic villain? I certainly feel like, mm they're going to try when he's Anatar because if, if they just make him villainous, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's not going to be much of a secret <laughs> who's who. Yeah. But even when he comes out, you know, it's, I, I'm curious for your thoughts on, on how they might handle that. Or if you've, you know, done some videos on, on Sauron that kind of touch on this. Mm. Yeah. I, yeah. Sauron's a character that I've thought a lot about, like I said, you know, during my commute, I, <laughs> I think about how this show is going to play out and, you know, what I would do and stuff. Um, I think with Sauron, especially, you know, as Anatar, um, you know, I, I hope to see him as cunning and conniving, um, you know, in, in the Lord of the Rings films, we just kind of get that, um, that, immense power of Sauron. We don't really get the, the manipulative, like the guy who's, uh, you know, to bring in another uh, fantasy story, like the Palpatine of Star Wars, where he's the one moving all the chess pieces on the board and he's three steps ahead of everybody else. That's, that's the kind of uh, um, outlook I have on, on Sauron, that he's the guy who's always, you know, working in the background and manipulating people to, um, use them for his own ends. I, I think that, uh, you know, we're told that, that he wants order, like that he really values order, I think, and, uh, Tolkien's writing. So I doubt that he does, you know, probably see himself as the villain, I guess. Um, you know, or, or at least he, he sees his actions probably as justified to create order and, you know, uh, he's going to do whatever it takes to, to make the world as he sees fit. Um, personally, I, I've never been, you know, I, I think it's a little overdone nowadays that the sympathetic villain thing. Um, so I don't really want to feel sorry for him. <laughs> um, I kind of would enjoy a villain who's just evil. And even if he doesn't see himself that way, like, you know, I think, I think we should definitely see him that way and not be oh. like, Oh, poor Sauron. That guy, you know, he uh, he had a rough childhood or whatever. You know, I don't know. I'm not really interested in that so much. I, I just I think he just sees himself as continuing Melkor's great works. Really. Yeah. Oh, I, yeah. And, and I, I think he also sees himself as uh, uh, 
top trying to top Melkor or trying to yeah, top that's a replacement. Him. Yeah. The replacement. Replacement, yeah. Yeah. There's always this challenge about what happens if a Melkor comes back out the void. Is he going to be annoyed with Sauron or not? <laughs> I, and, uh, yeah. I, possibly. I think he would be. Right there. I yeah. think he would be, actually. <laughs> yeah, and would, would, you know, would Sauron uh, be okay playing second fiddle again after being the Dark Lord for a couple ages of the world? You know? He wouldn't have a choice, was he? <laughs> yeah. <really? laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you, Matt. I don't, I don't, I don't think I'm... I don't think I would enjoy um, feeling sorry for Sauron. Like that's not an emotion I want to feel, you know? Yeah. I mean, like, <laughs> yeah. Like I don't, I don't want the, uh, you know, we've kind of gotten a lot of it with like Boba Fett and Loki and everything. And it's like, uh, it's like, yeah, I don't, you know, I don't want, um, you know, a, uh, a, a rehabbed version <laughs> of Sauron where it's like, <laughs> Oh, but he's kind of good. He's not fully evil. You know, it's like, no, I want him to be fully evil. I want him to be manipulative and conniving and just, you know, brutal. Yeah. Well, if you tie it back to like the TV shows, Hannibal or breaking bad where mm. that you can, you can see where the character's coming from. You mm -hmm. may not empathize with them or sympathize with them, but you know, they are relatable in yeah. the evilness. <laughs> yeah. You know, so I, I think it can be well done. Uh, yeah. And I think, you know, I'm, I'm interested to see um, where, where that might, uh, where they might go with it. You know, yeah. it's, I, I'm trying to avoid spoilers, so I'm not really watching like the behind the scenes leaks that are coming out. Um, mm. So far, I don't know how long I can keep that up, but yeah. uh, uh, it's it's fun times in in you know the uh, the spaces that, that that we're in right now with the the fan communities and and really trying to you know walk the line or really split ourselves in two to focus on lore and the books and everything that's interesting there, and then the show, which is pretty clearly not going to follow the lore in the books because right. they don't have the rights to to significant chunks of it so yeah um i i feel like you can be fans of both you know oh and, for sure <laughs> yeah i like i said i i became a fan through the films i actually saw i i bought the four book set i actually found out that there was a hobbit book after i watched the two towers and went out and bought a box set um so yeah, this will be interesting because, um, you know, I, of course with the Hobbit, I had read that before seeing the movies, but, um, I'd say this, you know, this is the first time that I'll be going into an adaptation as, you know, the Tolkien Uber nerd version of myself. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, I, I, I try to, you know, judge them separately. Um, but also, you know, uh, I, I feel like with Tolkien's world, like it's, he set a very high standard. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I'm going to expect greatness for sure. Um, but, um, you know, yeah, there's, there's definitely a balance there between, you know, adaptations. Um, they're going to be a certain amount of different from the source material. Um, either way, like I said, my number one hope for the show is that it's good. Um, mm -hmm. I think if, if that's the case, then, uh, then some of the other things will kind of work themselves out. Absolutely. Uh, we're kind of we're, we're reaching wrap up time. Uh, I really appreciate you being on board, uh, coming in here and chatting a little bit. Uh, I love your YouTube channels, plural. Um, it's fantastic watching you and your son, you know, enjoy a hobby and, and get that started <laughs> as well. Um, thanks so much for coming on board. Uh, looking forward to seeing more of what you produce. Thanks so much for having me on, guys. And uh, yeah, have a great uh, rest of the stream I'll be watching. And everyone out there, have a wonderful Tolkien reading day. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Thanks.
Okay, I'm I'm Bob Foster. Hi, Bob. Yeah, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Uh, I guess you know, I'm the author of the Complete Guide to Middle Earth, and Dick and I have known each other for like 50, 60, a long time, and uh, you know, closer to sixty than fifty years. Yes. Yes. And and uh, you have been doing a lot of things with Tolkien over the years together, and sometimes separately. That's awesome. And Dick, why don't you uh, just a really brief introduction of yourself? Sure. I, I'm Dick Plotz. My uh, Tolkien connection is that I inadvertently started the Tolkien <laughs> Society of America, uh, which led to 17 magazines sending me to Oxford to interview Tolkien, uh, which was fabulous. Uh, I met Christopher Tolkien on that visit. I visited him and Bailey with my wife, Judy, uh, several years later uh, when they were still living in England. Uh, and I've done nothing, really nothing serious connected to Tolkien in the last 50 years or so. Well, your your experiences in the early days of fandom are... Um are fascinating i'm sure so uh, you know it's it's not uncommon for people to kind of dip their toes in and out of of various interests and passions etc so it's we're we're really happy to have both of you here uh, it's fantastic to put a face to a name that i've known for decades uh just on paper uh you know i have uh, uh a collection of all of the old nikuses and all of the tolkien journals from the day and uh, it's it's, it's Niekas. 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 See, yes. it's one of those things where you read it in print for, for right. It's Lithuanian. Decades. It's Lithuanian, yep. and it means nothing. Awesome. <laughs> I mean, it means something. It means the word nothing. Yes. Yep, absolutely. Um, so again, thank you, thank you guys so much for being here. Um, when uh, I originally reached out uh, for guests for Tolkien Reading Day, uh, Bob. I, it was it was you because we were talking about your complete guide to Middle Earth. So why don't we start there a, a little bit? Uh, if you want to just uh, reminisce a little on why you started writing uh, the book or or doing the index cards, which was before the book. Yeah, yeah, I've been thinking about that, and I'm not entirely sure why the. <laughs> The, the best explanation I have is that I, I'm my grandfather's grandson. And he, he was just extremely fond of, of taking notes about books. Um, and, and just one, one of, his, of his hobbies, which helped some authors and annoyed other authors, was, was he had this... this habit of taking books that had already been published and sending letters to the, the author telling them various mistakes in grammar, <laughs> spelling, style. <laughs> and you know, this varied. So some, some authors, many authors did not respond. Some authors got huffy about it. Uh, some of them hired him to, to proofread their next books which explains why I have a, 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 a signed first edition of a book by Upton Sinclair. That's awesome. Fantastic. Yes. Yeah. And, and Dick, what, uh, what, what triggered you way back in the early days for, uh, for Tolkien? I mean, I, I'm sure reading the books was sort of the seed that first planted oh, it. But I it will, kind of ballooned. I will tell you where and when the day I first <laughs> encountered uh, Lord of the Rings. It was August 19th, 1963. And I know that because it was the 19th birthday of my cousin, Sarah, who is still around, lives in London. Uh, and I was at her birthday party in Brooklyn and her other grandmother had given her the Lord of the Rings. She was... I guess an English major at Vassar and uh, she had heard about Tolkien because it, it came up in her old English class. Uh, so I looked at this and I saw the maps. I've always loved maps. 
And I, I should find out more about this. And then I didn't. And then a year or two later, uh, two years later, uh, I was on a cross-country trip, car trip with my parents. And I got a letter because Bob had my addresses that he could write to me at. Uh, you should read The Lord of the Rings. So I said, oh, yes, that book. Yes, I should read The Lord of the Rings. And uh, I was in Santa Fe. I went to a little bookstore in Santa Fe, and they didn't have The Lord of the Rings. They had The Hobbit. It was a children's book. So I figured I'd get back to New York and I'd read The Lord of the Rings because somebody would, I, I could buy it there, which I did. Uh, and it went on from there. Um, so I'm trying to think. No, it was 64. So it was one year later because in 65, I started the Tolkien Society. So uh, I was going to the Columbia Science Honors Program. Uh, so I took the subway from Brooklyn to Morningside Heights. Uh, and I got out of the subway at 116th Street one day. And there was some stuff written in Tangwar on a place where ordinarily there would be uh, a large ad poster, but it was just black paper. So it was great to write on and chalk. Hmm. And then it wasn't there the next week. And then I decided I wanted to meet these people. And I put up a, a sign on the, uh, on a poster saying, uh, Tolkien club meeting, alma mater. And I gave the date and the time, uh, and something like 10 people showed up. It was about 10 degrees out. And we talked for a while and somebody said that they had heard that somebody actually knew the Elvish language. How was I going to find that out? Well, I was just getting into adult subscriptions, you know, uh, not highlights for children, but I, I was a subscriber to the New Republic. So I put a three line uh, classified in the New Republic. Join Tolkien Club, discuss Hobbit lore, learn Elvish. You probably read about this before. And I got about 70 responses. Uh, and I found myself with uh, a national, but to some extent international fan club on my hands, which I handled probably not really adequately, but adequately enough. And uh, it, it got me... It, uh, the, the invitation from Seventeen Magazine to go to Oxford and interview Tolkien. Uh, it got me, uh, I, I met people like uh, W.H. Auden and Donald Swan of Flanders and Swan. Uh, so I, sometimes I feel like Forrest Gump. You know, there, there are all these people that I've met that I don't really qualify to, you know, I'm, I'm not a literary type, uh, but uh, it's sort of fun, you know, having these memories. Um, so, I don't know, ask me, ask me what you want to know. When no, you, uh, awesome. sorry, when you met Tolkien, where, where, where did you actually meet him? Uh, I went to his house okay. in Heddington. Uh, Sandfield Road, and he had, I actually saw his wife when he came out of the house, but uh, he didn't uh, entertain visitors in his house, at least visitors that he didn't know well. Uh, he had a little separate office or think house, whatever, I don't know what he would have called it, uh, but a very crowded, busy little office books all over the place and papers. Uh, and I talked to him for a while. I, I don't remember how long. I didn't really know how to interview anybody. I didn't know what to ask. I didn't know. I w I've never been very good at taking notes. So it wasn't easy to write up afterward. It's a story in itself. What, what, do, you, but, what do you remember about him? Like, what stood uh, well, out to you? 
you, if you can you can imagine he's a uh, uh, I guess a Gandalf type, you know, an old man with a pipe and uh, a, a sort of academic way of speaking, uh, but he was talking about interesting things. You know, I asked him uh, some things about Elvish vocabulary. He sent me the uh, noun declension, which has been published now. Uh, he was very welcoming. He was, a, I guess, a little bit uh, bemused that he, he had all this fan base that mm -hmm. he never intended that. Uh, it just happened. And he didn't really know what to do with it. But he was, uh, you, you know, he, he was cordial and welcoming. And, uh, I, I think, I think pleased to talk with this kid. That's amazing. And, and Bob, you were, you guys were friends at this time. Um, yeah. I think from high school, it sounds right. like. And right. so, yeah. Um, some of what Dick had been doing kind of led into your uh, starting to put together the the encyclopedic entries, if you will, for the guy, didn't it? Yeah, it, yes. I you know it was the the indexes in in the Tolkien books were really not helpful in in. <laughs> <laughs> And again, it just seemed like a, a natural thing to, for me to do. Um, there had already been in, in Niekas someone who had been doing uh, a little bit of, of, of a glossary, but then he disappeared. And you know, picking that kind of work up just seemed natural to me. Yeah. yeah. I understand that you uh, that obviously use index cards. What sort yes. of quantity of these were you were you looking at? Um, let's. Well, their actual index cards are a little you know, thicker than than uh, paper, but uh, let's see. Um, it's probably three feet. Three <laughs> feet. <laughs> wow, that is a lot of index cards. Uh, yeah, I hope you didn't drop them at any point. That would have been. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, as, as, as alphabetizing can be fun. You couldn't just press sort. No, no. Right. <laughs> yeah, oh. we're kind of getting this um, apples and oranges with talking with James earlier. I don't know if um, Dick or Bob, you were listening to the earlier panels, but uh, we had uh, James Tauber on. He's uh, a friend of mine who's doing digital uh, humanities work so all computer sorting cross-referencing indexing and it's just you know night and day from how it was in in the 1960s um uh, but it's no less of a passion and a you know a, a fan-based activity it's just you know we we all work with the tools that we have at hand at the time um yeah so so tell us I mean, the theme of tolkien reading day this year is um uh, love and friendship so i'd love to hear just the two of you kind of talk a little bit about your friendship with each other and, and kind of how that um uh went back in in these heady days of of uh, tolkien fandom well we were already friends it's not like yep. we met because of tolkien i'm, I'm not sure what grade we were in when we met do you remember must the day been, must have been 10th because you weren't there in ninth mm. uh, you, you came in from uh junior high right right yeah and i came from a private grade eight school so i was there in high school in ninth grade which i would guess maybe uh, a quarter or a fifth of the class was there in ninth grade and the rest came in in uh so we met uh, you know we were in on met pretty much right away when you arrived yeah and and it didn't hurt that going past your house was was literally on the shortest route from school to where i lived so mm -hmm. i i had forgotten that, but yes. Yeah. 
Yeah. And and that bridge on Albemarle Road that goes over the the, the train tracks was was always fun. Yeah, it's it hasn't been there for years. Yeah. Yeah. So that must have been when you were around fifteen years old, sixteen ish or so. Sounds about right. And then when. Well, I think you, you guys were, were still in high school. Were, uh, I'm trying to think. Really, so you were, you were fourteen. I was fifteen because I'm a year old. Probably, older. yeah, yes, yes. Yeah. Because you're a year older because I skipped third grade. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that. So you must have been really young when you traveled to England, then, Dick. I was eighteen. Yeah, eighteen. I I. I uh, had finished high school. I had started college. I was sort of floundering in college, not really knowing. I mean, I I had to study, which I had never had to do before very much. Uh, so I didn't really know uh, what I was doing. And then I was asked in, in November of my first semester in college, I was sent to England. And that distracted me even further. Uh, and uh, I ended up dropping out and starting over again the next year, uh, which was great. I, they, there was uh, <laughs> my class at Harvard, class of 71, uh, it was not the best time academically to be in college because there was so much going on. And uh, Harvard President Pusey famously at one point called us the worst class ever. At Harvard. <laughs> I think that was an exaggeration because there was a class, I think, in the 1840s uh, that acted out and the entire class was expelled. Maybe it was the 1820s, <laughs> uh, but, but Pusey wasn't around then. Uh, in any case, the, the worst class ever at Harvard includes the current Senate, Senate Majority Leader. Uh, it includes, uh, uh, let's see, the, um, it, it includes, you know, well-known poets. Uh, it includes the uh, president of the University of Pennsylvania, who is currently on leave to be ambassador to Germany. Uh, I mean, you know, the worst class ever. I'm, I'm very pleased to be in it. That, well, it's not a knock. You've had a, a great career and a great life since then. So, <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, um, yeah. So, so Bob, your book, um, it sounds like uh, fingers crossed that uh, there'll be another edition coming out this year. I think it's been out of print um, for almost a decade, maybe more than a decade now. I'm trying to remember when it last uh, was in print. But um, uh, yeah, so that's uh, kind of resuscitating it for you, right? Uh, you haven't been involved in it for a long time, but... Uh... Well, that that's an interesting story in itself. I thought that it was out of print. Um, but in fact, it has been continuously in print. And now that I know that, I'm getting back um, and, and talking to um, Rand, what is now Random House, used to be Ballantyne, before that used to be Del Rey Books, about um, making some enhancements to it. Awesome. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, we don't have to go into any detail on that, but I, I know fans are really excited to see that. Um, it's it, it's coming back uh, on on the hardcover format. I I don't know if you heard us chatting with uh, Ted Naismith earlier today, the artist um, who illustrated a, a previous edition of that book, and he's adding a few more pieces um, uh, to this forthcoming edition. So that's uh, that's very exciting uh, to see that. Um, have you? I, I I believe from our previous conversations that you haven't. Um, been putting any effort into keeping the the guide itself up to date with all the books published since the Silmarillion, right? You the last time you really focused on it was in seventy seven when when the Silmarillion was coming out. Uh, that's true, 
And what I, I'm think, well, the Silmarillion was, was the last clearly finished work by, by Tolkien. Um, since then, you know, everything that, that he wrote and that was relatively close to, to being coherently finished, you know, has been published. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, there's at least one of, of those posthumous works that I think, and I've you know, gotten that I, I think is, is close enough to being both different and complete that I, I think that um, can be drawn in. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, and got, and uh, the, the bane right. of my existence, excuse me, the bane of my no. existence as usual is uh, page numbers. Uh, it was, you know, no matter what I say, every time, every time a new printing of a book comes out, the page numbering is changed slightly, mm-hmm. which makes the page numbers in the complete guide inaccurate. Yeah. This is something that we talked about earlier because uh, James, who was on, is actually coming up with a, a citation system for the books that it doesn't matter about the page numbers too much and you can find things in it. But again, it's very difficult to do something like that when they change all the time. Right. Yeah, it's uh, mm. it's hard to, on paper, tie together an indexing system to books that are so popular that they're continuously in print and new editions coming out what feels like annually <laughs> yes yeah so so dick where um uh I, i'm curious to know just a little bit on um you handing off sort of the the tolkien side society of america i know you you were focusing more on school etc and i think it went to ed uh, is that correct ed, that's correct uh, and then Ed was no longer able to continue with it, and it got folded into the Mythopoeic Society, which is still going strong. Yeah, absolutely. I know um, uh, I, I'm I'm a member of that usually off and on. I think uh, I'm still a member uh, here. I know a lot of uh, friends who are in there that are um, certainly uh, uh, loving the fact that, that you've kind of resurfaced and, and are, we're willing to appear today. I, I mean, this is for both of you, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, a large part of the community of, of Tolkien fandom is, is the different generations that have, have come and gone and the history of it. And um, there's a few of us who are uh, really fascinated with the early history of fandom from the fifties and the, you know, the, the appearances that started to show up in some of the science fiction panzines and the world con um, documentation there. And then of course the Tolkien society of America and the Tolkien society in the UK uh, is really when, when things exploded. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, Chad, Andrew, if you have any uh, other questions you want to ask, we're, we're coming up on the end of our, our allotted time. I think we could go for hours, but uh, let's, we need to try and wrap up. No, I, but so I would like to say that one of the one of my favourite reference books for Tolkien is is Bob's book. So I'm very pleased it's coming back into hardback and people are able to uh, get a copy. We, we regularly were asked, "How can I get a copy of the previous version?" And it's it's really nice. That it's just coming back into uh, availability for people yeah. to get. Yeah, Bob, I want to thank. Well, you, you can. You know, well. It's available on Amazon. So yeah, yeah. Yeah, Bob, yeah. I, want, I want to thank you as well. I mean, it was it was one of the it was probably the first Tolkien reference book I ever had, and it was in the the days before the internet and the early, the very early days of the internet where you couldn't just look things up. It, it was uh, something that I used quite quite often. Yep, even uh, Christopher <laughs> Tolkien said that it was his go to reference book when he was trying to keep track of everything that his father had written. <laughs> So, yeah, just in summary, again, thank you so much, both of you, uh, for appearing. Uh, I'd love to chat with you some more. We'll see what we can arrange at some vague point in the future. But I really want to say thank you for appearing here today. It's been awesome to meet you uh, sort of virtually in person. I I really appreciate you coming on. Oh, and thank you. I mean, it's fun to think about what I was doing 50 years ago. (laughs) (laughs) Fun for us, too. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah, thanks, guys. Thanks for inviting us. Yes. Absolutely. Great. Wonderful to meet you.
Good. Bye. Bye. Bye, Dick. Bye, Bob. All right, and we're back. Uh, Tolkien Reading Day 2022. Thank you uh, so much, everybody, for listening in so far. Uh, we're now on to uh, an audio uh, conversation that uh, I'm very interested in. Uh, our guest is uh, Jordan. Why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and a little bit of what you've been working on? Hello, hello. Thanks for having me. Yeah, my my name is uh, Jordan Rennells, and I've, uh, I'm an audio editor for the Prancing Pony podcast. I run my own uh, Music of Middle Earth podcast where I discuss Howard Shore's themes from the movies. And I do uh, soundscape uh, episodes where I take a reading from the books and I add my own music and sound effects and things like that. Um, and I actually just finished working on an audiobook uh, for one of John Howe's um, art books he just finished. So um, I added sound effects and my own original music to that as well. That was a really, really exciting experience. And um, John narrated it himself as well. So that was really cool. And uh, yeah, today I launched my Kickstarter for a very special soundscape project that uh, I'm sure we'll talk about a little bit more in detail in a bit. Why don't we start there? Yeah, I've, I, I know a little bit of background about it. Um, I'm absolutely fascinated with the concept of just building a soundscape that I can play while I'm reading myself. So rather than being an audio book where I'm just being narrated at and it moves at somebody else's pace, uh, it's a reading experience. But uh, tell us more about what you're adding to that reading experience. Right, yeah. So my idea is that I'm going to create my own score that will be specific to each, each chapter. So for every chapter that you're reading, you have music that is written specifically for that chapter. And I will be adding sound effects as well. So you might hear horses galloping or ring wraiths uh, doing their thing or whatever it might be in the chapter, again, specifically. And then I will also have ambience layers. I have a microphone that records in 3D. So I'll be going out to forests and things like that and recording ambiences so that just with any regular pair of headphones, you don't need a fancy setup. You can just put headphones on and kind of be immersed in the world um, as you read through each chapter, which is really, really exciting. So that's kind of the gist of the idea. I have plans to make three different speed versions so that uh, it kind of suits people's reading styles a little bit closer. You can find the one that works for you because that was definitely the initial concern when I brought up the idea was, well, people read at different speeds. So that's how I'm going to uh, kind of uh, focus on that, try and tackle it. Um, but also 
I hope to guide people through the books with this audio. So with music cues that sound like the paragraph is ending or sound effects that are fairly obvious, like the, the bell going off in the Council of Elrond, things like that will, that will subtly uh, kind of show you where you're at in the books or where you hopefully are close to. So that's the, the kind of rough premise of the idea. Yeah, and you're just launching that today. Do you know, have an idea of when you'll start releasing uh, some of these soundscapes? What's your timeline looking like? I gave myself a year to do it. And hopefully that was uh, an appropriate amount of time. It's going to be a lot of work, uh, a lot of research. So going into each chapter and figuring out, okay, where are we? Are we inside? Are we outside? Are we in the mountains? Are we in caves? Are we, where are we? And what are the sound effects that are happening? Are there, um, you know, is there wind blowing? Is there horses galloping, like I mentioned? And then, so the first chunk of work is just research because I want it to be as accurate as possible, right? And I could go and take sample libraries and like take a recording of, you know, a horse or of, whatever, and, and just slot it in. But I want to go out and actually record those things um, specifically for this. So I'll have to find a forest that, that will work for Fangorn. And I'll have to find, you know, a mountain that'll work for uh, Karadras and things like that. So that's, it's going to go in phases. It's going to go in, in phases of research and then going out to record and then writing music and then tying it all together and uh, getting it ready for delivery. That's awesome. I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. You've done a, some soundscapes before, haven't you? There was a project, um, was it last year's reading day? I don't remember. Yeah, last, uh, last year at, it must have been last year, at the Prancing Pony podcast moot, mm -hmm. I released the Council of Elrond. And uh, Chad... You might uh, you might remember that I was I was uh, heavily involved with that. <laughs> you could say, yeah. <laughs> so what we did with that was we took the entire chapter of the Council of Elrond and had all of the different characters be voiced by different people, and I added uh, sound effects and music and everything that we're talking about here, um, but with the actual uh, text included as well. And I uh, put it all into my kind of 3D emulating software so that I could place everyone around the council uh, at different spots and you could sit and listen and sound and it, it would sound like you were in the midst of it. And where can people find that, Jordan? Can, is yeah, that, that, yeah, so that is um, on my podcast feed, Music of Middle Earth, the Council of Elrond episode. And I actually later tonight, I'm having a kind of hangout get together as I finish up my 50th episode for the podcast, which will be the same kind of thing, but for um, in the house of Tom Bombadil for that whole chapter. So I'm excited to finish that up. Who'd you get to do Tom? Phil Dragish. Of course you did. Yeah. Of course you did. Yeah. I actually have uh, Phil's original recording from about 10 years ago when he did it. And uh, he gave me all the individual files. So I was able oh, wow. to kind of isolate it and take his Tom out and then add um, other uh, narrators to, uh, to do the rest of it. Yeah. Uh, can you talk, Jordan, can you talk a little bit about the, about the Dragish sort of like project that he did with the Lord of the Rings? I, I, I have a story about that too. I kind of stumbled on that by mistake years and years ago, but <laughs> I think you know a little bit more about it than I do. Yeah. Um, that was my first actual experience going through the entire book series. Um, I started by um, seeing the movies and then I started reading and then I discovered the audiobook shortly after and I was like, well, this is really cool. And I, I just kind of dove into it and that was my first run through. And basically what Phil did was he took Howard Shore's music and he layered it in underneath his narrating and he imitated all of the actor voices from the movies to basically do what we're talking about right now with this soundscape thing. The only thing is that he did it, you know, 10 years ago or so. 
and the technology has improved vastly since then. And uh, so it's really interesting to take his project, which is where this idea, you know, forever ago came from and kind of build it up into something even bigger now. Um, so yeah, Phil, Phil's version is my kind of go-to and it's how I kind of entered into this whole world of, of soundscapes for sure. Yeah, I think uh, I think some audiobook makers could take note, take some notes on the Dragus project. Just personally. yeah, I, my whole goal with this soundscape project is to use it as a way of hopefully showing what an audiobook could be, and basically, I feel like Phil's version is as close as we've gotten to what the kind of potential of an audiobook is where you because of the technology especially now and how it can place the things in 3d um, all around you you can add sound effects and you can add music and you can add ambience and it doesn't get in the way of the narration if you do it right and so all of these books that are being uh, released in the andy circus um you know amazing audiobook that was just redone could easily be added onto this kind of soundscape project. It could easily be, and the, the, the exciting thing about it for me is that that audiobook, like if you took the Andy Circus one as an example, it doesn't have to be redone. You can just apply this underneath it. You just need the original recording and then you can kind of envelop this around that existing recording, which is really, really exciting. And that means that you could just release two different versions of it. If you don't want the sound effects and everything like that, then you have that version and then you have an enhanced version where you release um, with all this stuff. And the thing is that, you know, the closest thing to what I'm talking about that's kind of officially released is some of the Star Wars audiobooks. That's how they are doing things now. Um, but they're still not like they'll take a song from the movies or whatnot and they'll layer it in there, but it's not specifically written for this scene that's unfolding right now in the book. And that is the difference with what I'm trying to do. I want things to be tailored exactly to what you're reading because it, it basically becomes, you know, an audio, a, a kind of full true canon version, you could say, of a movie that you get to listen to and experience, right? Um, so that's my goal is to, to do this project and get people to enjoy the soundscapes just as they're reading, but also to use it to um, hopefully show people what uh, I think audiobooks should and can be. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to see for uh, audiobooks that technology changes a bit so that you can turn channels on and off, in which case you could effectively have one version that does what you want. And if you just want the audio, you could turn the other stuff off. And if you just want to listen to the the soundtrack you could turn the audio off and read it yourself yeah that would be so so easy as soon as the the application allows it yeah right because my file that i produce is a dolby atmos file which means that it can be it, it will um open up to any size system that you have right so if you have stereo headphones on it'll do that if, it if you have a 5.1 setup, it'll do that. If you have a huge 7.1 setup, then it'll do that instead. But it does all of that on its own. So you could totally integrate that kind of thing. And Apple Music is doing that kind of thing now with their spatial audio. And um, yeah, I think that the audiobook world needs to catch up to the potential that they have. And for those of you who are watching or listening, uh, Chad and I had Jordan on our podcast a few months ago. And if you're interested in, in sort of like a, a, a walkthrough of all the different Tolkien audiobooks that have been produced over the years, uh, the three of us kind of sat down for a few hours and looked at the ones that have been produced and we critiqued them and talked about why we liked them and things that we, that we liked. So that was a lot of fun. That was one of the, that was one of the, the better, uh, one of the better times I had when we went through those audiobooks. books. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. There are a lot of versions. And, and like I said, there's a lot of excellent versions that could easily be, be turned into something more if mm -hmm. uh, if it were allowed to. Jordan, how do you feel about audiobooks? I know I, I still get this thing comes up occasionally when 
if someone listens to an audio book that they're told they're not reading the book how, I, uh, I, I can't understand that That's i've been told that for years years and years that uh, i'm not actually reading the books because i consume my books through audio that's just my go-to and i think that to say that is is missing out on a a different experience it's not the same experience but it's not less valid i would say it's the same as like i said if these levels of audiobooks that we're talking about right there if you had one that did have all of these sound effects and things like that then you know that's an even more exciting experience you could you could argue to just reading it and you could get even more from it and that's something that we did with the council of elrond when we did that production as we had layers of um you know in in the council of elrond it says that you know elrond then spoke of etc cetera, etc cetera. and we actually had that layered underneath in 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 a soft recording that chad did and we uh so that detail was in there and we took from the silmarillion and and inserted that in there and so yeah, i f- i feel like i feel like with that you were y'all were building it, it like you did we you did one thing and you're like how can we take this to the next level let's do this yeah. how can we take this to the next level let's do this yeah and that's what happens when you work with uh with chad bornholm <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> but uh but that uh, that that is exactly what happened and it grew exponentially from what the original idea was but that is the whole point that i'm pr- i'm trying to make here is that 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 episode that chapter is about an hour and 40 minutes long and it is uh quite the experience i would say and we and it's quite the experience and it's not like we were all professionals doing it right there was people that it was just whoever wanted to be on it that's who was on doing whatever voices and it was awesome so whenever i do something like that i just think of the potential if you had you know real voice actors we'll say real voice actors coming in and doing all these parts you know it would be amazing and you could have you know one character come in one actor come in and play gandalf for the whole thing and it, it wouldn't even take that much time. You just collect all of Gandalf's lines and have one person execute them. And then you go to the next person, you get them to execute them. And then you have one person dedicated to the narrator and then you piece it all together. I, I think that that is a huge potential and mm-hmm. something that you won't get if you're just reading the books. And I mean, you have your own imagination, but it's not the same experience. Yeah, I think there's value in both. Um, you know, mm-hmm. it's similar to like watching the movies and the visuals there kind of replacing your imagined ones. Um, but it's also the movies were an incredible introduction for a lot of people who hadn't read the books and then yeah. grew into them. And with audiobooks, uh, I know I saw a friend of mine in the Discord chat mention this and it's the same uh, approach I had was I really struggled with the Silmarillion until I listened to the audiobook, yeah. uh, and then that really the pacing and just the the flow. I wasn't struggling with trying to you know ingest the words. Uh, yeah. I could just kind of listen, and even if I didn't get one or two uh, at the time, uh, at you know at that point, the, the audiobook was awesome for that experience, and it yeah. doesn't have to be an either or you know yeah there's yeah i think you're, you're definitely right that i think there's kind of it, it's almost like we have three out of four of the options available right now you can read the books you can listen to the audiobook you can watch the movie and there's this fourth one where you have you know something that's more accurate than the movies because it's the actual text with all of these sound elements in it to to bring it to that next level i think that we're we're missing out on a huge um potential with that for sure well yeah your council of elrond production was fantastic to kind of show that and 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 make it uh obvious what the value is in in that fourth uh 
fourth leg of the table, if you will. Yeah. You know, the, 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 yeah. the new approach there. And, and the cool thing with that is, you know, we just dove into it. You know, it's not the start of the book. It's not anything like that. So we just dove in. And with this soundscapes project that I launched on Kickstarter, it's um, like, I'm going to take the time to write musical themes for the hobbits. I'm going to take time to write musical themes for the dwarves and for all of these different things, just like Howard Shore did for the movies. Um, so it's all going to be even more thought out thoroughly and uh, kind of give myself more time than the council of Elrond. So I still see the Council of Elrond as an amazing thing that we did, but I also see it as maybe, you know, 60% of what it could have been still with the proper amount of time and planning and, and execution. Jordan, have you, have you met Howard Shore or have you had any contact with him? Not yet. I, I did um, get to have an interview on my podcast with Doug Adams, though, who um, he wrote the music of the Lord of the Rings book amazing amazing book um but he worked alongside with howard shore during the making of the movies he was there through all of the process to uh to kind of notate and see what was going on and and to write this book afterwards so that's as close as i've gotten so far <laughs> yeah. well you know it's one of those things where they, they, they kind of organically grows you know i'm still meeting people i have wanted to meet for decades and yeah. you just kind of you know over the path of your career and your passion my we fingers are Robert, crossed for you. We just met Robert Foster, so mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was uh, yeah. that was a first for me as well. We've we've been exchanging emails for a few weeks, but that was you know a dream come true for me uh, in, mm -hmm. in in my personal fandom, if you will. Uh, <laughs> yeah. We've got we've got some time left. Uh, I don't want to short out some of the other projects you've been working on that you mentioned at the very beginning. Um, the uh, you know, helping out podcasts, specifically uh, the Prancing Pony podcast, you've been doing awesome work with. I'd love to hear a little more thoughts on, um, I I know how much value it's bringing when I listen mm -hmm. to non-professionally done podcasts, and it just brings it up to a whole new level. So I'd love to hear a little bit about what you're doing for them there. Yeah, I uh, we, we have it down to a pretty good system now, I think. Uh, I get the recordings from them, and I, I go through and... and I mean, they're really, really good, so I don't have to edit too much. It's just maybe uh, digressions that uh, that come now and then, you might say. Um, but yeah, it's been a lot of fun, and I'm excited. There's still a, a really long journey to go with that. Um, but it's the same kind of thing with, uh, with the audiobook thing that we've been talking about, these kind of tiers of experience where, you know, they're they're a step closer to an audiobook experience, you could say, on that podcast. So the editing is a little bit tighter. It's a little bit more precise um, and a little bit smoother. I liked what you did, Jordan, when you did uh, when Alan and Sean were going through the, the tree beard chapter and the way you made them sound when they were doing tree beard. I thought I thought you did a really good job with that. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. I took their their recordings and I I pitched their voices down a little bit and I have this plugin that morphs two different sounds together and I can decide how much they blend together um, and how much the um, waveforms actually emulate each other. So it's not like they're just combining, they're actually morphing into each other a little bit. And I took sounds of trees creaking and things like that and morphed that with their voices a little bit to give us some, uh, some tree beard sounds. It was really awesome. fun, really fun for sure. Yeah. And uh, the other project you mentioned was the John Howe audiobook, which, again, I'm sure a lot of the underlying tools in the system is the same, but but making an audiobook for, um, you know, a, a, someone that we're, we're, we're all fans of <laughs> in this field, I'm sure yeah. had some some unique experiences in, in pulling that together. Yeah, working with John was was amazing. He w and we had such a little kind of small system working. And it was, it was a lot of fun. He would just send me his audio files. He, he had a microphone set up at home and he would just send me his audio files and I would edit them. Um, but the fun part about that was he was willing, and I'm really thankful for this. He was willing to just kind of let me, you know, go for it with my ideas. And so in that audio book, it kind of has a few different sections. And in the first section, it's him talking about his craft, about 
his artwork and his illustration and how he goes about it. And those chapters all, all start and end with uh, piano music that I wrote. And then the second half is an interesting experience where on your phone or tablet or whatever you're listening to, it'll pop up a PDF. You'll have a nice big picture of his artwork and it's just him uh, talking about the process of making that piece of artwork. And what I did with those is I added sound effects and ambience and music and all these things. So if he had a, um, you know, an illustration of trying to think of a good example uh, of crashing waves or something like that, um, you know, a shipwreck, there was one called the mad, uh, the mad King, I think. I can't remember all the names because there was tons of them, but uh, you know, there was one where it was a crash ship and there was waves and it was the shoreline. So I had all of those elements in there. So you can have that happening while you're listening to him describe the art, um, which is really cool. And they were just little bite-sized chunks that would play one after each other, which was a lot of fun. And there was a good amount of uh, Tolkien illustration in there as well. So I of course had a lot of fun doing that. Um, but yeah, it was great, a great experience because he, like I said, just kind of let me do what I wanted. And so that's on, that's on audible. If anyone is interested. That, that is really cool. Uh, I'm, I, I will be purchasing it. I think I've been head in the sand on getting this event ready, <laughs> scheduling <laughs> yeah. and yeah, yeah. organizing. So I got to kind of emerge from my shell and get caught up again on, um, a lot of cool stuff that's out there that I've been avoiding for a little while, but mm -hmm. uh, that project in particular, uh, I'm excited about. Um, your Kickstarter uh, is is sounding fantastic. I've only seen some early draft stuff on it, so I have to go check out the page, which went live while we were doing this event. Yeah. So yeah. I haven't seen it yet. Um, and the link for that uh, and is uh, on the schedule webpage at Tolkien Guide for this event, and it'll be in the show notes on YouTube uh, with this recording um, as soon as we're done here. Uh, I encourage everyone uh, to to check out Jordan's work. Uh, we've mentioned his podcast. There's so much awesome stuff that you're mm -hmm. working on in the audio space. Um, yeah, and the, the Music of Middle Earth podcast has been been great the last few weeks, Jordan. I, I, yeah, forgot, I, did. I, I forgot I did those readings. And then yeah, they, they I, I, I just really quickly for anyone, um, I, I, I'm going through every group of themes from uh, the movies. And this this latest group that I was working on was the Gondor themes. So there was five of them. And uh, I, for some crazy reason, decided to do uh, one a day leading up to Tolkien reading day. So that has oh. been, you know, every day I've released a, a new one of those themes and, and yeah, yeah every, every other episode I opened and it was Chad doing a reading and I was like, what again? <laughs> it was awesome. Awesome. So yeah, well, that's all, so cool. that's all up there. Well, thanks for coming on, uh, Jordan. That's been really interesting. And, and again, I think it's really nice to publicise audio books and soundscapes because a lot of people are probably not even thinking about those. And it's nice to get them into the people thinking that these are a good way to to listen to or to talking content. Yeah, and I think that the the important thing as well for people to know is that where the technology is at right now you know, with this John Howe book that has all of this immersive audio stuff in it was just uploaded to Audible the same way as any other audiobook. And as long as you have a pair of headphones that you can put or a pair of earbuds, then you're good. You can experience it. You don't need any fancy setup or anything. That's really cool. Like I said, I haven't heard it yet. I've got to go download it and listen to it i'm really looking forward to it because i've loved everything else i've heard that you've done. I've, I've downloaded it jordan but i haven't gotten to it yet but i will <laughs> one of these days one of these days <laughs> cool awesome thank you so much for coming on thank we you. really appreciate it um just a little bit of bookkeeping for our listeners uh our next I won't really call it a panel. We're going to move to open mic uh, next. So um, we'll I'll, I'll share the Zoom link. People who are interested in coming in and chatting with us about the themes today, et cetera, will be a lot of fun. Uh, we're going to take a short 
break uh, for us hosts who have been going for like three or four hours straight. Uh, so it'll be a few minutes of the hold screen. Uh, Jordan was so kind to let me use uh, the background music from his council. Uh, we mentioned the council of Elrond. So that's what you've been listening to. Uh, you'll be listening to it again momentarily. Uh, mm -hmm. We really appreciate you coming on board and sharing your audio and your knowledge and everything, Jordan. It's been Thank awesome. Thank you. Thank yes. you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Jordan. Thank you, guys.
All right, we're back. We're healthy. Jordan's still hanging out with us. Um, I will post the Zoom link uh, in just a few seconds in the Discord chat uh, for you guys to uh, also, anybody who wants to come in. Um, yeah, come on in, hang out with us. Uh, but Jordan, let me ask, there was a question for you from Peter, which was, um, uh, have you played around with any of the audio recordings we have of Tolkien, his readings um, of you know various sections, actually not just J.R.R. Tolkien, but Christopher also as well? Interesting. Uh, I, I have included, I think, maybe a small handful of them in my podcast at certain points, but uh, that would be an interesting project because... I have a fair amount of noise reduction software that they use on uh, on films. So well, I, it, I think that Rose Mutton and uh, Riddles in the Dark, um, Riddles in the Dark, obviously, um, most people are aware it was quite a long chapter. Yeah. Uh, Rose Mutton uh, came out on a, a facsimile CD where they put about 30 seconds of talking, talking. But yeah. the actual real length is about 30 minutes. Wow. So there's 30 minutes of him uh, doing roast mutton. And both yeah. of those would be great with some some audio in the uh, background. The, the ride of the Rohirrim. They're talking. Mm -hmm. is, there's a recording of Tolkien doing the ride of the Rohirrim. Yeah, that'd be good as well. Yes. Yeah, that would be yeah. fantastic. Wow. Yeah, that would be awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll have to try that. And there's uh, Andrew right there. Some there's some Tolkien doing Bombadil too, isn't there? Yes, uh, a Tolkien doing Bombadil. There's some more stuff from the Lord of the Rings and poems, but they tend to just be very small parts yeah. of uh, yeah. the, uh, the the Lord of the Rings. Marcel, um, what's up, bud? Everyone. Yeah. Well, no, I think that'd be great. Yeah. You should definitely have a really look at those. Cool. Yeah, that's a that's a great idea, for sure. Um, and those are all uh, people can get all those in the uh, Tolkien Audio Collection, I believe. Correct. Yes. And all those included in the, in the Tolkien audio collection? Yeah, they are. They're all in there. Isn't the, the audio collection, I can't remember, I don't have it in front of me. It's 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 not it's not everything, but it's it's most of it, right? Isn't there a couple things that are not on there? There are some things like roast mutton, which I just talked about, it's not yeah. on there. Uh, but most, uh, on the whole, most of the stuff was put on there. But some things have been found afterwards. Um, a uh, the, the publishers were, were given um, some, uh, somebody actually found some recordings. So it wasn't George Sayer. Uh, it was somebody else found some recordings and they gave them to uh, the Tolkien estate. There is, uh, uh, there is this BBC uh, written uh, words uh, collection that is out of print, has been out of print for 15 years, where there is a special interview with Tolkien that you won't find anywhere else anywhere else so mm. that's that's an additional thing but with the audio collection and that bbc recording that's most of what we have on yeah. and well you know the lingua phone stuff you know on the yeah. records whatever yeah. but that's most of the stuff that you can get on Tolkien. yeah andrew you should drop that uh the um talking at oxford that the bbc just the uh, where it's they did it in hd like they redid it and put it in HD. yes um to drop it in the chat i think see if i could like find that because that. Yeah. that was great um did, i don't know john did you see this they they did it in hd talking really? in oxford so yeah. basically as opposed to it looking uh like uh four 480p which is what a uh television would look like it's 1080p yeah, and so. it's because it was done on film, so you can actually oh, remaster oh, wow. it. Um, yeah. And yeah, so, so it's the first time I've ever seen Tolkien in HD. Yeah, it was great. It's Tolkien walking around Oxford and pointing things wow. out. That sounds I awesome. Will, yeah, I will find that. I'll put it in the. I'll put the link in. Yeah, I think that's awesome. very much true to Stuart Lee's work, right? Because he's been so tenaciously bugging yes. the BBC for. Could you finally open the archive? That would be really, really lovely of you, yeah. because there is tons of stuff. You're just too lazy to unbox. Yeah. I'm here. Thank you. I would. There was. A, there's a slight interest in some of that stuff. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So, uh, just as people are joining, this is literally open mic. Uh, we're just all friends here and chatting. So feel free to pipe in at any time, or um, we're not. Uh, we're just gonna hang out for a few minutes and have fun. Um, I will try and give a few things away eventually. Jeremy's got um, some. Jeremy's got some doodads. He's going to give away. Yep, I got to figure out how to do it. 
I'm not here for the giveaways. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah. don't have to be on the Zoom to be part of the giveaway. I'll do it in the store. Uh, there was going to be easier. swag. That's what that's, that's the whole, whole reason. That's the whole reason yeah. I'm this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, Mariner sent me this. Um, wow. Cool. Uh, a couple of weeks ago. So I'm going to do that. Uh, what is it? And then I have some stuff from the, the Bodleian shop. From the exhibition, what does that say? Uh, on the, what does that say on the spine, Jeremy? Does it say Mariner or does it say Houghton Mifflin? It still says uh, Houghton Mifflin on the okay. the ink there because it was sent to the printers before the acquisition and all the business changes. But I just thought that might yeah. be a might be a second print. <clears throat> nope, I don't think so. Got these cool little ceramic buttons that they made with the devices of Tolkien and okay. some really hefty bookmarks. Jeremy, are you selling buttons at the door? That pun never gets old. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we'll get to those in a few minutes. Uh, I'll figure out a way to do it on Discord. That's fair for everyone who's hanging out there uh, or here, but um, hopefully you guys had fun. Uh, I might have uh, another person or two drop in, uh, depending on their availability, just because, you know, this was a casual event and people's schedules get thrown into disarray. Thanks to you three for doing all of this. This is just amazing. I mean, without, you know, talking reading day, without something like this, particularly during a shitty pandemic, is, you know, this really sucks. And, and you guys doing this is like, I, I don't have enough thumbs to put up. So thank you very much for all of this. Well, Jeremy did 90% of the work, I think. He, he did 99% <laughs> of the work. Come on, we've got to be honest, too. He did do 99. Uh, uh, no, I appreciate it. And the guests were everything. I mean, if it was just me. Dick Plops, Bob Foster. Head. Oh, my God. <laughs> I'm, dying, I'm, I'm dying. It's like. Yeah. It was it was yep. it was really cool to to meet them in person. That was that was fantastic. Uh, I I just I can't imagine uh, being 18 years old and going to going to getting a trip to Oxford to meet Tolkien. I mean, I don't think I, I would. I don't think I, I don't would. Know, I wouldn't know what to say. I think that's I the either. problem. To well, him. he said he didn't know what to say. No, he was flown say, out no. there, and he's like, I just, "I'm no, 18 talk. years old, <laughs> yeah. and I'm meeting a hero, and I don't take notes and." You know, I'm gonna have to go back and reread that interview in 17 now. It's uh, yeah, it's I, I was so torn between total envy and jealousy and hatred for not having that, and then thinking, how cool is this that they had this chance, this opportunity, you know, to to meet the person himself? So, yeah, yeah it's just amazing. Yeah, hey, Peter, and... hey, Peter, hey, Peter, good to see you, Peter, definitely. So glad you could make it. We don't get to see each other very often these days, so got to take advantage of these opportunities. For anybody who doesn't know, that's uh, Peter Collier does the Tolkien Library website, a uh, fantastic resource for um, collectors and a long-standing, upstanding part of Tolkien fandom for decades mm -hmm. now. So he's also a he's also a core block expert. That's right. Yeah, thanks to thanks to you, we have this wonderful book. I mean, that's just fantastic on Core Blog's work. It's sort of thanks to the Tolkien family, but <laughs> they asked me to do it. Um, but yeah, it's because of my interest that they learned that there was so much. So um, that's resolved into one calendar, two calendars, a book. Yeah. yeah, Peter's always telling us about how he had to run, how he had to track Core Block down, <laughs> to to get him to do the book. Not only to track Core Block down, core, uh, track track all the works down. Mm. Was, uh, they were all scattered all over the globe, so it was like uh, finding one needle in a haystack all over again and again and again. Yeah. So I, there was like 160 of them scattered all over the planet. So. We found them all, all except for five. So we did a nice job. 
Yeah, but it's it's particularly with art, you know, with all the artists that have come before all the film trilogy in the last 20 years. I mean, I, I'm doing right now a little piece on the, the Mountain Spirit postcard of, you know, Madlena. And nobody had expected that the original painting of the postcard was simply given away by the artist to some American couple. And then 60 years later, they sell it at Sotheby's because, you know, I, the guy, I have it here. Yeah, well, there you go. So I'm not going to buy it. I'm sorry, my credit card is maxed. It's like the, it's like this is big and Tolkien's yeah, yeah, yeah. writing it like. Peter, you want to show it to us? I could. Peter, <laughs> would you move your butt, please? Thank you very much. One second. One second. I think you're being asked to show it, Peter. If you didn't, if you didn't want, Sussle. if you didn't Sussle. want me showing you stuff, if you didn't want, don't to, mention it. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, he, yeah, he, yeah, he yeah, should have yeah. turned his camera on, and you know, I was going to ask him. Like, Peter, Peter has some very rare Tolkien. Oh wow, toys. yeah, he's got some good oh. stuff. That is yeah, very got, true. He's got some really good stuff. I'm wondering what else he's going to grab while he's back in the vault. <laughs> if. Uh, you can go you can just see some of the stuff that he has or has had um if you go to to his website the tolkien library you can kind of see what yeah. he what he's had in the past and what he still has yeah and the the, the joseph madlena postcard thing and the, the the image to that is that it's been misunderstood for many years yeah as an inspiration for gandalf which so it's it isn't in here yeah yeah yep. well, i see it too very nice. You the, the writing of Tolkien on the back. Hmm. Oh man! <laughs> <laughs> so yes, it's here. Mm -hmm. All right, Marcel. Did I mention? Did I mention my credit cards are maxed? There's so much here, you can't imagine. No, oh, I can. do. I I can. Trust me, <laughs> I can't imagine that. Oh man. But I'm organized, so I, I managed to, to get it in one minute. So. <laughs> hey, we have that in common, at least. Mine are, too. <laughs> knew exactly where to go to grab it. That's... If you're looking behind me, you can tell I've slowly disorganized kind of the recent stuff, just kind of gets thrown on the shelves behind me and sits there for a while, and then eventually it gets into the more permanent system, but... Uh, it just kind of hangs out there. But it's actually it's actually quite funny when you uh, I stopped doing any Tolkien related stuff for some years because of the illness mm -hmm. of my wife, and last December I decided to go through the the whole stock list of everything I have and see that everything is back in order and put it all back on the shelves. It took me like five or six days nonstop mm -hmm. to get it all done. But then you're you're handling every piece every treasure and you're like ah <laughs> oh <laughs> that's I can't imagine the, the just, most funny thing to do and <clears throat> absolutely just touching it again i like going through my collection sometimes mm -hmm. i recently someone was asking some questions about I, I have some movie posters which for some reason back in the early 2000s i was collecting some peter jackson stuff and Jeremy has Jeremy has over fifty feet of movie posters. <laughs> <laughs> Getting them out again, just unrolling each of them because some of them are still tubed, um, not the good ones, but the the yeah. movie ones, um, and just rolling them out and looking at them again. And they're it's it's just good to touch things again after a while. You know, they 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 go back into the archives, if you will, whatever. I'm looking at Marcel's shelves now. You know, it's like things just get packed away and you don't really think about them and going through it every now and then is important, you know? I, I remember that um, when with the film posters, you know, one of the first film posters is um, Elijah Wood as Frodo when he looks at the ring, mm -hmm. you know, this this all, almost all black, you know, he's, mm -hmm. he's he has the head, he's looking down at the ring which was one of the things in the first film, you have like the ring like a thousand times, ooh, the ring, ooh, and on the posters as well. And a major German magazine came over to my place to take pictures of me. And the only thing the photographer wanted was me to hold the one ring in my head and look at, and look at like Elijah Wood. So I have, I have like a, I have like one of those 
quick shot photos that and then they decided no we're not gonna do it you're not you're not a celebrity so i have a your hand picture, i have enough. a picture of me and my hand looking like elijah would go like yeah, I would, I would like a. I would like a. And I'm not allowed to show myself. it. I'm not allowed to show it because the photographer has not given me, you know. So, oh, so yep. you can't you can't mail me a print. <laughs> oh, who are you? I don't know you. Maybe <laughs> place later. <laughs> mm. Well, I'm awesome. the, the one thing that I noticed in the last couple of weeks and months is, you know, with the podcast panel, in the last six months, I think about twenty new talking podcasts have been founded you know they still have only like five or ten or twenty or whatever followers if i may but... i have a past that is my favorite there you go that's the, the amazing thing about this evening being away for some years you get back to this and then you you see like digital talking projects you see the talking um what right. was it? Uh, sorry, it's, it's, there's a little bit of a delay on the stream from when I speak, but uh, I'll try to do the best I can. Okay. Yeah, I just a uh, side note if you're in the Zoom call, um, don't try it and watch it. It comes from the voice YouTube of Saruman chapter of the Two Towers. Uh, I'm, I have the paperback of The Two Towers, which is the movie accompanying printing. Um, anyways, this is when Theoden rebukes Saruman. We will have... You can't join any regions. Yep, sorry, Quinn. Um... For now, we're not going to be doing any live readings um, for the open mic. Um, yeah. And mm -hmm. I think you're on watching the YouTube, which is like 15, 20 seconds delayed. Um, yeah, we, we've been so, asked. We've been asked not to do any readings for the for the event. Yep. Absolutely. So, no problem. Uh, let's. We were we lost Marcel for briefly. Uh, he's off getting another beer, I'm sure. Um, so momentarily here, uh, I, I will, uh, do one of the first giveaways. Uh, so I'm going to be doing a little, um, bookkeeping in discord, um, chatter amongst yourselves. <laughs> I'll be right back. I'll, you'll see me, but, uh, I gotta, um, get that set up because I'm sure people want bookmarks so, and stuff. So while Jeremy's doing that, what was, uh, I'm interested to hear y'all's uh, thoughts. What did y'all have like a favorite panel? Did y'all have like, who was, what were some highlights for you? They were all so good. And starting off with seeing the artists and I really liked how you guys got them to interact just a little bit between each other too. I don't know if they get the chance to talk to each other very often. Um, but honestly, everything was so much fun today. I haven't left this chair all day. <laughs> so thank you. That's cool. Yeah, we tried. Um, I'd say the artist panel was probably um, the largest where they probably don't interact as much. But uh, yeah, I did try and have guests that knew each other outside of here. Um, I don't know if it came across well, but like Donato and Ted have known each other for years and, and they've, they've got their, their patter down. So it was kind of hard to like wedge in and say, let's let, let's let everybody else talk too, guys. <laughs> I think it went really smoothly and they they were awesome. Uh, there's no complaints here, but you know, it's, um, it's good to have friends, especially like, like Dick and Bob as well, um, have known each other since they were 14 and 15 years old. So they were, they were very comfortable to be on screen. Um, uh, I'm not sure how comfortable they were talking Tolkien, because like they said, it's been decades since they were in fandom, uh, which is still awesome that they were willing to come on and you know kind of brush off the cobwebs and, and chat a little bit about their, their reminiscing. Um, I mentioned this in the Discord. I'll, I'll say it here as well. Um, uh, you know, I'm working with them to do sort of a written up interview article uh, so we can ask a lot more in-depth questions and, and get a little more of their history and, and memories uh, out of them that uh, is hard to do in a, a short live event. 
was nonetheless interesting to see their faces. You, you yes. read about them, but you can't stick a face on them. And to hear them talk was interesting. Yeah, um, absolutely. Uh, just the, I still, I, I'm amazed that uh, Bob decided to, to take that upon himself to, to, to sit down and do all that and organize all that. Um, it's, it's just, it's, it's fantastic that he decided to do that. And we all benefited from it, so. Yeah. And still do. I mean, there, there's so much interest in the edition that's supposed to come out this fall. Um, it's, everybody's excited about that. And it may not have been clear to Bob because um, he's absolutely correct. The book has always been in print as a paperback in the United States. Um, and, and so in the UK, it's been a lot harder to get. Um, which is uh, yes, it's really been out of print in the UK for a long yeah. time since about two thousand and five. So it's just not been possible to get hold of it unless you buy a second hand version. Yeah, I mean, yep. Uh, no, go ahead. Jeremy. Would you please? Would you please note that the best guide to Middle Earth by Bob Foster was the German one because the German one was translated, re-edited, and corrected by the German translator, who happens to be the first German scholar to do a dissertation on Tolkien in the early 80s, Dr. Helmut Pesch, who was a good friend of mine. Ooh. And then the Dutch stepped in and added to the Guide to Middle Earth. Yeah, Peter, thank you. They, the Dutch and the everyone, the Belgians, they all stepped in and they made the Foster even better. So the best Foster right now is the Dutch translation of the Guide to Middle Earth in, in Dutch. Is that is that still in print? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, fairly recent, both of them. Okay. Mm -hmm. We just all have to learn how to speak Dutch. Yeah, read that. <laughs> always I, worth a try. I was going to ask Bob about the, the perils of calling a book the complete version of something, particularly to do with Tolkien, because as soon as you say that, then of course something else is going to turn up almost ten minutes later. And it's no longer a complete version. Yeah, we yeah, should have, we should have had them on for an hour, Jeremy. It yeah, it was one of those things where um, the the schedule and the guests were yeah kind of fluid over the last week or so, and so it uh, it just kind of ended up the way it was. Well, I think yeah. we had a good time, so maybe they'll come back sometime, and you can do I, a special just with them. We Absolutely. And I know that uh, the Prance and Pony podcast is clamoring to be put in touch with them to get them on there as well as guests. So, uh, and Marcel, I see the twinkle in your eye and <laughs> we tried really hard not to scare them off. So hopefully they'll come back. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. We're, uh, yeah. you know, baby steps. Well, cool. so um, I thought it would be pretty easy uh to do it this way if we uh since we don't really have questions for guests necessary anymore uh i will was going to start i'll just grab something randomly off my table so if anybody is interested in uh this bookmark let's see if we can make it legible it's really thick and nice uh i'll do this one then we'll get back to chatting for a while and i'll do another one um so uh, if you want this, go on to Discord, go into the questions for guests channel uh, and pick a number between one and a hundred. Uh, I've already, let me hold this up here. I've got a post-it note with a number already written on it. So go ahead and put your guesses in. We'll wait for a minute or two for people who want you to do that. Uh, and then I'll mail it to you. We'll figure that out offline. You, you know, we could, we could up the difficulty level, Jeremy. We could be like, you know. In what Ooh. year did the Witch King return to Minas Morgul? Like <laughs> <laughs> Who can get to their complete guide of Middle Earth first? I need a, I need a minute to call Chad. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, exactly. Exactly. So um, uh, anyway, uh, I know this is kind of silly. I'm just having fun. We can keep the conversation going. But after people who are interested and have it, had a chance, um, we'll do that. And if it works, we'll do a couple more that way. I just want it to be fair and fun and just quick and easy for people so um We're certainly getting quite a few people putting numbers in there so it looks quite right. yeah, yeah, yeah all right i'm keeping my eye on the screen i don't want to cheat and you know well it's give it's, it away you know, it's all about, it's all about numbers i remember that 
um, I, you know, I mentioned and mentioned online that I uh, have been recently divorced. Uh, but the thing is, my wife, who was, you know, we had already separated, entered an amount into the Patreon that I was doing to support me because, you know, we're still great friends that had to do with the fall of the first Minas Tirith in the Sermerillion. You know, she just took an, an egg from the first age because she's a pressure fan, but she knows her Tolkien because her nickname is Sauron, you know, and she... She took that amount and gave that to me on Patreon. That's the kind of Tolkien nerdery that you get if you get those numbers in. And I would have loved to see something beyond a hundred, maybe. This could be, yep. you know, some more numbers. Hey, there's Cliff. Hey, there's Cliff. All right, so Cliff, before we um, oh, yeah. just get into your audio, uh, really appreciate you still being able to drop in. Uh, we'll chat in a second. I got to deal with this piece of paper in my hand first. <laughs> Um, so, uh, uh, I'm assuming I haven't looked at discord. You guys have put in yeah. some guesses. Well, it's quite uh, we'll a lot. Do... It looks like they finished now. So go ahead with the yep. number. We'll do closest without going over just so that we can differentiate. And if there's a tie, uh, I'll flip a coin. Um, so, uh, I had number, uh, 38. Ah! I know my Jesus. camera's inverted, but it's like it's Cindy. Cindy, Cindy Beach. Beach. Ibit is 37. Cindy Beach. 37. 33. She, she picked 33, so I think it's... Th 37. 37 is the 37. closest. Yeah, there's a 37 in there. Right. And I have a 42. Damn it. Oh, there is a 37. Yes, there is, yeah. All right, that's it. I beat. So, I beat. Thank you. Uh, send me a direct message <clears throat> on Discord. I'll get your address and we'll send that off. I bet you that's out of the way. So Clifford, thank you so much for joining. I know we uh, had some unfortunate issues. Don't matter. You're here now. It's so great to see you. Hello, everybody. And uh, you can hear me okay? Yes, um, you are awesome. Come. Uh, I have very often encountered uh, uh, difficult audio problems with uh, the new system that I've just installed. And anybody who watches a little bit, <laughs> a little bit of the one ring.net on Tuesday is probably familiar with the ongoing audio problems that I have. But uh, if it sounds okay, then that's great. Uh, I'm, I'm so grateful um, for everybody being flexible. I want to apologize, uh, Jeremy, you worked so hard and put so much uh, class, real class, real effort into putting this together. And it was so well organized. And here I am just completely gone and not there where I need to be. So I apologize uh, profoundly, um, but I'm so glad to be here. Um, picking up with this conversation with everyone. Hi there, it's uh, delightful to see everyone on Tolkien Reading Day. Um, did you know on the outside of it, I always thought that the biggest days of the year that we have on the calendar for all of us Tolkien nerds, I mean, you get really down on January 3rd, obviously January 3rd is you know, the Tolkien toast uh, on his birthday. And then somebody else has a birthday on September 22nd. And you know, uh, I've quite forgotten their names. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, sorry. But then again, here we are together on yet a third, a third day year round where everybody gets to come together yet again. And it seems like having Christmas three times a year. For me, it actually feels like you know, why do we get three holidays this year for us? You know, it's great. <laughs> yeah, no, it's awesome to have these community gatherings. Uh, it's been, um, you know, I started these after we all went into lockdown. That was kind of the inspiration for um, three years ago. Well, three events ago, two years ago. Um, and so uh, being online and everybody having these new technologies to like kind of join and see each other and uh we've been we spent the day talking about you know really old school fandom from dick and bob and now to yes. you know, awesome new audio technologies and youtube and, and new media and uh, it's 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 fantastic I, I i love the way this fandom is growing it's getting better over time uh it's Yes, it's it awesome. is. It's getting better. Did did anybody talk uh, about the little newsletter that Laurie Battle 
who used to work for Tolkien Enterprises uh -huh. up in Berkeley. Did, did anybody already talk about the beautiful little piece of paper? They, I think it was called the Brandywine Bridge, and it was out in the, in the late 70s, early 1980s. And that was the highest form of internet fandom that we had at the time, was a newsletter that was created by the people working at Saul Zentz in Berkeley. That would be, you know, a bunch of people working and trying to create a newsletter that went out four times a year. Yes, mm -hmm. that was it. That was the extent of our, our uh, exchanges. In the late 70s, maybe back in 1982, when I was trying to get my first ticket to go and see The Dark Crystal at the local theater, that, that was when Laurie Battle was sending out court, quarterly newsletters to the Tolkien fans. And to me, that was the height. That, at the time, I believed that was the height of fandom to get, I opened up my envelope every three months. I was just a kid. I was absolutely thrilled. There were pieces of fan art. There were in, intelligent articles. There were discussions about Tolkien's books and it was, some of it was way, way over my head, but I was just so delighted with that. And, you know, just like a cigarette commercial, I, you know, like Virginia Slims, I have to say, you've come a long way, baby. You know? Uh, I love I love the early sort of magazines where everyone has to put their address in there because that's the only way people can contact them is by actually yeah. by writing to people. And you think it's it's nowadays you just send someone an email, so it's all almost instant. Whereas then it was put it in the post, wait for the reply, and then do it again. And uh. yeah, those those early fanzines are art pieces in themselves. Um, they're they're really really cool to look at. Jeremy's got a lot of a lot of good ones in his collection. I know. Mm. Yeah, I was just saying, I don't want to take my headphones off and go back into the storage area, but I've got a full run of the the Brandywine stars from. Oh, it Bernie was called Zuber. the Brandywine Star. You have, you actually have some in your collection. All right, of course he has. Excuse yes. me for yeah. chatter amongst yourselves. Let's go and get them. Them. No, 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 no. Oh my gosh! Yeah, oh my gosh! This is real. Yeah, okay. um, Jeremy's I got quite, the, a, quite a fanzine collection. The Marquettes are actually digitizing them. I don't know whether we'll have to ask Jeremy when he comes back yeah. if things are on the list. That's, but they that's are digitizing Gary's. them. Yeah, yeah. That, that's mm. that's Gary's collection. Who was given all of the collection more or less and full access to. I mean that the guy Gary is, is he's he's the largest fans in collection not only from the United States but you know from elsewhere and he is given full access for Maquette to digitize that stuff so I'm I'm really looking forward to seeing all of this because I was in his home and I saw all the first you know like the branding was start everything was there from the earliest days from you know the fan in particular in the United States and it's just absolutely amazing. It's it's like it's like a room full of boxes, you know, a bit like like this one, specially done for archives and libraries. Okay. So you can you can you can put in your you know V size magazines and stuff. So mm. uh, and you can read the early. I mean, Bob Foster and Dick Plots. Come on, the, the stuff yeah. they wrote is in those magazines, and the guys like. Oh yeah, it's it's really lovely to be here tonight. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's very exciting. I'm I'm excited uh, that somebody remembers what I'm talking about. Much less that you that some of you have collections of them. And now <laughs> now you're telling me that Marquette is going to really digitize them. Uh, if if they might have done it already, to be honest. Uh, no, that's yeah, they could have done that already. Yes. That, that I think is, I think the, the exhibition, uh, the opening of the exhibition at Marquette this year, we'll see a few projects come to life. Yes. I, I think that, if they're not yeah, I think if they're not done yet, they're gonna be done by that by that time. I am thrilled. I'm so thrilled to hear this. Yeah. I mean, I, I was getting excited because uh, local here to me in Southern California, there's the Huntington Library and Gardens. And they have an ad going on because they have some of Tolkien's maps and they have some original manuscript uh, materials that they're showing off at the Huntington as part of a larger collection, um, exploring other authors and other texts, even historical ones uh, that offer maps or cartography of fictional worlds. And I'm, you know, this is as close as I'm gonna get unless I get on a plane and go up to Milwaukee, of course. Um, 
but this is very exciting. Uh, I thought that I was just going to be talking out of a vague, distant memory, and here someone's. I can't believe Jeremy is. <laughs> he's mm. actually. Uh, yeah, yeah. He's he's, that's a, I can't <laughs> believe it. It's too when, good. When you hold when you hold the fanzine where it says the first ever Tolkien costume at a Worldcon is in that collection and that kind of fanzine from 1957, you know, so. I'm gonna die. Yeah. I'm gonna die. Actually, the, the closest that I ever got to that era was when I did an interview. Oh, there it is. <laughs> there, oh, show it to me. Show them, show them. Let me see. Try to get the light, not the skin. Oh is my, my gosh. camera reversed for you? Jeremy, make yourself the, uh, make your, can you oh, pin yeah, yourself sure. so your screen gets bigger? Yep. <clears throat> you want me to flip my camera? No, that's fine. <laughs> okay, cool. I remember, I remember that purple one, Brandywine Recipes. I remember those. I, <laughs> oh my gosh, I can't. This is amazing. He's got those back there in his map cabinet. That's right. Yep. <laughs> And then I've got the, we regret to tell you, we're oh. discontinuing. They're never nice, are they, those ones? Was that, was that letter authored by Laurie, by Ms. Laurie Battle? Because I believe she was the editor, wasn't she? It's not mm. signed. Oh, dear. Um, the letter. Wow. We could probably find out, though, but uh, yeah. I, she I, was I, at uh, Oxford at the opening of the exhibition. A lady sits down beside me and says, oh, hello, who are you? I said, hi, I'm Marcel. I'm from the German Token Society. She says, oh, yes, yes, we wrote a couple of years ago. And I thought, and who are you? And she says, I'm Laurie Battle. And I said, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> and it's That's like, fantastic. you have done a few projects yourself, haven't you, with Tolkien, right? And she says, yes. Uh, <laughs> Oh, she's fantastic. Oh my gosh. Yeah. She know, has I, stories to tell and she has stories to tell. Do you know what? Uh, somehow, somewhere along the line, now that the deal, the actual licensing deal that Saul Zentz used to have is now sold. I just got information late last night that that deal is done. Now maybe she has some freedom, some freedom to actually speak a little bit more openly. And I'm going to have to reach out to her and hopefully invite her yeah. to come on and have a, a lively conversation with us. That would be exciting. Yeah. Um, the last time I got that close to somebody in the legendary department of the, you know, the 1970s uh, and 1960s Tolkien fandom was an interview that I did with Forrest J. Ackerman, who is who was, who was the editor of Famous Monsters of Filmland. And mm -hmm. as you know, from reading Tolkien's letters, you know that it was uh, Forrest Ackerman acting as a producer who brought Zimmerman and his crazy script to the professor and all that about. mischief. Um, I, I, got to, I got to dig into a really good meat and potatoes interview with uh, Uncle Forey, uh, people call Forrest Ackerman Uncle Forey and always did. Yeah. Um, and I was one of the very last people to interview him before he passed. And he, he literally said, well, when we brought this idea to Tolkien, we were unfortunately just a little ahead of our time. <laughs> and, <laughs> <laughs> ahead of our times. That's a nice way to spin it. <laughs> yeah. He was, yep. because he was the very, very first you know, person to bring a screenplay attempt to Tolkien, and it was awful. It was admittedly not very good, and Tolkien knew that it was not very good, but he shrugged, he shrugged it off and said, you know, we were the first ones at the plate, and we didn't know what we yeah. were doing. We were just tapping into the unbelievable energy, um, and at that time, uh, LOSFUS, the Los Angeles uh, Science and Fantasy Society, uh, had... Uh, already gotten people together. I'm sure Dick Plotz knew quite a few of those people in the early 60s uh, who were very energized. Um, the, 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 that cloudy, interesting area of time from 1957, you know, up until the very early 60s before the American counterculture really embraced Tolkien in a very significant and a very different kind of way, you know, before that time happened, uh, the, the the experiences of early Tolkien fandom are the most interesting to me in terms of research and learning more about it. Um, and I miss I miss Uncle Forey. I, I really do wish that he was still with us. 
Uh, but um, I was uh, very lucky to be able to talk with him about that very interesting time. Well, he is, he, I mean, he's a fan legend and, um, you know, not necessarily only in Tolkien, but he is a fan legend. So, mm -hmm. I mean, everyone, everyone, you know, talking to him will have had just, I mean, with, with Foster and Plots today, I mean, what they could possibly tell from the early days and, you know, just sitting there and going like, hmm, do you remember in 1964, did we do that thing in September? I'm not quite sure. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. You went to see XYZ here and we did blah, 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 that. And then we did this. And I was like, I wanted to do my dissertation on the US fandom. It's them. Yeah. You know, it's 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 very much these people who did all of this and the yes. Mythopoeic society wouldn't be here without them and all this kind of stuff. So I I actually honestly I thought they had gone. They had they they had already passed away because they are not the youngest anymore. And I thought, you know, maybe they're no longer with us. But knowing that they're there, and we can talk to them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah an, opp an, an opportunity not to be missed. Yeah, it's good to it's good to have these. I mean, I don't know how many I don't know how many people are left that are still with us that have actually talked to Tolkien. There's probably not that many. I mean, so it was great to have it was great to have Dick on today and to, and to ask him about what he remembered, you know, about Tolkien himself. Yeah, absolutely. I've had conversations with Tom Chippy as well, who had some small interactions with him. So mm. it's fascinating yeah. stories to talk to people from those times but uh, honestly i'm just as fascinated now to talk to the people in fandom and the industry you know as we're alive right now it's just as mm -hmm. uh it's 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 a different era but there's so much cool stuff that's going on with you know uh the the books being published um it was nice having bob on for his new one but we had the nature of middle earth just come out last year we've got oh um, yes uh the the tv show and the movie from warner brothers next year and it's it's not tolkien i mean nature middle earth is 100 percent tolkien but um you know there's a lot of cool stuff that's that's also coming out now that uh is uh other minds and other hands as, as many of us like to quote pull yes. out of context from that letter <laughs> i i agree i agree yeah. now, would you would you say that this this work that uh the inimitable Carl Hostetter has given us this work of nature and Middle Earth. Is it safe to say that this is the least expected? I mean, this is the most uh, unexpected surprise to have anything from Tolkien writing about Numenorean dancing bears, and and <laughs> and also I didn't realize that that there was such a mathematical effort. A linguist. I, I mean, I mean, in my mind, Professor Tolkien is sitting over here as a powerful, powerful intellect. Why? Because of his approach to languages and history. I had no idea ever, because I can't do it, <laughs> that he could apply the same incredible powers of intellect to mathematics. That was very surprising that Tolkien wanted to go to that effort. Without a calculator. Wow. Uh, with, without, without a calculator, a calculator. without Thank a calculator. <laughs> well, we have argued he, he may have had a calculator, but it's not yeah. what we would consider to be a calculator now. <laughs> yeah, making Texas yes. instruments jokes, you know, at the earliest days. Yeah, yeah, yeah right, uh, right. <laughs> you no, know, mechanical, mechanical calculators were, were around at the time, and being in a university were, was one of the few places where you'd actually would have access to them. So he could have used a calculator. Isn't there and now I'm thinking, enormous things? And now I'm massive. thinking Tolkien in this in this in this huge room with this mm. massive 20 by 50 feet, you know, computer, and he going like elf, elf two, elf three, <laughs> yeah. elf four. Aren't there uh, I know. no I know. <laughs> isn't isn't on the isn't on the manuscripts, isn't there some some math done by hand by Tolkien on the manuscripts, or am I, am I dreaming that up? Yes, but even if he did it by hand, he would have probably used a slide rule of yeah. things that people don't use anymore. Right. right. I love yeah, I love yeah. Carl for that footnote when he says there was only one miscalculation. I checked that. He checked it. Yes. <laughs> it on nature and middle earth. It's like this one yeah. footnote, and it's like, yeah, Carl. Yeah, yeah. I got this. Mm. Yeah. That's awesome. That's really awesome. I uh, I'm just surprised. And who knew? 
who knew that all these decades later, after Tolkien has shed his mortal coil and gone on to the great beyond, who knew that all this time later, he was still full of surprises, Master Baggins. He is still, (laughs) Tolkien is still full of surprises. And I'm just very happy to be part of this energized fandom um and i'll it say it's like it feels like 20 years ago right now it really yeah. feels like 20 years ago it's almost it's not the same but mm-hmm. it is you know comparable to this definitely oh yeah the energy I, I i i'm surprised maybe i shouldn't be but a lot of people who come up to me on the street literally are like oh my gosh that that conversation that you just had about Tolkien last week. Uh, are you really feeling this way about the show coming up? Are you are you as nervous as I am? M- most of the conversations center around that. Are, are you as nervous as I am about the upcoming show? Um, we're, we're just very attached. Tolkien fans have a certain degree of emotional and mental and even spiritual attachment to Tolkien's works, which is not really easily com- com- comparable to other speculative fiction writers. Uh, I'm still not quite sure how, how to get to the bottom of that, but I do find it fascinating. What's that you have, Marcel? Nature, that's the nature middle of deluxe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ooh, deluxe. Gorgeous. That's beautiful. It is absolutely gorgeous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like it. That is lovely. I have, um, I have one too, but someone scribbled in it. I have to get what? it. What? <laughs> <Long>. Shame. <laughs> Are we going to start who's been scribbling? No, no, no seriously. The thing is, this is a room of with people in it who know. I mean, seriously, I don't have a collection. I mean, I have a couple of books on Tolkien, but I've met with Tolkien Guide, I've met people who have serious <laughs> collections. Andrew, <laughs> would you shut? Would you stop? <laughs> Peter, Marcel, you shut Marcel, up Marcel, too. Marcel, you see that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, fuck a rough then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh gosh! Well, didn't no. we figure out just a little while ago that I have the most unique collection because none of my books are signed yes, <laughs> compared yes. to all of you? <laughs> Jennifer, yes, Jennifer's, got, Jennifer's collection is the most unique out of all of ours. This book was obviously this was always ruined when someone scribbled in this one. Oh, Tolkien! It's going to show us. If you get us, if you get us together long enough, we're going to start trying to one up each other. I know. Yeah. I have, I have only one. May, may, may I please indulge me? Indulge me. I have one thing to show you. <laughs> Andrew, was that your was that your Tolkien sign, Lord of the Rings? Yes. Awesome. One of them. One of them. I was enjoying. Well, I haven't actually got the other one yet. I still. Uh... Uh, I, but I have been promised it, so I'm still waiting. Even though Peter tried to buy it off my uncle, um, I still remember <laughs> that. You got to get to it before Peter gets to it. Well, he, tra- he tried pretty quickly to get. Out. <laughs> Here we go. Um, this this is often referred to as the red letter edition. Yes, I, that's one of my favorite editions, actually. This is one of my very favorite editions as well, and. It has been very well loved and it has been scribbled over by every single person from the film trilogy, including uh, Peter Jackson, Sala Baker, and Dominic wow. Monaghan, and uh, Ian McKellen, and Howard Shore, and Orlando, and Sean, and Elijah, and, uh, and Carl Urban and Fran Walsh, and Vigo Mortensen, and Philippa Boyens. I'm surprised you've got enough space in there. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I thought we would have a challenge. Is John John Rhys-Davies in there? Yeah, Yeah. John Rhys-Davies is right here across the tippy top. And the only only two persons, the only two individuals, even even Harry Sinclair, who played Isildur, even he signed this. How cool Uh, is this? What did I, I the only the only thing that I've missed is um, uh, Sir Christopher Lee. So that will never happen. That's oh, quite yeah. unfortunate. Yeah, okay. yeah. And the I guess the last remaining signature I really need would be Kate Blanchett. That, that would right. be about it. Yeah, that's you, the only you might be able to get her to sign it though. Okay. Yes. She might be able to do it. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And uh, yes, 
I, I, I got to say... Um, I, to be I, honest, Cliff, if you tell Kate Blanchett you've got everybody else to sign it, could she do it? I'm sure she would. So I think you're... Well, she you're probably right. would, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, um, a number of years ago, when she was cast as Hella, she and her children made a special detour to go down into Meltdown Comics. And that was our previous home, our studio for broadcasting for the one ring.net oh, okay. was in meltdown comics. And um, Justin texted me on the phone and he said, get down here right now. Kate is in the shop buying a bunch of Marvel and Thor comic books because uh, obviously she's got some job coming up. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, by well, the time I, I ran, I ran down there and I missed her. I just missed seeing her. So maybe someday, I don't know how that's going to happen. Um, Cliff, while we have you here, do you want to tell us about what uh, what's going on at the One Ring dot net? What what do you got going on in the near yeah, future? Yeah, absolutely. You I'm I'm glad everybody mentioned it. There's um there's a really fun and uh, uh, it's a bit offbeat, but there's a very fun March Madness uh, bracket that we're doing right now at the One Ring. Um, every year we create a really complicated uh, bracket of famous characters or places or you know, every year we rotate the idea, but the bracket is a popularity contest. It's just for the fans to get together and vote on who their favorite person, place, or thing would be in Middle Earth. And uh, this year we decided to create a March Madness bracket, which is built around uh, historical events. And we have four different quadrants. One is uh, prior to the first age, including Valerian years and year of the trees. Another bracket is first age events and then second age events. And then the very last, obviously third age historical events. And if you look at our website, a lot of very busy, busy hands have been involved. A lot of volunteers have written beautiful uh, synopses of the different events uh, all across the, the ages. And you can click on the interface and look at the bracket and see how certain matchups are going up against one another. Uh, for example, the creation of the two lamps. Sorry, Cliff, just a minute. I think, Jeremy, uh, people are saying that Discord's frozen. Ooh. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. The audio. All right, I'll unfroze it. The, the, give, the giveaway broke Discord. Oh. All right, carry on. Carry on, Cliff. Okay. Carry on. Thank oh. you. Fixed. <laughs> Oh, that's cool. Uh, no, it's just, a, it's kind of funny. I remember a couple of years ago, they did uh, um, costumes. Vote for your favorite costumes that are represented, obviously, from the films. And there was a lot of competition. Uh, previous years was just to pick your favorite character. And, and this year, it's going to be uh, historical events in Middle Earth. So imagine, you know, having to choose between, um, you know, the, the Eldar arriving in a man versus uh, uh, the creation of the two lamps. Or an, another matchup might be, um, uh, you know, the, the, the doom of Mandos versus, uh, uh, you know, the, the birth of Luthien. There's different events that are just uh, categorized and it's really detailed, very detailed. And we'll be doing some live streams to support um, uh, showing all the audience how the votes are going and what popular wave of uh, voting is going on. Uh, and then uh, eventually the brackets will be limited down and there'll only be a couple of, of uh, winners left in an ultimate face-off in the end. So uh, aside from that, um, we're going to be rebroadcasting our Tuesday show every week from the, the local Star Wars cantina that is nearby us. It's called Scum and Villainy Cantina. And that's where we have hosted a lot of conversations. We did a 20th anniversary uh, round table discussion with uh, Mark Ordesky and uh, Michael Pellerin and of course, uh, Sir Richard Taylor and uh, the producers and uh, Rick Porras, associate producer from the Rings trilogy. We've had some really fascinating conversations and I'm looking forward to scheduling more really great interviews in the coming year. It's gonna be fantastic. Yeah. It should be fun. It should be really, really fun. Um, it's. I'm just um, so great, grateful that you guys invited me. Thanks for. Uh, thanks um, for letting me join you today. Uh, 
Cliff, uh, hope, uh, I think we've asked a lot of people this today, but hope, hopes and dreams for the, for the Amazon show? Uh, hopes and dreams for the Amazon show. Um, do you know that conversation really can't be had unless we talk about the weirdness of what licensing is. Mm -hmm. it, it's, mm -hmm. it, it, it leads back to that original deal that Professor Tolkien made when he was alive, selling the motion picture rights and re, you know, uh, adaption rights for The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings while he was alive um, in an effort to stave off uh, the, the, um, the inheritance tax uh, that, that he knew was probably coming his way for his family. Um, we're <laughs> I, I'm very excited about new, a new production, a big, uh, you know, uh, handsomely mounted, expensive budget, I'm, I'm looking forward to a really interesting adaptation, um, but I'm not looking forward to having the conversation among fandom be, being so fraught, so fraught. I'm not, I'm not looking forward to that. Yeah. Um, I would like to sit down at the table with all the normies, okay? <laughs> I would really just like to sit down at the table <laughs> with the normies and have a conversation about you know what we're excited about, what we're nervous about, without... Um, all that other nonsense uh, clouding yeah. the atmosphere. If you and why it's mean. not the end of the world, or, or what they're talking about, because it's just it is just nonsense. A lot of it, really. Indeed, yeah, a lot, yeah, a lot of that. A lot of that is nonsense. It's it, it's a TV program. Um, we've had lots of TV programs, right. and um, and I think my 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 view on it really is it's all down to the story. I, I want a good story, anyway. Bam. and as Bam. long as they come up with a good story then everything else will be fine. Yeah, you just have to put yourself in, in the mindset of Tolkien didn't write this. So yeah. um, if, mm -hmm. it, is it going, is it, does it entertain you? Then leave it alone if it entertains you. Exactly. I, I love that simplicity. In fact, don't mind if I steal that meme. I'm going <laughs> to cut out the floor. I'm going to drop that meme. I'm going to steal that meme. Uh, oh, I, think I stole it from Marcel, but I don't remember. I, I don't think I came up with that on my own. What are you, uh, I, I mean, what are you holding up there, Jeremy? What do you have there? That's oh. a bookmark from the Bodleian Library. One of his doodads yes. he's giving away. He's giving these away. That's beautiful. I'm, I'm giving away some madams here. Yeah, um, I only had the seven biggest heap at the Bodleian Library exhibition. Thank you. What was the biggest <laughs> one? Was it yours? Or was it? <laughs> it was mine. It was funny. We, Marcel There was and no I, competition. And... No competition. <laughs> So, so in 2018, the library had the um, Maker Middle Earth exhibition was opening. Uh, and so uh, for opening night, they had a, an event that was, uh, I want to say it was probably about two or 300 guests in there. Um, and then the next day, the exhibition opened for everyone. And they had a shop, this beautiful little shop that's in the museum there, or the library, actually. Yeah. Mm. Um, and they filled it with Tolkien merchandise. And Jeremy Maker bought Middle it Earth. All. <laughs> yeah. he bought the and, and he did. He bloody <laughs> well did. I went in there and I'm like, I'm traveling. Um, can I just hand you stuff and you just make a pile behind the counter for me? And then I'll just pay for it all at the end of the day. And, and so uh, th this pile of merchandise just grew and grew and grew um, <laughs> throughout throughout the day, starting the night before, uh, during the event. It was pretty big. I would say on the day it opened, and it was quite big at that point because you showed it to me. And it was really enormous. Yes. <laughs> yes. So, um, so it was a lot of fun, and I bought extras. Like I was showing earlier, these little ceramic buttons are just awesome. They're just oh. they're just little handmade buttons that they commissioned with the permission of the estate and they were available for a few months until they sold out it was just a single run of these little things like yeah. the bookmarks here um these are fantastic thick bookmarks um uh, they made greeting cards and jewelry and yeah. books and it, it was just all sorts of cool little stuff so i have a whole box in my storage system over there of, of doodads and i keep some extras for doing stuff like this just giving away little madams every now and then yeah well, that's beautiful that's and, really and lovely. the thing the thing was because obviously there was this opening night and you know th there were a number of people who are collectors and people knowledgeable and you know laurie battle was there that's where i met her yes um there there was sort of it, it wasn't a competition but because there's it was a good shop 
with really good employees, they said, oh, you are going to add something else, mister. But it's, it's no problem. We'll just put it on the heap with you and you'll pay at the end. So basically, there were about a dozen people and the heap they were buying from the shop was growing oh. during the day. Oh. So and, and, and the thing was, you know, how much could you possibly buy in the shop on that day in the next two or three days? Because, you know, said, yeah, no problem at all. You, you just add to it. You just add to it. We are quite fine. We'll send it all to you. No problem at all. Thank you. So, and I remember I took seven spots at the time. And uh, so <laughs> I'm, I'm a little proud of that. <laughs> but I promise you, I didn't spend as much money as other people obviously have done. So that was absolutely hilarious. Luthien's <laughs> earrings, some of the most beautiful pieces of jewelry I've ever seen. Yeah, and, they were uh, nice, those. Yes, they were yeah, very nice. They, they are absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. They are. Oh, that sounds lovely. Oh, here. Um, they, they, Everything was, you know, top quality. That, that was the thing. It wasn't, you know, it, not not digging anyone, but it wasn't cheap merchandise. It was all high quality produced material. That's why they no longer have it in the shop. It was a first time rum, as as Jeremy said, and that's it. So. Oh, wow. Well, see, you've got to get those when there's an opportunity. You have to. Um, before, um, before I lose a track of thought, um, I, yep. want, oh, I want well. to... I mean, to... We just announced that she's doing the book at the moment, so people might be quite keen on put a number Ooh. in the chat if you're interested in the book that Jeremy's holding up. Oh yeah, that's the that's the big the big yeah, map. This is the big one. This, yeah, this, big this one. is the the main one. Hey, this is the last one Jeremy, carry on, Cliff. That's for last. That's lovely. That is a beautiful book. You're giving that away, Jeremy. My goodness. Yes. Uh, um, publisher sent me one, so I am wow. giving it away. Oh, that's lovely. That's really lovely. Um, oh my gosh, that's a combined edition. That's gorgeous. Illustrated by Tolkien. Oh yeah. no, hello. And it's got the uh, stating and the ring Ooh. verse. Gasp. Uh, <gasps> aud Go put a number in the gasp. chat there, Cliff. Yeah, put, put a number gasp. in for Cliff. Cool. No, 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 no. Somebody that's... put a number in for Cliff. No, that's beautiful. Um, uh, you know, I wanted to get back to something you had just said, Andrew, uh, a few minutes ago about you just want it to be a good story. Yes. And um, you know, honestly, I really wanted to, I wanted to add uh, just a, a, there's some uh, considerations that I've been running around in my mind um, for something that I plan to write. Perhaps I'll write this piece very soon for the One Ring. Um, but in, instead of just having a, you know, our, you know, people who would like to have their concerns come out this early in the process, um, their concerns mostly are just cosmetic, or shall we say, concerns that are only skim deep, haha. <laughs> I'd rather focus on concerns that are much, much deeper than that. I think that the writers, the producers in the writer's room on the Amazon series have to lean into them. They have to lean into it really, really hard, uh, the metaphysics and the spiritual underpinnings of Tolkien's creation, if they hope to get the series right. And if they're gonna do it right, it's not because of <laughs> diversity casting. They're gonna to have to get it right because their story has to lean into the fact is there's a, a different spiritual destiny for the elves. There is a different spiritual destiny for the men. It is incompatible. It creates conflict. It creates so much mistrust, even cracks, in the concrete could be that Cliff are... who's won. Hmm? What? Could be you who's won. Uh -oh. six, 67 was the one that that was put in for Cliff. Are you kidding? You might oh have no. Won. What? <laughs> no. Oh no, there's a 65. No. No, there's yeah, a 65. Cindy had 65. No. 65. Yeah, you got, that's you got you nearly won though. Oh you gosh, really that's close. great. You didn't um, even do anything and you nearly won. Uh, congratulations, won. Cindy. Hey. <laughs> hey. Um, no, but uh, to wrap up that thought, I mean, uh, knowing the 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 Edain and the Eldar have very different metaphysical destinies, and if the writer's room do not plug into that and lean into it really hard, then they're not going to have a show that reflects Tolkien, and it certainly, you know, all the, the, the corruption of Sauron and how he manages to seduce... Um, 
the, the, the monarch, uh, our Farazon of Numenor. It's all because of those distinctions in metaphysics. It, it, is, it is incumbent on the writers of the show to really lean into that stuff. And if they don't do it, then their show is not gonna be successful because all of the characters' motivations are, are from those differences of spiritual destiny that they have when they die, you know, the, the Edain realize that the elves are, you know, are going to Valinor, blah, blah, or, or, or <clears throat> forgive me for confusing what I'm trying to say, but <clears throat> as we know, the, the men of Middle-earth are not tied to the existence of Arda, and the elves only have their existence tied to that. Uh, if you see what I'm trying to say. Uh, so when the elves get to this uncomfortable place uh, of being uncertain about why Iluvatar would grant men a different destiny beyond the confines of this physical world, that, that kind of deep, deep cut metaphysical stuff is so ingrained into the wood of everything um, it, it, it has to be in there. The thoughtfulness of the writers have to lean into Tolkien's greater metaphysical concerns. Otherwise, the people walking around on the surface of Arda are not going to have as much motivation and conflict against one another uh, as we know happens. Uh, so that, that's just my one thing that I wanted to say. And forgive the awkward way in which I expressed it, but I think you, you get what I'm getting at. Well, yeah. the, but the thing is, we already know there's a compression of the timeline, ah. and that is exactly that. That's the, that is the one. You know, we, we could talk about all sorts of things, but if there is one red flag, one possible red flag, mm -hmm. and I'm sort of getting nervous about is, mm -hmm. I I understand that in a storyline that if you have characters in a story, you want to grow them, you want to see them, you want to live with them. You know, you don't have you know, men die every 250, 300 years, and then they're just gone. So you have to put it together. And that I understand that for the storyline to work. But that's just, just exactly the point, what you said about the metaphysics, metaphysics of, of Tolkien's writing. If the gift of men is not shown in the series with that compression of timeline, what are they going to do with that? And, and I'm, really, I'm really curious. I'm so exactly. curious how they're going to solve that problem because that is really a huge problem in storytelling yes mm -hmm. exactly well said so and yes and it's not sexy sauron it's anna yummy tar, yummy tar. <laughs> anna yummy tar <laughs> okay. please realize it's the only okay. one correct name of spelling anna yummy tar anna you yummy can, you, tar okay <laughs> you, and it's, you can sing it you know you, you can scan it it's anna yummy tar anna uh, yummy tar you know it works if you say sexy sauron you know that's it doesn't that's just, work it doesn't work but anna yummy tar <laughs> perfect i'm there i'm so there for that i'm gonna i'm gonna remind our audience next tuesday about that that's that's fabulous thank you <laughs> thank you marcel <laughs> and, and anna yamitar has a twitter account it, oh yes that's right <laughs> anna yamitar does how do you create a twitter account for it? Oh, <laughs> uh, i think it has what? like 12 Andrew. followers yeah. four of which are here on screen right now oh dear <laughs> <laughs> Cool. Awesome. This has been a great chat. I don't want to cut it too short, but we've been going for five and a half hours now. Oh my. Um, and well some done. of you are up extremely late. Uh, Clifford, yeah. it was awesome that you dropped in. Thank yeah. you. I'm so glad we had a chance to chat. We should do these again sometime soon. Yes. Uh, thank um, you, everybody, for your accommodation. Thank you for being so accommodating. I'm sorry that I missed my slot yeah. earlier today. No thank worries at all. Yeah, no no absolutely. Thank you. Well, so I want to say thank you everyone for coming. Uh, it's been a great day of love and friendship and talking about Tolkien and go read some books. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Good That's a reading. Great sign off, Jeremy. The, it's, the, well, it's the best, the best greeting or the best farewell that I could give anyone in the community is good reading to you. Good reading yeah, to you, that's everyone. Very good. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks thank for you guys. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you guys. Thank it's you great so much, to see everybody. you all today. Thank you. Yeah. Good so, to see you.
Thanks. Good to see you.